Chapter 22 Once again, as I sit in the mean cafeteria, my skin begins to prickle. Once again, something unusual happens. Guards. One after the other, masks on, combat ready. They file through the door. They line up shoulder to shoulder, guns in hand, and pointed at us. Immediately a hush falls. The glutinous mound of mashed potato in my mouth almost makes me gag, but instinctively I know not to draw attention to myself. My body must know it too, because the potato slides silently down the back of my throat. And then the last guard files through the door, and instead of carrying a gun, he carries a man. Sully. Right now, the leader of Lower Mean Descent is pale, sallow. His leg is bandaged, but the bandage is stained red. Bits of debris cling to it, as if he was dragged along one of the corridors. Some people call to him. Others ask questions of the guards, ones that go unanswered. And then, the cafeteria door swings open once more. This time... The hush that falls feels heavy and oppressive. This time, the fresh round of guards streaming through the door doesn't drag in a gravely injured lower mean. This time, it is someone important who walks into our lowly space. I don't need to glimpse his unblemished hands to see plainly that he hails from the fifth floor, and the others don't either. And then from around me, mainly from the oldest members of our mean society, come knowing whispers. Cats. I sit straighter. My fingers tighten around the fork that I hold, and I stare at the man rumored to be our ruler. Tall, with a shock of straight black hair. His creased skin is milky white, and his cheekbones protrude. They stretch far wider than the rest of his face. His clothes are well-pressed, no surprise. Yet the style is foreign. The fabric is thick and dark, well-tailored. Gold buttons reach from belt to neck, two lines of them side by side. I don't know what these clothes are meant to signify, but I'd bet a month's allotment they're intended to intimidate. He shakes hands with the means sitting closest to him, ones who have no choice but to oblige under the watchful gaze of fifty guards. When he has finished with that, he lifts his arm to the rest of us, something between a wave and a salute. He smiles wide enough to display dazzlingly white teeth, and he acts... He acts like he is well-received like he doesn't realize that the reason his head hasn't been ripped from his shoulders is because of those fifty guns. Much more likely, he doesn't care. He doesn't take our distaste to heart. Whoever he is, he's as apathetic toward our level of adoration as he is toward our plight. Still, that false smile is unnerving. It makes my prickling skin crawl. It makes the fork that I hold start twisting between my fingers. Citizens of Eleven, the man begins in a low-pitched voice. For those of you who've never met me, greetings. My name is Zachary Katz. Some people gasp at the revelation. Some murmur or hiss. Some even sound excited. Likely upper means. Just as quickly the sounds are drowned out by the thumping of boots. I sit motionless, except for my fingers, which twist my fork round and round like they're mechanized. I hope I find you well this evening. I hope I find each of you in satisfactory spirit, he continues, and there is more edge to his voice than before. I hope I find each of you enjoying the plate of food placed before you. There is a slight murmur of assent, and he nods like he is encouraged. Now, I want you to do something for me. 
I want each of you to place your fingers alongside your neck. He demonstrates the motion himself. And find the ticking of life that doesn't belong. Because your ancestors and mine, they cheated death all those years ago. Didn't they? When Mother Earth decided she'd had enough of us, we found a new way to survive. Now, Mother Earth may be easily fooled, but death? Not so. Death will come calling whenever I command. He pulls something small and white from his pocket. He pushes the top of it, and my muscles brace, my fingers clenching the fork tightly. But all that happens is a solitary clicking noise, short and small and easy to miss. And then, completely on cue, the guard holding Sully drives a fist into his leg, where the bandages are most stained with blood. The scream that erupts from him makes my stomach turn. When only the sound of Sully's labored breathing can be heard, Katz speaks once again. He smiles broadly. There is nothing in this world more valuable than peace. Let us cherish it and nurture it. He pulls from his pocket a piece of crumpled paper. As he adjusts it slightly, I see that it is a paper crane, and he places it in the outstretched hand of a little girl. Still smiling, he twitches his thumb. Another click sounds across the cafeteria, and Sully is struck with the heel of a baton. When the guards drag him to his feet, his nose or mouth is bleeding, hard to say which, and he looks disoriented. The fork starts twisting all over again. I was saddened by what transpired down here yesterday. Saddened. Sickened. But I know now, I see it in your faces, that peace will prevail. Katz's arms sweep open. A show of hands, everyone, he instructs. Who will let peace prevail so that Eleven can thrive? Slowly, hands rise, here and there, just a few. Katz turns side to side, watching and waiting for more. Under his false smile, he looks dissatisfied. His thumb twitches once again. Click. Two guards lift Sully's arms straight into the air. For a second, I think, that's it. That's all. But then another guard draws a serrated knife, and he uses it to slowly, methodically, cut off Sully's remaining index finger. The room inhales and gasps. It almost drowns out the wretched sobbing and small shrieks. Almost. Now arms rise by the dozens. Commander Katz has accomplished what he came here for. Fear, obedience, submission. Except my hand doesn't lift. It twists the fork in an endless cycle. It twitches with the desire to do what is impossible, yet just kill cats. Then warmth spreads through the joints, and I see that it is Hunter, that he grips my hand. With his guidance, I drop the fork. Then he squeezes my bones hard enough to make them ache, to remind me where I'm at and what I'm playing. I allow him to lead my hand into the air. Only then, with each of us conforming to his will, do Katz and his fifty guards sweep from the room. And even in their absence, life doesn't return to its usual rhythm. Katz didn't just break Sully's body. He broke our spirit. Every damn one of us. Chapter 23 I saw my father this morning. 
My mother was there, too. Technically, at least. I asked her about that song, wondering where she herself had learned it, but she didn't reply. She just murmured about the time, not lifting her gaze from her embroidery. Not even once. It was an image of a simple table lamp casting a yellow glow. And it was more important than her daughter. Dad cleaned my knuckles and slapped my face, told me he was looking forward to watching me fight. But he was more anxious, he said, to see me fight under a professional title. I lied to him once again and said that I was too. In less than a month, my peers must decide on jobs. In less than a month, less than four weeks, I will be free. That was always the plan. And now that I have the gun, I have my plan cemented in stone. No more will I wake from a deep sleep in a cold sweat, thinking that the compound is closing in on me, and the beautiful world above ground is forever beyond my reach. That beautiful world, with its field of hollyhock and northern oasis, is now firmly within my grasp. Of course, I can't know for certain whether the so-called oasis actually exists. Nobody in the entire compound could know such a thing. But I know from my research in the Prem Library that the temperatures are more tolerable at night and the farther north you go. I know that, given the specifics rhymed off in the song's lyrics, it has some bearing on reality. I know that, above all else, it gives me hope that I am desperately in need of. And even though I know how unlikely it is, the possibility that Jack stumbled north when he was pushed out of the oracle door makes that speck of hope balloon, large enough that it could fill all of Eleven. Sometimes it feels like a shame that I can't just get past what happened to Jack, or that I can't will myself to look forward to a lifetime in Compound Eleven, look forward to adulthood here, starting a family, holding a job of servitude, whether it be in the kitchen or the bowl or a factory. Maggie and Emerald and Hunter, they don't dread their futures here like I always have. How they don't, I do not know. Maybe because their childhood wasn't tainted by tragedy like mine was. Or maybe they are hardwired to be more positive than my brain will allow. Maybe they expect less from life or have taught themselves to extract more joy from its lighter moments. Maybe they are the ones who are practiced at the art of survival. But there are others who are unhappy. The protests that rise up every few weeks is one indication, although Katz's visit to the mean cafeteria may have put an end to that, at least for now. And even Wren isn't content, and his life is far more comfortable than mine, but I remember his words in the oracle. It is himself he doesn't like. He is the source of his unhappiness. Perhaps, then, perhaps if he could see himself in a different light, he could be happy with Compound Eleven life. It is this last thought that makes me loneliest. It is this thought that beats loudest through my head as I warm up on Blue Circuit's lone treadmill before my scheduled fight. The joy I felt two days ago when I secured a gun still flickers in my stomach, but it is subdued, swallowed up by a crush of emotion I can't begin to understand. Bruno works at a desk in the corner. He is responsible for our team's administrative needs, and his presence offers the small comfort of companionship, even though he concentrates on a pad of paper in his hands and not on me. The next time my eyes land on the desk, it is empty, and his voice calls my name from over my shoulder. Eve! He shouts again, and I turn my head to look at him. Your friend's here. She wants to talk to you. I climb off and wipe the ring of sweat forming around my hairline as I go. Is it Emerald? I ask as I near the door. He shakes his head as he walks past, his eyes not bothering to meet mine. He is still cool toward me, even after my apology, and I resist the urge to scream. 
Maggie stands outside the door with Kyle by her side, and my surprise at seeing her is displaced by my dislike for him. Him, with his red hair and arrogant eyes. Him with his blue button-up that marks him an upper mean just as much as the four printed on his hands. That's why you shouldn't wear your hair like that, Maggie, he says as soon as I step into the hallway. You look like you're getting ready for a fight. What's wrong with wearing a ponytail? I snap and my voice is immediately hot. I just said what's wrong with it. It's fine for the gym, he nods behind me, but not for day-to-day -day wear. He turns to Maggie. If you want to go dumpster diving with a floor too, boy, be my guest. I'm sure a ponytail would suit him just fine. But if you want to date a higher-born like me, keep it sophisticated. I like it up, I say through gritted teeth. Okay, guys, Maggie says, and she raises her palms into the air. You can stop arguing about my hair now, thank you. She lifts her arm and pulls her ponytail free. It's just the two of us at the fight today, Eve. Emerald and Hunter. You're siding with him? My voice is growing louder, though I mean for it to stay steady. She looks affronted. I'm not siding with anyone. It was starting to pinch, okay? And besides, what concern is it to you how I wear my hair? I told you about her, Kyle says quickly. Told her what, I snarl. Maggie shakes her head. Here, Eve. She shoves my blue armband into my hands. You forgot this at your parents' place. I saw your dad on our way here, and he gave it to me to give to you. I take it from her and wrap it around my arm as I stare at Kyle. He thinks he can control her. I know he does. I have heard the sly insults and seen the dark glances. And most importantly, I have seen the bruises. He thinks he is strong treating her like that. I am going to teach him a lesson in strength. Can I help you with something, Eve? Just wondering if you've ever been in a fight before, I say evenly. He laughs. We don't tend to do that where I come from. No offense. But he means offense, and it makes my blood boil. Tell that to your friend, Czar. Oh, wait. Judging by how quickly I beat him, I guess you're right. They aren't friends, Maggie says quickly. Right, Kyle? Daniel and Landry and Czar, they're poison, right? He looks sideways at her. I've told you before they aren't that bad. You ought to give them a chance. She is quiet. Her gaze moves to the floor. Don't tell her what to do. That's hardly what I'm doing. And if by asking me whether I've been in a fight before, you're somehow trying to physically intimidate me, do remember that I am much bigger than Czar. He pauses and fixes me with a stare. And you. And Maggie, too, right? What's that supposed to mean? Yeah, Eve, where exactly are you going with this? I look at her and see something startling in her eyes. Some mix of fear and hurt. And it makes me lose my nerve. I'm not going anywhere with this, I say. Thanks for the armband. And hey, enjoy the match. My eyes are locked on Kyle's as I swing the door shut in his face. Perhaps Maggie will be mad at me for being rude to him. Or perhaps I bit my tongue more than I should have. Everything okay? Bruno calls to me from the desk. My face must betray my anger. I nod. Just my best friend and her dick boyfriend. He crosses his arms from his chair. That sounds like a good way to lose a best friend. Bruno, he treats her like garbage, so lay off, okay? I swing at a punching bag, and my knuckles smack loudly against the hide. All I'm saying is that it isn't up to you to make her decisions. You think he's an asshole, she sees it another way. Trust me, I've been there before. Hearing it from you will only drive a wedge between you guys. When I speak, it isn't with my normal voice. This one is twisted with emotion. Who put you in charge of me? I sputter. 
because I can't seem to do anything right in your eyes. I fight Tsar exactly like Anil and Eric suggested, and suddenly you think I don't know the difference between right and wrong. Well, I'll tell you what's right and what's wrong, Bruno. What's wrong is when Tsar and his asshole friends make my life miserable every goddamn day because I was born two floors below them. Because they can. What's wrong is the fact that that dick boyfriend out there can knock my best friend around without any consequences. That's wrong in my books, and I don't need you or anyone else questioning my sense of decency. I breathe deeply in order to keep myself steady. I will not cry right now. I won't. Bruno leans back in his chair. He runs a hand over his curly hair, and it lands on a chest that is pure muscle. Probably I have said too much, made a spectacle. Maybe he will berate me, and I will have to apologize. Again. But when he speaks, his voice is restrained. He's knocking her around? I stare at him. It isn't what I was expecting him to say. Yes. We could use someone like you around Blue Circuit, you know, he says quickly, then stands. He walks toward me. In a professional capacity. I frown, confused. The last time we talked. We're a family here, Eve. We don't always get along. We don't always agree with one another. Words, actions, whatever. But I have a good feeling about you. I'd like you to think seriously about going pro. I shake my head. I don't know what to say. There are too many feelings humming through my chest. But I know flattery is one of them. I know that desolate vision of my future in Eleven retracts from sight for just a moment. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll think about it, I say. And maybe for a fraction of a second I even mean it. And while we're on the subject, I hope one day you find an excuse to beat the shit out of your friend's dick boyfriend. He smiles, and I smile too. I walk into the cylindrical tunnel where I first saw Ren. How strange it is that he is now my boyfriend, and the thought makes my stomach do cartwheels. But I need to focus, because today I will be paired against a red circuit occasional fighter named Star. She is lower mean, stocky but fast, and I have heard she is dirty. She beat Emerald once, and so I know it will be a difficult match. Ren won't be in the crowd. He and Connor are on a job tour of one of the many Prem computer labs. And as much as I hate to admit it, I'm happy he won't be here. I would be nervous with him here. Nervous and distracted. Not a good mix for a difficult fight. One thing I have to look forward to is tonight. A date. And at his place. My heart beats harder at the thought. We will meet in front of the library at eight. Late enough for dinner with my friends to be finished with. Early enough that the compound's lights will still be on. I think of his lips, soft and warm and pressed against mine. I smile. Star's fists crack against the punching bag, and she grunts loudly with the effort. The crowd at the end of the tunnel is rowdy. I can hear them shouting, but it won't be a well-attended match. We are both occasional fighters, both lower means. I unzip my hoodie and toss it aside. I slap both cheeks and think of my father. I tighten my armband and think of Maggie, Kyle. The old wounds open quickly, and every punch is harder than the last. I don't like to lose, so I won't. Star isn't the only one who can fight dirty and I see Zar crumbling under me in my mind's eye. I hear his screams of pain, and I relish in them. But when the ref gathers us, something inside of me gives way. Maybe it's the love of the fight, if it was even there in the first place. Maybe I am being overly and unnecessarily dramatic. But as I walk into the bowl and toward the bright lights of the ring... My feet feel as though they are filled with lead, and the desire to be nestled into Ren's arms fills my chest 
like a syringe has been squeezed into my heart. No. No, I cannot go there. Not right now. Not ever. I am me. I am cruel. I am a fighter. I look around at the beating hands that cheer us on, and I let their energy seep under my skin. It propels me forward, faster with every step. Hunter once told me he would die if so many people yelled his name. I know why, right now. Maggie screams loudly. She must not be mad. And I nod in her direction, before my eyes slide over to Kyle. He doesn't clap. He just stares down at me with those pale eyes. Star stands before me, and I see her stocky legs have tights pulled over them that are acid green. I see she has shaved both eyebrows. Her taped knuckles are stained pink, and she grins like a lunatic. I shift my weight slowly, then faster. I bounce up and down and shake my hands at the wrists. Now isn't the time to be soft, and it isn't the time to be complacent. I am focused and determined and ready. Except that I don't see her first punch until it is too late. It hits me hard in the ear, and it feels like a rod has been jammed clean through the other side. She brings an elbow up, and I only just manage to lurch back in time to save my teeth. A kick lands in my stomach, but it hits engaged muscle, and so I barely feel it. And I use her wasted effort as an opportunity to attack her with a punch of my own. I have good aim, and it hits her in the center of the face. I feel her nose give. It bleeds, and droplets land on the floor that my feet pad over. A guttural noise emerges from her blood-stained lips, and she launches forward, her thick frame barreling into me and knocking me to the ground. It is a dangerous place, the ground. But no sooner do I draw my shoulders up does she grab my ponytail, and I yelp as she pulls me with it. A dirty fighter indeed. In my state of powerlessness, I think of Maggie and my desire to teach Kyle a lesson. Now I am calm through the pain. I wait. And then Star moves beside me, and her fist is cocked. I jerk upward and clip her under the chin and hope that she's lost her tongue in the process. Next, I grab her shirt and pull her down to me, and we're both on our knees, and my ponytail is free. I take a page from Ren's book and smash my forehead into her already busted nose, then jump to my feet before she can see straight again. I kick her, just like Eric taught me, straight in the face, and her head snaps back like her neck has come undone. She is out. Cold. Another one bites the dust. My chest heaves as the crowd roars, and I look over my shoulder, my eyes scanning the crowd until they land on Kyle's. I spit and smile, then head back to Blue Circuit's training room to wash myself of sweat and star's blood. But once I'm there, I notice something. I am shaking. And it isn't victory or even adrenaline that is doing it. It is fright. Not because I almost lost, but because I almost lost unnecessarily. I almost let myself get soft. That evening, I check my reflection one last time in the small mirror hanging in my cell. My blonde hair is loose and still damp from my ice-cold shower, all four minutes of it allotted to lower means. It doesn't look great, but I am not good at styling it the way Maggie is. I give it a half-hearted tousle and shrug. It will have to do. Next, my eyes travel to my nose, straight and wide, and then to my eyes. They are dark blue and set apart. Unremarkable other than their crescent shape. My face is unscathed after today's fight. I know I shouldn't care, but part of me is happy about that. One ear still rings with pain, and my scalp burns. But otherwise, I am uninjured. Only tired from the exertion it took to beat my opponent. I check the clock and see that it's time to go. 
My heart thuds at the thought of meeting Ren, at the thought of seeing his apartment. That's what he called it, an apartment, not a cell. But that isn't the appeal, not really. It is seeing another sliver of him that excites me. I lock the door with unsteady fingers, perhaps from fatigue, perhaps from nerves, probably a bit of both. Are you wearing makeup? I whirl around to see Emerald standing there with her arms crossed. Shit. No, of course not. Yeah, you are. Your eyes look different. And your cheeks are all streaky. Red creeps up my neck. My hands rub at my face. They are not. Where are you going? Jules. Remember I told you at dinner I've got plans with Jules. No, she says slowly. I don't remember that, but okay. So, Jules, what are you two doing? I can't tell her we're going to hit up the punching bags. Not after she has caught me with makeup on. You know, I say instead, just hang. She squints her eyes. You don't have plans with a guy by any chance, do you? Say, a good-looking one from the fifth floor? She leans her head forward knowingly and gives me a look. No, I shout, but I am smiling and I can't get rid of it. No, of course not. Besides, we're just friends. Yeah, right you are. Listen, I won't tell the others, okay? She winks. I rock back and forth and then punch her on the arm. Thanks, I say awkwardly. And then I am gone past her and down the hall. I wipe the last of the blush off as I go. It isn't so bad if Emerald knows, but Maggie would make a big deal of it. And Hunter? Well, I don't want Hunter to know. I hate sneaking around. I hate lying. But it is hard to feel too bad about any of that right now. It is hard to keep the skip out of my step. I take the stairs two at a time, and I feel like taking them three at a time, even though my muscles are heavy. Still, I'm smiling like a fool. And then the lights go out, and all around me is blackness, thick and impenetrable. And I realize I have left my knife and my flashlight in my cell, and that this is bad. So very bad. Chapter 24 I don't know which floor I'm closest to. How long was I climbing before the power went out? Probably I'm somewhere between the third and the fourth, between mean land and upper mean. Possibilities flash in front of me, displacing the darkness. But my brain isn't processing correctly, and I can't make sense of any one of them. Instead, I stay still, my feet rooted to the concrete steps like one of those trees above ground, tethered to the earth. I swallow, and I can feel the pressure in my ears. They are my only useful sense right now. Okay, Eve, you need to do something. I swipe a hand in front of me through the black air. It lands limply at my side. I can't. I can't do anything. I push a toe forward, and it edges an inch to the side. It is like I am paralyzed. Perhaps I am overanalyzing. Perhaps I don't need to do anything. Perhaps I can wait here until the lights come back on, and then I will continue on my way to see Ren. Yes, that is what I will do. The thumping in my chest makes me lose my balance and my hands fumble for the handrail that digs into my back. Both hands grip it tightly. My feeling of powerlessness in the ring today was nothing compared to now. This is real life. This is true vulnerability. This is terror. A door pushes open below me, and I hear, fucking compound, hissed under someone's breath. It sounds vaguely familiar, 
but I need to hear it again to recognize it because my brain is moving impossibly slow. Like molasses that the cafeteria sometimes serves with toast. But whoever it is has a flashlight, and its glow lights up the stairwell. My pupils dilate with excitement as they latch onto it. When my eyes find the speaker, the giver of light, my pounding heart does not slow. Laughter does not bubble to the surface with relief. Because it is Daniel and Landry, and both slow when they see me, both their spines straighten. As the old saying goes, I feel like the cat just spotted the mouse. No bodyguard tonight? Daniel asks me, and his voice is cold. That's a shame. Don't need one. You know what your problem is, Eve? He asks, and he shines the flashlight up and down along my body. You're cocky. Do you ever see the other girls acting so tough? Sure I do. Nah, not the butch fighters you run around with. I'm talking proper girls. Like you, Eve. You're a proper girl, aren't you? My brain is moving quicker now, and my eyes dart up the stairs and away. Daniel is still talking. And that attitude of yours. Another one of your many faults. He stares at me, but I can't see his eyes. The sockets are a cloud of black. What do you think, Landry? Because I'm thinking we ought to teach Eve here that lesson we've been so meaning to teach her. Back off, Daniel, I manage. I hope they can't hear the agitation bubbling in my stomach. It must be pure acid because it lashes and burns. All I can think about is the fact that I fought today and how unfair that is. I fought today. Physically, I am drained and tired and vulnerable. And it is a horrible thing to be vulnerable. Back off or you'll end up like your friend. Another thing you ought to pay for, says Daniel, and a sneer curls his lip. As he shifts the glow of the flashlight, I see that evil glints in his eyes. No more time to waste. I lurch away from them and up the stairs with the help of every fiber of muscle and every last cell pushing maximum energy into motion. But I am not fast enough. Grabbed around the ankle, I fall. My face lands on the lip of a stair, and my cheekbone screams with pain. Please let that be the lemon juice. Please let the rest of the blows that are sure to come fall over me unnoticed. Will you look at that, Landry? Eve is panicking, he taunts. Thought I'd never see the day. God, it feels good to watch her sweat. Although I have to admit it's a bit sad. Pathetic, even. He grabs my other foot and rips me down the flight of stairs until my bare stomach is flush against cold concrete. I am on a landing, probably the mean landing, and my only hope now is to scream. So I do, at the top of my lungs, but even then, I know it's futile. Nobody will come. Nobody ever comes in this godforsaken compound. It is every man, woman, and child for themselves. And the reality is I don't have enough in the tank to see me to another day. The back of my head is grabbed. It is smashed into the floor, and my scream is stopped, cut off much too quickly by pain and shock. Blood seeps into my eyes and between my teeth, and my fingers crawl to my face, my palm offering a bath of much-needed warmth. Daniel is on top of me, and his hands grip my arms, and his legs lock over mine. Turn her over, comes Landry's voice. And I know that I have no choice. He was my only hope. But his voice gives away his delight. He is on Daniel's side. I've always thought she had a pretty face. Too bad I just smashed the shit out of it then, says Daniel roughly. And for the record, Eve, I loved every second of it. And with that... He pulls at one side of my body, and I flip over, my hands still covering my face, holding it together. Still, he is on top of me, 
Still, I can't move. The smell of his acrid soap chokes the back of my throat. Ah, will you look at that, says Landry. She's playing shy. Fingers touch my bare stomach, lightly stroking back and forth, and a knot twists my insides, one apart from pain and terror. There is a dull and knowing sense of dread. I thrash around with as much effort as I can muster, the desire to be free drowning everything else that fires through my brain. But it isn't enough. It isn't enough because it isn't a fair fight. Not tonight. Not with two of them. What do you think of her body? Daniel asks. I can hear the effort in his voice as he holds me in place. But he is trying to keep it level. Trying to keep it cool. No complaints there. Meh. Too hard for my taste. And she's tall too, right? And flat as fuck. Like a dude. Daniel laughs, cold and sharp, and my hands fall into fists over my eyes as though this will protect me from their evil intentions. Still, I thrash. Still, I try to knock Daniel off me. Hey, Eve, he says now. Hey, Eve, calm down a bit, Kay. This'll hurt a lot less if you stay still. Trust me, okay? You can't do this, I scream. And the words erupt from my mouth. They taste like vomit. You can't do this to me. That's where you're wrong, Eve. He hisses through clenched teeth. But I see strain in his eyes as he holds me down. He is tiring quickly. We can do whatever we want because we're upper means. And you're a dirty little girl nobody gives a shit about. And let me tell you this, he adds, as a small smile curls his lip. When we're guards, don't even think for a second you'll have a moment of peace again. Not when you sleep, not when you eat, not one second. But I can't respond because I am screaming again. Landry's fingers curl around the waist of my jeans, and in that moment my legs roar to life, and there is a dull thud that is my heel on his chest. Daniel turns to see what is going on, and with the momentum of my kicking legs, I am sideways underneath him, almost free. Grab her, Daniel is shouting. But every cell in my body is alight with adrenaline and the tireless pursuit of life. I am on all fours. I shove an elbow in Daniel's face. I fight. I fight. But then my hair is snatched from behind, and long fingers curl around my neck and squeeze with such intensity that blood vessels burst in my eyes, and the fight is leaving. It is dying. But I am not ready to give up just yet, and I grab at a finger, just one, and it must be a ring finger because it is weak, and I bend it back as the world goes dark, and I hear a pop, and the grip around my neck loosens. Oxygen, source to my brain. I am alive. I am alive, I am alive. Fucking cunt, Daniel screams. She broke my fucking finger. He is hunched over in the corner and I run. I sprint up the stairs with Landry at my back and he pushes me and he slams my head into the concrete wall and it is blacker than it was. And it strikes me that I will die here. Never will I say a proper farewell to my parents or my friends or to Ren. Never will I breathe fresh air or feel a breeze against my cheek. Never will I have a shot at finding Jack or tasting freedom. There is a flurry of footsteps. That much seeps into my battered brain. And maybe yelling, but I am too far gone to make sense of it. No, I must be wrong. Because it is quiet now. Unless that is my name I hear. It is so faint, it sounds like it is being whispered from the dead other end of the compound, so I can't possibly respond. Maybe it is the trees outside the oracle whispering my name. I want to whisper back. I do. But now I am swaying back and forth like a clock or like a tree, one of those talking trees. 
Yes, that is it. I am whispering my own name. Nothing more. And I am alone. Always alone. And now my mind is still. And I no longer know if I am moving or awakening, hearing or speaking, sleeping or dying. Chapter 25 I blink into a dimly lit room. My head throbs so deeply behind my eyes that for once the darkness is a blessing. Light would surely crack my skull in two. Nausea wells up in my stomach from the pain and I close my eyes again. Probably I am at Daniel or Landry's place. Probably my hands are chained up. My feet, too. I really should open my eyes. It's a wonder that I am alive at all. Eve, comes a low voice, and it is one I open my eyes for, no matter the pain. It is one that sends relief flowing through my veins like sugar. Ren. He is staring down at me with something dark and animalistic etched across his face, I try to say something, but it only comes out as a gurgle. The taste of blood coats my tongue. Eve, he repeats. Who was it? His voice is so even, his cadence so slow, his eyes flashing with so much violence. I swallow, and it feels like sandpaper, and then I push out three simple words that surprise even me. I don't know. You don't know? I shake my head. He speaks slowly. What do you mean, you don't know? You don't know their names? I shouldn't protect my attackers, of course I shouldn't. I don't want to, and it isn't my intention. But I have to lie right now, because otherwise Ren will do something terrible. I can sense that cruel monster in him right now, see it stirring behind his fiery eyes. No, I mean I didn't see them at all. He stands quickly and turns from me. Both hands run along his face, and then he strings them behind his head as he gazes at the ceiling. His arms are bulky with taut muscle. How could you not see? His voice sounds desperate. I just didn't. He paces now, and my eyes follow him. I like watching him move, even when he moves in torment, even when I feel like slashing my throat for causing it. But every action of his shines with such gentle, restrained strength that it is impossible to look away. And watching him is a distraction from the pain inside my brain. Eve. Where am I? He stares at me, and I can tell he doesn't want to change the subject. But he sighs. At my place, you'll be safe here. I blink, and his back is to me, and it is getting smaller. Don't go, I say. And even though I am being weak for wanting him close, for wanting his comfort, I don't care. Maybe it isn't weakness that makes me crave companionship or safety. Maybe it is human nature. Those like Daniel and Landry who breathe nothing but destructive, malevolent air whose blood is clotted with viciousness, maybe they are the mutants. Maybe I have been trying to be a mutant when all I am is human. Ren looks over his shoulder. I'm getting you something for the pain. I'll be back. When I see him next, I think I have fallen asleep for some time, because he is wearing a sweatshirt now with the hood pulled up, and he is sitting beside me with his head in his hands. He must sense I am watching him, because he turns to me almost at once. Next, he puts something between my lips and holds a glass to them. Take this. It'll bring down the swelling. I do as he says, and the water feels foreign as it drains to my stomach. 
It tastes like metal. My head burns with less thunder than before, and I feel like I do after a hard fight. Except after a fight, I feel strong. And right now, I feel anything but. Images of Daniel on top of me race through my mind. The feeling of Landry's fingertips across my stomach stings like acid. My fingers tremble. And then I realize the shaking comes from the ball in my stomach. And I need a distraction. So I push up on my elbows. I lift my raging head and look around. I am lying on top of a bed, and a thin blanket covers me. Blood covers my shirt. I want to cry. But I shouldn't, because the tears will never stop. Maybe I don't want Ren to see me cry like a child. Maybe I am being a child for caring. How many were there? He asks. Two. He nods. That's what I thought. How? I can barely bring myself to talk about it. Saying it aloud makes it more real. Too real. And surely it was all a bad dream. His eyes fix onto mine through the darkness. How? He repeats. Did I get here? I waited a few minutes after the power went out, and then I decided to go meet you. He shakes his head. I should have gone right away. I remember footsteps before the world shut off. They must have been his. They ran as soon as they heard you, I say slowly. He nods. By the time I found you, they were gone. His voice is tight and clipped like a belt pulled against itself. He fixes me with a stare. You're sure you don't know who it was? I'm sure. What happened to your knife? Forgot it. Flashlight, too. Did they say anything? They had a lot to say. Eve is panicking, thought I'd never see the day. God, it feels good to watch her sweat. I've always thought she had a pretty face. Too bad I just smashed the shit out of it flat as fuck like a dude. On and on, their words ripped through my head until I realized that Ren is talking, and I forced my eyes to focus on his mouth. And what? You didn't recognize their voices? He asks. His is heavy with disbelief. Or maybe I am imagining it. I frown. Then I speak as clearly as my blood-coated mouth will allow. No. I didn't recognize their voices. I didn't see their faces. Sorry. One of them had a flashlight, though. I could see it from the top of the stairs. I shrug. I didn't notice. You didn't notice. He repeats. And his eyes narrow. You. Of all people. You, who is deathly terrified of the dark, you didn't notice that suddenly you could see? Burning prickles behind my eyes, harder than before. I was kind of busy, Ren, fighting for my life, okay? They wanted... I can't bring myself to say it. He leans forward. Wanted? I make a face. What do you think? He is perfectly still, like he is carved of concrete. Did they? I shake my head, and when I do, the tears are dislodged, and they fall loose. There is no controlling it, not now. I got away, I sob. I was so weak from the bowl, I couldn't fight them off. But then I did, somehow I did get them off me. And then one of them was choking me, and I... I catch myself, but only just. I can't tell him I broke Daniel's finger. It would be a telltale sign the next time Ren sees him. And? And I got away. Again. I was running up the stairs when one of them caught me. Smashed my head into the wall. That must be when you found me. I cover my face with my hands and lie down again. 
the sobs too loud now to talk over or around. The bed lifts beside me, and I know Ren has gone, and I am alone. I cry until I can't cry anymore. Here's a face cloth, comes his voice sometime later. I can't see through the darkness, and I realize my eyes are sealed shut. I take the cloth blindly. It is hot and feels good against my bruised and broken skin. Have the pills helped yet? I nod. Thanks. When I open my eyes and look up at him, I see his face is still clouded over in rage. What? His eyes are stern, and they beat into mine. I'm going to find whoever did this to you, you know, he says quietly. He leans down so that his lips graze my forehead, and I can smell his clean scent. I'm going to find them, and I'm going to kill them. I say nothing. He kisses my head and leans back so that our eyes can find each other. It's late. You should try to get some sleep. You'll feel better in the morning. Before I can respond, my eyes slip closed, and soon my breathing becomes steady. My pulse slows. I wake to silence, and for a moment panic seizes me. But then I remember where I am, and the coil in my stomach loosens. My head aches with only a dull thud that worsens when I move, but still it is bearable. And so I sit upright and toss the blanket aside. Yesterday my muscles served me well, and I rub them slowly as my mind retraces the horrors that now reside inside my skull. That is the problem with trauma. It never ends. It endures in memory. The mirror over the sink where I wash up shows a face I barely recognize as my own black and blue like I haven't seen before. Concrete is harder than fists. But whatever Ren gave me for the swelling has worked. The skin is puffy with broken blood cells, but nowhere does the distortion run deep. There is a slash along one cheek, but I wash it and it doesn't begin to bleed again. A good sign. My neck is the worst of it. Striped blue and yellow, the imprint of fingers holding me in their vice grip. These are the marks that the others will notice. The thought of seeing Daniel or Landry again makes a tremor rob my hand of steadiness. I look in the mirror and force my back straighter. I must be strong. And that isn't a problem, not for me. But the shaking doesn't subside. And I think of their warnings about not giving me a moment of peace once they are rulers of this compound with their guns and authority. It is a blessing that I have already decided to go, and before jobs begin. Their threat is empty, meaningless. They just don't know it yet. My mind drifts up and up until I am standing in the oracle, and the trees are swaying under a gentle breeze. I feel the sun in my eyes. I see the glass shattering under my hand, I feel myself sprinting north until I reach a field of hollyhock. Now my breathing is steady again, the shaking gone. When I leave the washroom, I find Ren sitting on the bed. He is wearing track pants and nothing else, and my eyes linger on his smooth skin. It isn't pale like mine. It is a warm olive, and it mounds over muscle in a way that is almost poetic. Landry is right about my body, though I have never given it much thought until now. It is hard, straight. It doesn't ebb and flow. It isn't graceful in its beauty. It isn't frightening in its strength. Renz is all that and more. He stands, and I can tell by the way he moves with so little on that he's comfortable in his body, in his skin. The swelling's down. I nod. He walks to me, and his eyes are on my neck, and his fingers go there too. Gently, they graze the stripes that mark me. His eyebrows pull together so that a line appears between them, a small indentation of concern. 
Is this typical? He asks. His voice is clipped and unnatural. What do you mean? The attack. Is it typical? You know, for means. I shrug, and even try to force a smile, though I fail. I told you, it's a way of life. He wraps his arms around me, and for a moment I forget how to breathe as his bare skin ensnares me. Partly, I don't want to be touched. Not right now. But this is Ren, I remind myself. And so I push my arms around him, and my fingers drink in his warmth and the feeling of blood and muscles stirring with every breath. It feels good. Better than I thought it would. It is a distraction. A distraction I am desperate for, I realize. And so I focus only on him, on his flesh, on his sturdiness. For a moment in time, I forget the events that unfolded last night. I forget the pain that coats my head and sits inside my chest. I can't believe how bad it is, how unfair it is, Ren is saying into my hair. We're taught it's a different culture down there. That's how they put it. Mean culture is just... different, he sighs. There is nothing I can say. Violence is a way of life. Maggie and Emerald and Hunter, they will feel sorry for me, yes. But they won't be shocked, at least not for long. I was attacked and almost killed, but I am just one of many. I am one of the lucky ones. I survived. So instead, I stand taller and pull Ren closer so that our bodies are flush, so that I can smell his skin. I take a deep breath and push heavy words from my stomach. Ever kissed a girl with a black and blue face? He stares down at me, and his face is knotted, perplexed. And then it breaks. He smiles. I've never kissed a girl like you before, period. No matter the state of your face. He dips his head lower, and his lips land gingerly on mine if only for a moment. When we pull apart, I whisper to him, Do me a favor, okay? He nods, his eyes watching. Don't feel bad for me. Don't look at me any differently, okay? I'll be fine. You'll be fine, he repeats. He shakes his head. I kind of expected you to say that, just not this soon. God, Eve, you're allowed to grieve, you know? I already have. You just woke up. I force myself to shrug, a masquerade of nonchalance. I'm made of steel. He laughs gently. Yeah, trust me. I get that. I run my fingers along his bare back, focusing on this sensation alone instead of the pain prying my voice up an octave, forcing it to sound lighter than it is. And don't even think about feeling guilty for being a preem. Not now. I mean, I've been putting the guilt trip on you for a while now, and I'd hate to think it was my attackers who finally did it. He scowls, but his eyes are soft. What makes you think I feel guilty? You're not a monster, I reply. And my voice is matter-of-fact. Under my fingers, his muscles tense up. But I am too busy pulling him close to pay it any attention. He kisses me hard this time. Too hard for my beaten tissue, and I push at his chest. When he pulls back, I see he is breathing deeply, and there is something exposed in his eyes. It passes quickly. Sorry, he says. Then he forces himself to grin. So when exactly do you think you'll be feeling better? His eyes inch down my body in a way that is intended to be playful. He is trying as hard as I am to make things easy and airy, and the opposite of what my reality has become. It makes me smile, his efforts, almost genuinely this time. Give me a few days, okay? 
He is watching me closely. He nods, then picks up a stack of clothes folded neatly on the bed. Here, he says. They'll be big, but at least they're clean. Once he disappears, I sigh. Then I give myself a shake, carefully remove my blood-stained clothes, and throw them in the trash. The black sweatshirt from Wren is several sizes too big, but it smells like him, and I never want to take it off. After I roll up the pants, I leave the bedroom and see for the first time the rest of his apartment. I am still as my eyes sweep over a large room painted black, different in every way from my second floor cell. No, that isn't quite true. Like mine, it is sparsely decorated. The walls empty, but for words hanging next to me. Here in the dark, I know myself. In the far corner, there is a punching bag coated in blood, knuckle tape lying on the floor beneath it. The room is wider than the main corridor downstairs. I don't know what to do with so much space. It feels so unnecessary, so superfluous. Wow, Prem, I say as I cross my arms. Once more, I try to make my voice light, but this time I can't. Sometimes when I'm with Ren, it feels like our differences don't separate us. Like we are the same person, who happened to come from different places. But other times, like now, our differences feel vast. So vast, it is a wonder we can see each other from either side. He has a hoodie on now, and he sits on a sofa the color of concrete. In front of it is a coffee table with a binder sitting on one corner and a gun on the other. It's no big deal, he shrugs. Yeah, it's no big deal, except that it's huge, he shrugs again. Wasted space. I don't spend much time here. My eyes reach his. My entire cell is smaller than your bedroom, you know. He nods. Come here. I sit beside him, and he slips his hand into mine. I wanted to show you something. His other hand reaches for the binder and pulls it close. What is it? Remember when I told you my mother's in charge of the solar panels? I nod. The past couple of years, they've been keeping track of weather patterns. With the aid of these. He swings the binder open, and my jaw drops. It is full of photographs of the sky, and my hands stream over their glossy surfaces, flipping through them with hunger. I see the sun roaring with fire. I see it swollen and orange and barely cresting the earth's crust. I see the moon a thousand times closer than when Ren and I lay side by side in the oracle. This is, this is amazing. I thought you'd like it. Why are they doing this? My eyes don't move from the pictures as I speak. It has something to do with how poorly the panels have been working lately. They're trying to optimize their effectiveness by studying weather patterns. He shrugs. Look at the colors, I murmur, as my thumb grazes a photo of the sun sitting low in the sky, pink clouds in front of it. All around it are cascading stripes of purple and red. It's called a sunset. Ever heard of it? I shake my head. It happens at the end of the day. We should watch it sometime. He closes the binder and sits back on the couch, with my hand nestled in his. I follow him back, and he kisses me softly. Hey, I say, my voice squeaky. You know how you said you've never kissed a girl like me before? Yeah. Have you? You know, I take a deep breath. Kissed a lot of girls? He presses his lips together as his gaze shifts to the ceiling, like he is deep in thought. His hand strokes his chin. Let me think. I punch him. Very funny. He smiles. 
You want to have the talk, Eve? That feels like very official boyfriend-girlfriend business. Well, you are my boyfriend, aren't you? Known only to the two of us, I might add. Well, it still counts. I draw my knees up to my chest. Every time I blink, my face hurts. But I am distracted right now by Ren, and that is a good thing. I don't want to think about what happened. I don't. It still counts, he repeats slowly. And then his head nods forward. And you already know my sad history. What? Never having kissed anyone before? Come on, it's only a little sad. He nudges my arm. Okay, fine. Keep in mind that I'm two years older than you. I shift in my seat. Okay, I say. I've had two girlfriends. One doesn't really count because we were both young. Kids, practically. The other... The other you've actually met. Now he is the one to shift in his seat. His gaze blinks onto mine, but it doesn't stay there for long. A light bulb goes off in my head. Please, please, please tell me it isn't her. I hated her when I saw her in the preem hallway. I hated her long red hair and the way she touched his arm. Now I really hate her. He runs a hand down his face, then draws his hood up. If anything, it draws more attention to his defined cheek and jawbone, to his straight nose, his level eyes. Addison is her name. We dated for a couple of years on and off. I ended things for good a few months ago. She still likes you. His face is serious as his eyes meet mine. So? She's nothing to me. Hasn't been for a while. He seems to spit out the words. Can we talk about something else? He adds. I am silent. The only thing I can think about is her. And the fact that he's had a serious girlfriend before. But what should I expect? I look at him and reiterate his words. You're two years older than me. Yeah, Eve, what about it? I shrug. I don't know. Do you think it's an issue? If I'm being honest, it isn't something I've even noticed. Have you? No. I admit. But Hunter dated someone a year older recently, and it didn't end well. His eyes are unsmiling as they stare into mine. Finally, he looks away and forces his head up and down. I am about to ask him what is on his mind, when there is a knock on the door, loud and completely unexpected. It startles me, and I jump. It startles me because we had been enveloped in complete silence because we were talking about uncomfortable truths, because I feel more vulnerable after last night's attack than I ever have before. I startle and reach for his hand before I can stop myself. He eyes me as he stands. I thought you were made of steel. The words sting, and I don't turn my head as he opens the door, as someone enters his apartment. Sometimes Ren is kind, and sometimes he is anything but. I suppose I am no different. Where is that binder I didn't authorize you to take? Comes a woman's voice, and it is cold and vaguely familiar. Tell me I didn't raise a thief, though it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. Nice to see you too, mother, says Wren, and I know why her voice sounds familiar. Not because I've heard it before, but because they share the same disinterested way of speaking. But where Wren's voice is low and smooth, hers is crisp as ice. Drop the pleasantries, she snaps. I don't have time for it. What else is new? Don't try me, Wren. The binder, quick. The binder's over there, he says lazily. And I shut my eyes as I feel her gaze land on the back of my head. Help yourself to it. Silence. I don't want to meet Ren's mother, especially not right now with my face looking like this. But I grit my teeth, then look over my shoulder, and my eyes meet hers. 
She is average height and razor thin, not like Wren at all. But her nose is the same. Her wide-set intelligent eyes are his, too. But hers are slivers, and his are the giver of light. Mother, this is Eve. Eve, he says with a shrug. Meet my mom. My eyes slide briefly to him, and I see that he is relaxed. There is no warmth his body shows for her, no reverence in his eyes. There is no fear there either. Good God, she says slowly as her gaze meanders down my face. If I blush, it would be well hidden by bruises. But I don't blush. I stare at her without batting an eye. She turns back to Ren. Make sure you hide the damage next time. Hide the damage next time? I sputter, drawing myself gingerly to my feet. You think he did this to me? She looks amused. You might be dressed up in my son's clothes, but I can spot a mean any day of the week. Next time, do remember to hold your tongue until a preem invites you to speak. Yes, she is a preem. An important one at that. I think about Commander Katz's visit to the mean cafeteria. I think about a life of misery. I think about Jack. And just like that, my injuries from last night are completely forgotten. I'm not sure which is worse, I say bitingly, taking a step forward and completely disregarding her orders. Being so dismissive of someone so beat up, or thinking your own son is capable of it. I don't think you know my son very well, then, she says. And as she does, I glance at Ren. I expect him to react to these words, but instead he looks passive. His arms are folded, and he stares at his mother with hardened eyes, yes. But there is no anger in them. No emotion whatsoever. All at once, Hunter's words come rushing back to me. You can never, never trust a preem. Are you trying to punish me? She asks her son. Bringing this, this creature into your home, dressing her in your clothes? You may as well traipse her around the common areas while you're at it for all the rest to see. I look forward to it. Be my guest. You'll realize your own foolishness in good time. Do me one favor, though. And keep in mind the company a person like this must keep. She glances once again at me and frowns. To know such violence. Perhaps you ought to watch your back then, I say. And my voice is clear and level. Those who know great violence are capable of great violence. She smiles. Perhaps you and Ren share something in common after all. Then she turns to the door. Bring me the binder within the hour, she snaps at him. Her heels tick against the floor as she leaves. I stare at him, but his eyes don't meet mine. And he seems lost, like he is somewhere else. I'm leaving, I say simply as I follow her out. He must wake from his daze because he is behind me in an instant and has my shoulder in his hand. I'm walking you back to your place. You're forgetting, I say as I wrench myself free. I'm made of steel. Chapter 26 The next day I feel better, lighter in my chest, and my head no longer aches. My face is sore to the touch. It is still black and blue, but already some of the bruising has faded to yellow. It is mesmerizing to look at, and reminds me vaguely of the sunset that Wren showed me, where colors bleed into one another, where light and darkness collide. Yesterday I took the elevator down from the fifth floor and managed to make it to my cell without seeing anyone. My heart thumped with every step. My eyes scanned the faces around me. But there was no Daniel, no Landry. What I will do when I see them, I don't know. Yet see them, I will. It's impossible not to. 
One thing I refuse to do is cower. It is bad enough they will see me covered in injuries they inflicted. I will not let them think they got under my skin. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't. Part of me itches to even the score. The fighter inside me. The cruel, violent monster in me. But part of me doesn't want to even the score with Daniel or Landry. It doesn't want to go there. To know such violence ever again. Part of me doesn't want to fight in the bowl anymore. Part of me just wants peace. I don't know how to reconcile these two parts of me. And I don't know which side will win. This morning, though, I am going to breakfast, just like every other morning. Yesterday, I didn't leave my cell, and I ignored my friends as they pounded on the door again and again, on and off. I turned my back on the guards who searched my cell for the missing gun, squeezing my eyes shut as they ran their hands along my legs and under my pillow, taking no satisfaction in my trickery, even though it was well-deserved. I slept often, and when I wasn't sleeping, I was thinking about the oracle, the outdoors, the oasis. Whenever darkness threatened to overcome me, I pictured myself there, safe and in perfect freedom. Jack's delicate fingers searching through my clothes for a small object that I hid, just like before, and I was whole again. I pull on my boots tuck the switchblade inside, the flashlight too. The neon light across from my cell shines in my eyes as I leave and turns my white sweatshirt a sickly shade of green. I pull it straight. I smooth my hair that hangs over my shoulder in a braid and breathe in. Out. It is another day, nothing more. This is compound 11, Eve. Where did you think you were? Finally comes Hunter's voice from beside me. Maggie and I were looking for you yesterday. Did you know? Emerald kind of... He sees my face, and he is frozen, one hand suspended in midair. Hunter, what the hell happened? Hunter, Eve, tell me. Then, before I can respond... His arms wrap around me and pull me into a tight embrace. It's okay, I hear myself saying over and over again, but his head is shaking. It's not okay, he insists as he pulls back to better study me. It's not. Who did it? It wasn't the fight in the bowl. Maggie said you won easily. His brow digs together. Your neck? Holy shit, look at your neck. Someone tried to kill you. It feels like there is a stone in my stomach, and the more he says, the heavier it becomes, the quicker it sinks. Was it the preem? It was, wasn't it? I knew he was bad news. What, Wren? No, Hunter, no. Of course not. But he isn't listening. He is banging on Maggie's door over my objections, and when she answers... Her eyes are confused and heavy with sleep. Then they land on my face, and suddenly she is awake and just as alarmed as Hunter. Oh my God, is this why you were MIA yesterday? Why didn't you tell us? Who was it? Too many questions, too much attention. I just want to be. When I speak, it isn't my normal voice. It is one twisted with frustration. Stop it! I'm fine! so just leave it alone. I glare at them, but they only stare back with wide eyes. Honestly, and my voice is softer. Honestly, it's worse this way. You're making it worse. I was attacked. It happens all the time down here, and I guess it was my lucky day. Can we just not talk about it, please? They exchange a look. If that's really what you want, Maggie says eventually. Okay. Okay, let me see. Um, I'm going to go get changed. Then breakfast? Perfect, I say. Relief floods my veins. 
but once her door is closed, I can see that Hunter's face is crisscrossed with concern. He has always been too protective of me. You have to at least tell me who it was, he says under his breath. Of course I can't. There is a chance it would get back to Ren. I didn't see. It was during the power outage. Can we drop it now? He stares at me, waiting. Please? After a while, he sighs. Consider it dropped. I squeeze him around the middle. Maggie emerges from her cell a minute later, and together we move through the lower mean hallways. The two of them talk of the job tours taking place after breakfast, but I barely listen. Instead, I think of the stairwell. I think how the steps must be stained with blood. My blood. Mind if we take the elevator? I interrupt once we near the lobby, and they look at me. My legs sore, I lie. They nod. They are good friends, obliging. And I silently chastise myself for yelling at them, especially when their only offense was caring. I smile appreciatively at both of them. When we reach the cafeteria, I see neither Daniel nor Landry. The balloon of dread in my stomach deflates somewhat. I don't think I could bear looking at them. Not right now. Not yet. But time heals everything. And in another day or two, it will be fine. It will be old wounds. It won't matter to me. We sit in our usual spot and I clear my throat. Any word on Sully? Hunter shrugs. He's recovering. Apparently, he's already coming up with ways to leverage what happened to him into action. More frequent protests. A movement in its own right. You get the drift. Hmm. What about everyone else? I glance around and notice that the atmosphere is more subdued than is typical. Things are slowly getting back to normal, says Maggie between bites. Talk about an eventful week. Yeah, no kidding. So how's Kyle? She gives me a look as she butters her toast allotment. A single piece. Seriously? Give me a break, Eve. She points the knife in my direction. I know how much you hate Kyle. I've always known it, but now I really do. Why would she do? Hunter leans forward with interest. Neither seem to be treating me any differently because of my injuries. At least not now. And I feel lighter, more like myself. Yeah, what I do, I ask, smiling. Oh, what? Because of the other day? Before the fight? Um, obviously. And after the fight, too. I saw you look up at him after you just about decapitated that loon you were fighting. Did Kyle notice? She rolls her eyes. What do you think? Then she lowers her voice, and it sounds tense. Look, when you do stuff like that, you're just making life harder for me, okay? It just puts him in a bad mood, and... And? He's just hard to deal with then, okay? I shake my head. Maggie, trust me, you can do way better. Easy for you to say, she says slyly. What's that supposed to mean? But she is looking over my head, and I turn around to see Ren as he slides into the seat beside me. How are you feeling? He asks heavily, and his eyes comb down my face and linger on my neck. Can't complain. You know about this? Hunter asks, shifting forward so he can see around me and to Ren. His eyes dart in my direction. Yes. When exactly did it happen, Eve? Hunter asks now. I told you, during the power outage. Not last night, but the night before. When you were hanging out with Jules. My eyes lift, and I see Maggie is watching me. Ren is silent by my side. Yeah, then... I could tell them the truth, that I was heading upstairs to see Ren. They already know we are friends, and friends spend time together. But it is too late. 
and admitting I lied requires more courage than I can muster right now. Did she get away? Who? Jules. Oh. Yeah, it actually happened as I was heading out to see her, so she didn't have anything to do with it, thankfully. And yesterday you just laid low. Yep. Rest is best, right? So how does he know? Are you conducting an investigation or something? Ren demands, sounding annoyed. My voice is loud. Can everyone just settle down? I told you, Hunter, I don't want to talk about it. Clearly you talked to him about it. I stare at him, exasperated. But then his hand slips into mine, and I feel its warmth, its familiarity, and the guilt for keeping so much from him lately is almost overwhelming. Then Emerald is there, and her eyes are wild, her gaze raking over my wounds but not taking anything in. She sits beside Maggie and drops her head into her hands. The rest of us exchange looks. Emerald, I try. Is everything okay? She shakes her head back and forth, then sits up straight. Her hands fall away from her face and she stares at me. Bruno's dead. Maggie gasps, but I am still. I don't move. I don't even breathe. How? Fight in the bowl? And on the last word, her voice breaks and she chokes back a sob. She isn't a crier, Emerald. She wouldn't want to cry in front of us. I know that. So I give her a minute to pull herself together and use the time to do the same for myself. Bruno, dead. He was fighting a green circuit pro, Emerald says once her voice is steady. They were fighting. It was an awesome fight. And then Bruno was falling and, and the guy, the green circuit guy, he kicked him in the head. Mid-fall, broke his neck. She is breathing deeply and one hand snatches at her mouth. He landed on the floor and didn't get back up. My head is shaking. The surge of emotion that wants to escape is mounting. It can't be. Bruno can't be dead. When I finally speak, my voice is hoarse. When did it happen? The fight was yesterday. He passed away this morning. Her eyes are red-rimmed, like she hasn't slept. I've been in the nurse's station ever since, me and Eric and Anil. I tried to track you down, but I couldn't find you. Oh. More guilt, always guilt. I was occupied. Yeah. By the looks of things, you haven't fared much better than Bruno. My voice is barely even a whisper. At least I'm alive. But she isn't listening. She is rubbing her hands up and down her face. It could have been you or me, Eve. It could have been one of us in the ring. It was just a regular fight. I swallow. I push the emotions down deep. It's dangerous, what we do. We always knew that. You weren't there. You didn't see it. It was so quick. One second he's strong and putting up a killer match, you know, and the next, bam, gone. Forever. Her eyes reach mine, and they look broken. I don't think I can do it. Do what? Go pro. Emerald, you love fighting, and trust me, I add, gesturing toward my face. Your life can be over just as quickly outside the ring as in. She frowns at me, then nods. Maybe you're right. Maggie slings an arm around her back. Hunter and I are heading on a factory tour after breakfast. You should come, you know, get your mind off things. Which factory? Emerald asks, but her voice is flat, distant. Clothes, isn't it, Hunter? He nods. Garments, I think they call it. Right, we're going on the garments tour. 
It could be interesting. Emerald doesn't reply. Her gaze is fixated on her lap and many miles away. Maggie looks at me. Eve, are you in too? I shake my head, an automatic no. Her eyes narrow. You've been on one tour. You're counting? I make a face. Someone has to. Look, I don't exactly feel up for a tour today, okay? I'll go on more of them soon. There are still a few weeks until we have to decide. That's plenty of time. She nods. I guess you plan on going pro anyways, right? Or does this... She glances at Emerald. Change things for you, too. Ren is perfectly still next to me. I just shrug. Time will tell. After breakfast, it is just Ren and me, and I do my best not to think about the last time we saw each other. We'd had a fight. A small one, sure. But I was also reminded of who he is. What he is. A preem. The son of one of Eleven's leaders, a woman I instinctively know can't be trusted. Does it make me trust Ren less, by extension? It's hard not to let it. Plus, there were her words, odd ones, and the presumption that he was responsible for all my bruises. Maybe I should have gone on the job tour after all. The others are headed there now, Emerald included. There is no use in mourning the dead for long in Compound Eleven. There are no funerals, like tradition dictated before civilization moved underground. Already his body will be disposed of. I know she won't be able to think of anything else, though. It is all I can do not to think of him, too. Of our last conversation. He invited me onto the team. And for a moment, I actually considered it. For a moment, I actually considered staying in Compound Eleven. What are you doing now? Ren asks as we head for the elevators. I don't know, polishing my steel? He smirks. Funny. Want company? I look at him out of the corner of my eye. What, at my place? His gaze meets mine, but only for a second. Sounds like maybe you could use the distraction. Don't do me any favors. Eve? What? You're still incredibly hard to talk to. We board the elevator only after my eyes sweep the small space for Daniel or Landry. I turn to him. Whatever. You coming down or not? His thumb jams the button for the second floor. Did you know Bruno well? He asks once we disembark. I lead him through the lower mean crowd in the direction of my cell. My eyes are peeled for Daniel and Landry but only because I can't stop them from searching. It is a weak thing to do, a scared one. But still, I look. Bruno? Yeah, same team and everything. Fighting for sport is rough. Dangerous. Yeah, we covered that at the breakfast table. Still want to do it? It was a freak accident, Ren. That's not why I'm asking, Eve. I look over my shoulder at him as we shove through the main corridor. His mouth is pressed into a thin line. Come on, he says eventually. You've been to hell and back. Maybe put your feet up for a bit. And get soft? The only reason I survived what happened the other night is precisely because I fight for sport. Because I'm good at it. Because I'm strong. True. But since you are hell-bent on leaving the compound soon, why not enjoy your time? Unless, of course, you like to fight. Can we talk about something else, please? I really don't want to think about Bruno right now. Or the bowl. Or fighting in general. How about this? Any chance you'd recognize your attackers if they walked in front of you right now? My eyes widen. They search the faces around me, panic playing at my stomach. But they are nowhere to be seen. Besides, Ren has no idea who it was. How could he? 
get a grip, Eve. It was just a question. I don't know, I say. Maybe, but what are the chances? I look at him and drag the corner of my mouth into a half smile. Right? You're sure you didn't see who it was? Because I told you, I snap. I didn't see them. It was dark. I was panicking, okay? Can you just leave it? His face hardens, but he says nothing more until we turn off the main corridor to where the crowds are thinner. He exhales. Back to your plan to leave the compound. How do you expect to do that again? I glance at him. Why? He looks at me slyly, more playful than before. Let's just say I have visions of you attempting to kidnap cats and it's keeping me up at night. Who are you more worried about, him or me? Well, he travels with his own entourage of armed guards, so you do the math. I shove him. You can relax. My plan is far less glamorous. So what is it? I lifted a gun from a guard, that's all. It's hidden in the storeroom as we speak. I say it plainly, yet the words are touched with pride. You think you're going to shoot your way out of the oracle? He shakes his head. It's bulletproof glass, Eve. Three inches thick. Compound security was a priority when it was being built, for obvious reasons. Do you really think our forefathers constructed it with ordinary materials? He must see the horrified look on my face, because he adds, Impressive work, though. I can't imagine guards give up their weapons very easily. And stashing it someplace outside your cell. Also notable. Every bit as calculated as I would have expected from you, to be honest. I am barely listening. Too much rushing in my ears. Too many specks blurring my vision. The glass is too thick. Bulletproof. Bulletproof. My plan won't work. My ticket to freedom. Gone. Just like that. The field of Hollyhock, the Oasis, Jack. All of it seems to flicker and fade, just beyond my fingertips. Relax, Eve. I say it again and again until the tears that prickle behind my eyes dry up. There are other ways out. I will find another way out. Of course I will. That paradise will be mine. I will reunite with Jack there. I will. I will, I will, I will. I wish I could say that I feel badly for prolonging your stay down here, but... He clips me along the arm. I force a smile in return. No prolonging, I say weakly. I'll figure out something. We walk the next two hallways in silence. It hurts, this revelation. Definitely it hurts. I feel it in my stomach and my chest and my head. Yet it doesn't gut me as deeply as it should. In another week or two, if I don't find another way out, maybe it will. But right now, my senses are too dulled. All of them. Crushed already. I can be pulverized no more. Near to my corridor, Ren notices the black paint spelling out fuck the preems. He stares at it and runs his tongue along his teeth. No wonder you want to keep things between us quiet, he says heavily. It puts you in danger. Why didn't you tell me? I snort. If you think I'm scared about that, Preem, you don't know me. Be serious, Eve. I am serious. Besides, you don't exactly look like a Preem, so long as you keep your hands in your pockets. What's the difference? But if certain people knew. Yeah, I am forced to agree. If certain people knew. In my corridor, the light bulbs are almost all burned out. Two have died since I left for breakfast, and so it is dark. But it doesn't bother me quite like before. Maybe it is because I am distracted by devastating news and brutal disappointment. 
or because Ren is here, but I don't think so. I think the lemon juice has spilled on my fear of the dark. Does someone fix these? He asks as his eyes comb the ceiling. His arm reaches up and touches a lightless gray bulb outside my cell. Eventually. I can see why you love it down here. Yeah, well, wait until you see in there. I look at him pointedly under the glare of the neon light. Then, swing my door open. After you. Probably it is the first time he has ever seen a lower mean cell. His eyes sweep over the small space and quickly latch onto the piece of embroidery hanging on the wall above the bed, my only decoration. My cheeks burn as he stares at the image, as he sees my mother's signature. Silently, he moves to the other side of the room, only a couple of steps away, and his fingers graze the objects on my desk. A ball. A book lent to me by Hunter. He picks up a piece of paper and reads it aloud. Death must be so beautiful to lie in the soft brown earth with the grasses waving above one's head and listen to silence. To have no yesterday and no tomorrow. To forget time. To forgive life. To be at peace. He raises an eyebrow. It's a quote from an author. A long time ago, I shrug. I copied it from a book upstairs. Do you believe it? That death is beautiful? I read once that there's no such thing, death. That it's a change of worlds, nothing more. You didn't answer my question. I think I did, I say. He nods and then sits on the bed with his hands running down his face. It looks as though he has accepted my cell for all it is, and with no snide comments or pitying glances. Something else seems to be on his mind. So, I guess we should talk about yesterday morning with my wonderful mother. I know you have a lot on your plate right now, and... He's right, I do. Too much. Too much sorrow that could overwhelm me at any second if I am not careful. I don't want to think about any of it. I don't want to think about our fight or his pre-mother. Maybe I do need a distraction. My eyes drink in his thick, olive-coated forearms and the muscles rippling under his black shirt. I see his mouth, wide and kind, just as I saw it all that time ago. My sheets and bedspread are white, it makes him stand out all the more. And suddenly, I can't look at anything else. Take your shirt off, I interrupt. He looks up at me. What? I want to kiss you, and I'd rather do it when you don't have your shirt on. Uh, okay. I actually thought you'd want some sort of explanation for what my mother... Ren, your shirt... You're serious? I am. He grips the bottom of his black t-shirt and pulls it over his head in one motion. Immediately, I sit down on top of him. Much better, I mumble. Then I kiss him, and the cloud of darkness over my head retreats just a little. One hand runs down his taut chest, and my pulse quickens because I have never touched a boy like this. The cloud retreats a little more. But his head pulls back and he sighs. I know she was rude to you, but I didn't think you would care about that. It's the other stuff. All the stuff about me being violent that you must. My fingers fist in his soft hair and I kiss him again, stopping the words in his mouth. But once again, he pulls away. Eve. This is important. Not to me. Is anything important to you? I shrug. Kissing you. Kissing you is very important to me. His eyes are hard, and it looks like he might get angry. But then he smiles. He laughs. You are 
incredibly strange. His hands wrap around my waist, and his fingers snake under my shirt. So, are we still taking things slow? I want to say no. But then I remember Addison, and a ball of lead forms in my stomach. I feel Daniel and Landry on top of me, and the ball grows heavier. I nod. Hmm. It just seems so unfair, though, that if we're going to make out, I have to be undressed and you don't. I crinkle my eyes. Come on, he says. And he lies down on the bed and pulls me with him. Just as I was surprised by his strength in the bowl all that time ago, I am surprised again by how easily he can move me. It's not unfair because, you know, you look like that, I say from beside him, and my fingers swirl over his stomach, over the alternating muscle and depression, muscle and depression. My pulse is dangerously quick. Like what? He asks, and his eyebrows are pulled together. You know, I kiss him lightly on the chest. Perfect. Now he grins. Perfect? Wow. I think that's the first nice thing you've ever said to me. He pulls me close, and his lips are on mine, and his hand rides up my back under my shirt. It makes a shiver run the length of my spine. I don't think you have any idea how perfect you are, Eve. Come on, don't do that to me. Do what? Bullshit me. He is kissing me and laughing at the same time. See? I told you that you had no idea. It's fine. I kind of like it that way. I am smiling too. And somehow, even with my plan to escape now blown apart, even with a black and blue face and a darkened heart, I feel happy. Maybe even desirable. I kiss him harder now and grip his shoulders tightly. He pulls himself around so that he is lying on top of me. I swallow. It shouldn't remind me of them, it shouldn't. I am strong. And what happened the other night with Daniel and Landry wasn't that bad. It wasn't. I can do this. Ren's hand runs down my body, and my heart beats harder. But now I can't tell if it's with desire or dread. As his fingers near the waistband of my pants, I know the answer. My eyes snap open and my hands push hard against his chest. What? What's wrong? I don't know. I blink back tears before they emerge. It's nothing. He is watching me, and his eyes are dark and thoughtful, an impossible combination. It's nothing, I repeat but still my hands don't move from their spot against his chest. Finally, he nods. He moves sideways, so he is beside me. His lips graze my forehead. It's okay, Eve. It's not okay. Does it have to do with? Yes. He runs a hand over his face. Look, I get it. It would be weird if it didn't have any impact on you, okay? I know you're made of steel and everything. His eyes narrow and his lips curl up at the corners. But I think somewhere deep down in there, you're actually, I don't know, human? I grasp his hand in mine, and it feels safe and secure. Yeah, too human. I don't think so. His face is serious. You're the toughest person I've ever met. But you're good, too. You're hard and soft. I didn't really think a person could be both things at once. But you're that way. You're as tough as I am. His eyes sweep over my face. But who said I'm good? Before I can respond... He raises his head and kisses me on the lips. So, he says into my ear, 
Hunter. Hunter? Yeah. What about him? I ask. My bedside lamp glows a warm yellow, and it melts into his skin. It lightens his hazel eyes and his hazel hair. It makes his lips look more angular, his chin more square. You guys are close? He asks. We've been friends for as long as I can remember. So yeah, I'd say that's pretty close. Hmm. I raise my head and frown. What? It's nothing. It just seems kind of strange for you two to be friends. Why? Because he's a guy and I'm a girl, Grandpa? No, he smirks. Because you're so different. Oh. I stare at the far wall, plain and undecorated. Then I shrug. I guess I never noticed. Hmm. Ren? Yeah? Please tell me you're not jealous. I am laughing. I can't hold it in. His fingers that crawl along my bare arm are still now. Of course not. Good. Because Hunter and I are practically family. You can ask him. So it would be kind of ridiculous if you were intimidated. That's not really the point. Well, what do you want me to say? I love him. He's my oldest friend. You love him. Not like that. I roll my eyes. Because the thought of Hunter being anything more than my best friend is laughable. Almost as laughable as thinking he would feel anything more for me. He nods. I know, I know, not like that. He runs a hand through his hair, and I watch the muscles in his arm engage with the motion. The fact that I can touch that arm, touch it and squeeze it and kiss it, makes something warm seep through my veins. It makes me never want to leave this spot, nestled beside him. When he speaks again, his voice is quiet. I'm not sure where I'm going with this. You're intimidated, I say lightly. Very funny. I could kill Hunter with my eyes closed. I look up at him, and he looks at me. He brushes the stray hairs from my eyes. It is a strange thing to say. You could kill him too, Eve, he murmurs into my ear. A strange thing indeed. Chapter 27 Are there swings? Maggie smiles. Of course there are swings. Although if memory serves me, only half are operational. Don't tell me you're a fan. Something like that, laughs Connor. Wait, is that weird to admit? Not at all. She pauses to straighten her ponytail. I guess you guys had your own preem playground growing up? He nods. Are there any on the second or third floors? I scoff at the suggestion. Of course not. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing the upper mean one. It won't be nearly as nice as yours, Maggie warns. That's okay. The last time we were at ours, oh God, we were probably five years old, right? Ren shrugs. I always went with your family, so you'd know better than I would. Yeah, except you were always getting in fights, so we could never stay long. I glance at Ren and see him shrug. Hunter sits on the other side of the table beside Maggie, Emerald beside me. Lunchtime in the mean cafeteria. So how do you guys get in? Connor asks. It's left unlocked once a month. I explain as I push peas around my plate. But I am barely paying attention. Instead, my eyes dart around the crowded cafeteria for signs of Daniel or Landry. It has been three days since the attack, and I haven't laid eyes on them since. It is just a matter of time. Making the whole thing worse is the knowledge that I have no way out. No ticket to freedom awaits in my back pocket. 
I am stuck down here, confined and imprisoned, battered and bruised, and with a giant red X painted on my back. Worse yet, that X will become much more pronounced once Daniel and Landry are made guards. Before, I had to escape Eleven by the end of what civilization used to call summer because I couldn't bear the thought of serving Commander Katz, or kneeling before a preem, or being branded with my worst memories. Still can't. But now it is doubly important that I go by then. For the cleaners, Hunter adds, and I force myself to nod. Right, for the cleaners. Maggie twists the end of her ponytail. Yeah, we sneak in after the cleaners are gone. Usually ten o'clock. It's usually us and, well, whoever else wants to come. Sometimes it's a big group, sometimes it's small. And always there's booze, she adds with a wink. Connor laughs. It's this weekend? Saturday night. Fourth floor, past where the admin offices are for the job tours. We're looking forward to it. Right, Ren? Ren nods. Don't mind him. Like I said, he spent most of his time at the playground in a fist fight. It's probably bringing back some pretty painful memories. So, any luck with the job search? I turn to Ren and drop my voice as our friends continue to talk. Is there something going on there, or is it my imagination? She's seeing someone, isn't she? I nod. Treats her like shit, though. Uh. I notice that his plate is largely untouched. Everything okay? Everything's fine. You don't have to go, you know. He looks at me. To the party? Yeah, it's kind of... If you're going, I'm there. He fixes me with a stare. Besides, I've never seen you wasted before. I elbow him in the ribs. Very funny. But my smile evaporates as two figures push through the cafeteria doors. Daniel. Landry. The noise of the crowd seems to drown away into nothingness. A faint murmur at best. And all I can hear is blood rushing in my ears. They look perfectly relaxed. Perfectly at ease with life. My eyes watch them until they sit at the far end of the table. They can't see me, and I can't see them, but I can feel their presence, feel their viciousness suffocating me, pushing down my esophagus, closing in around my neck like Daniel's fingers did. And now I can't leave Eleven. I have no way out, no way to escape. I feel like I could vomit, but I'm not doing a good job of hiding it, I know that, and if I'm not careful, then Ren and the others will begin to suspect something. I think Ren already does. Did you guys hear the protest this morning? I hear my voice say. It sounds higher than usual. Maggie nods. I had to take a different route from Mom and Dad's. They were dragging some guy who got killed a few days back. Half the lower mean hallways are streaked with blood. Really disgusting. A few days? Asks Hunter. Usually they're pretty quick to get rid of the bodies. I'm guessing the authorities didn't even realize there'd been a death. Emerald's fist slams down on the table and we are silent. Can we please talk about something else? Her eyes are bloodshot, and I know without asking that she hasn't been sleeping. Sorry, Emerald, Maggie says. I didn't even think. It's fine. Just change the subject, please. Her plate, too, is untouched. The cafeteria door swings open once again, and this time it's Kyle. A moment later, his hands land on Maggie's shoulders. Let's go, he says, and I see her body tense up. Beside her, Connor stares at his plate. After a moment's hesitation, she stands, and Kyle gives her a look. What did I tell you about wearing your hair up? It looks terrible like that. Do you want to date an upper mean or not? She mumbles something, probably an apology, and I glare at him. But as he notices my discolored face, his mouth breaks into a sneer. Looks like you met someone who was a bit bigger than you, huh? Hopefully they taught you some manners. 
be very careful, Ren says to him before I can speak. His voice is level and restrained. Everything mine wouldn't be if I could pass air through my teeth. Kyle's eyes flick back to Maggie. Hurry up, he spits at her. I want to tell her to stay here with us. Stay here where she is treated with respect, where she is safe. But I can't, because that would only make things worse for her. Besides, I am too agitated right now to say much of anything. They are here. They are here. My attackers. My foot twitches and I can't stop chewing my thumb. When Daniel stands, when he leaves the cafeteria a short time later, I notice two things. The first is that Ren's back straightens. He is watching Daniel as closely as I am. The second is that there is a splint on his finger, one that makes me smile, just a little. Hopefully it is slow to heal. With Daniel gone, I allow myself a deep breath. Landry, though, remains behind, and I will have to pass him on my way out. I feel his fingers on my stomach, and I want to rip him to shreds. So I focus on breathing in and out until the feeling passes. It wouldn't be smart to pick a fight right now. I am not fully healed. It wouldn't be smart to pick a fight, period. More than anything, I think, I want Daniel and Landry and Zar to leave me alone. I want peace. Ren is close behind me when we go, and his presence is steadying. But when my eyes latch onto Landry's blonde hair, he must feel me staring, because his head swivels as I near, and his gray eyes come alive with recognition. Recognition of the pain he and Daniel put me through. In an instant he is grinning and standing, and his arm wraps around my shoulder and my legs go numb. I am cold all over. Can't move. Wow, Eve. Looks like you took it hard. And right in the face, what a shame. Then he moves his mouth to my ear. Next time I'll see to it that you take it hard somewhere else, too. The words make me nauseous. But before I can even think of puking or responding or whatever it is my warped brain wants to do, I am thrown forward and onto my hands and knees. I see why a second later. Ren has Landry by the collar of his shirt, and he is shoving him forward to the edge of the cafeteria where the tables don't reach. Landry's eyes are wide with surprise, his grin gone, and already his palms are open, a gesture of peace. Ren's hands unclench and release him. They rise and mimic Landry's. Peace. And then the muscles in Ren's back twitch like they are connected to electricity, and his fist connects with Landry's eye socket. Landry is thrown backward, but he manages to stay on his feet. I blink, and once again, Ren's hands are raised, and I can see that he is saying something to Landry. Probably I should do something. Probably I should go over there. But I don't move. I am rooted to the ground. The second punch breaks Landry's jaw. I can hear it from here. I can see the shock cut through his eyes. And then Ren's free hand wraps around Landry's skull. And he is punching him quickly now, again and again, until Landry's knees are buckling and Ren lets him go. He drops to the ground. Calmly, Ren examines his bloodied knuckles. He examines his opponent, who begs for mercy on the floor. Now my legs are moving. They are propelling me forward, and I can see that Ren is smiling. His chest may heave from exertion, but as he bends over Landry, I know he is not finished with him. He won't be finished with him until the light leaves Landry's eyes for good. This is why I lied in the first place. This is something I need to stop even if part of me doesn't want to. Ren is on top of him, and his eyes flash with danger, and I am screaming his name. But it is no good. The attack continues, and blood splatters over his olive arms, and Landry's eyes are closing. And so I do something I probably shouldn't. I grasp at Ren's fist. 
I wedge myself in front of him, into his field of vision. His eyes barely register my presence, they are so wild. Ren! I scream. Stop! Stop! I slap him across the face, and his eyes latch onto mine. And for a fraction of a second, I am scared for my own life. But then, it is Ren who is looking at me. And I know he can hear me. Stop! I repeat, and I say it as firmly as I can. Please, stop, or he's going to die. Stop, or you're going to be sent above ground. And then, before I can process whether or not a preem would actually be sent out for killing an upper mean, I freeze. And I have forgotten about Landry. Even about Wren. I have forgotten everything around me and before me. For now, I have a solution. Now I have a way out. A proper one. It was there in front of me all along, and now I can finally see it, and I see it firmly within my grasp. All I must do is kill a person. And then I am free. Chapter 28 My fist strikes the bag, and the dull thud it makes reminds me of my heel on Landry's chest. And thinking of Landry makes me think of Wren. Of Wren nearly killing him yesterday. Maybe he has killed him, I don't know. Landry wasn't moving when I finally forced Wren away. Someone took him to the nurse's station. I haven't gotten word since. I punch the bag again and feel the wetness of blood. Maggie is watching me, sitting along the walls in the cylindrical tunnel that connects the training rooms to the bowl. There are no fights scheduled today. We have the place to ourselves. Are you feeding the noms anymore, or are you done with that? She asks. Her voice is heavy, not like her normal self. I finish a set of 50 punches before I answer. Going today, as a matter of fact. So that guard's been reassigned? That's what I heard. From? Jules. Apparently he was filling in for Melissa for a couple weeks while she did breakfast duty. I look at her and shrug. Now Melissa's back to lunches, so I'm good to go. She picks at her thumb. You know, you really should apply for a guard job, even if it is a long shot especially after what Daniel said about never giving you a moment's peace. Remember? Yeah, of course I do. But I'm not interested, I say between strikes. Besides, it's an upper mean job. They wouldn't hire a lower mean in a million years. That's ridiculous. If you're a guard, they'll leave you alone. Plus, you'll be armed. And don't tell me the guardship won't at least consider your application. With your fighting record and all the volunteer... Maggie, I'd rather... Die than be a guard? Yeah, I know. So you've said. But maybe you need to start thinking more seriously about what's at stake. Daniel tried to kill you, Eve. This isn't the same old shit as when we were kids. I attack the bag with fury at her words, picturing Daniel's face instead of thick hide, and I feel beads of sweat form along my brow. She's right. It isn't the same old shit at all. Everything has changed. So yesterday sounded pretty wild, she says after a while. I turn and watch her as I catch my breath. Her arms wrap around her knees, and her brown hair falls loosely around her shoulders. She has a black eye, one that is partially swollen shut. I just can't believe it was Daniel and Landry who did that to you. I knew they were scum, but still... And I can't believe Wren. Her eyes meet mine. Wild, I agree. My voice is disinterested by design. He's frightening. I shrug. You trust Wren? I give her an exasperated look and then turn back to the punching bag. I attack it with a fresh burst of energy. What I really need to do is focus. Not on form, not on building muscle, but on the task at hand. I have to kill someone. 
and in order to do that, I need to decide who I am going to kill. Daniel or Landry are the obvious choices, although possibly Ren has taken care of one of them already. The thought makes me shiver, his eyes flashing with danger, his calm resolve, that smile. All of it makes me shiver, but mostly because I am not sure I have it in me. Maybe that cruel monster inside me is smaller than I realized. Maybe I am not a killer. Focus, Eve. Daniel or Landry. But there are other options, too. Other people who deserve to die. That guard with the black bead eyes, for one. Can we drop the lies yet, Eve? Maggie says loudly from the wall. Or does our lifetime of friendship mean nothing? I turn to her, the bag instantly forgotten. My thoughts forgotten, too. Excuse me? You and Ren are together, she says simply. What? Come on, don't play that. It only makes it worse. I'm your best friend and you kept it a secret. It's pretty huge, you know. You haven't exactly had a boyfriend before. Why you felt you couldn't confide in me, of all people, I'll never know. I stare at her coldly. Save the lecture on secrets, okay? Her arms cross over her chest and she leans forward. What's that supposed to mean? Look at your face, I spit at her, and my voice sounds loud and hot. You think I haven't noticed the bruises? You think the others haven't? She blinks at me, frozen, and then she stirs. I ended things with him. Her voice rings through the tunnel. It vibrates with emotion. Last night. It's over. In an instant, I am crouching in front of her. She looks thinner than I remember. Her eyes don't look into mine, and she trembles. Nothing on my tongue feels right or good enough. And so silently, I wrap my arms around her and hold her tight. She doesn't move, not initially. But then her body relaxes into mine, and I can hear her crying. And I don't want to ever let her go. When her tears slow, I draw back and consider her. She doesn't look like Maggie. She looks like a shell of a person. And if I speak too loudly, she'll crack. She'll break forever. You did the right thing, I say quietly. You know that, right? She nods, but her eyes still refuse to meet mine. You didn't deserve that shit. Nobody does, I continue. Things are going to be better for you now, okay? I promise. This is good, Maggie. This is really, really good. She blinks away tears and frowns. Is it, though? I don't want to end up alone. I know how pathetic that sounds, but I don't. And now that we're done with school, we're not kids anymore, you know? I force a laugh. Do you know what a catch you are? And just because school's finished doesn't mean you have to figure your entire life out right now. Where's your head at? She frowns. I don't know. But he was just so charming, you know? With his upper mean job and allotments and that blue dress shirt. She sighs. Maggie, you're the most amazing person. You can do a million times better than that jerk. You deserve a million times better. She rolls her eyes. I'm serious. I'm not just saying that. Well, thanks. When did he do this to you? My fingers graze the swollen ring of purple that doesn't belong on her face. She shakes her head before answering. It was after lunch. He was angry. Because of me and Ren. She looks away, and her shoulder nudges into a small shrug. He started apologizing over and over, just like always, promising he wouldn't do it again. But this time was different. This time, he went too far. 
Her eyes meet mine. He punched me in the face, Eve. He punched me. And then she is crying again. And both her hands cover her eyes, but they can't keep the drops from falling. Nothing can. I feel helpless and useless, and all I want to do is hurt Kyle. Beat the shit out of him, just like Bruno said. But remembering Bruno's words only makes me feel worse. So much worse. And my own eyes burn with tears. When did life get so complicated? So intense? So real? She sobs. What if he doesn't leave me alone? It's okay, Maggie. I hear myself mutter. It's okay. I'll make sure he doesn't come within a mile of you. I'll make sure he leaves you alone, I promise. She shudders and then looks up at me with lime green orbs that glisten. I don't know what I'd do without you, Eve. I really don't. And there's that old feeling again. Guilt. Because once I go, I won't be there for her any longer. I won't be able to protect her from Kyle. Unless I kill him. I could kill Kyle. A parting gift before I go. She wipes her eyes and shakes her head. Let's not talk about things with Kyle. I don't even want to think about him. Not right now. Let's talk about you instead, she says, and forces a smile across her pretty face. A face that should always have a smile on it. I mean, God, Eve, I can't believe you have a boyfriend. Yeah, me neither. Have you guys kissed? Maggie, what? It's just a question. Come on, indulge me. I could use some girl talk right now, trust me. Okay, yeah. I mean, yeah, of course we've kissed. She sits up a bit straighter. Is he a good kisser? He is, isn't he? I duck my head, but I can't keep the smile from my mouth. Yep. Like, on a scale from one to ten? A hundred. She squeezes my arm and laughs. Have you? No, I say loudly. No, definitely not. She stares at me with her eyebrows raised, and I shrug. It's just that, well, I don't know, really. If you're not ready, that's totally... It's not that, I say. It's just... I have no idea what I'm doing. And he clearly does, so... Oh, God, that is so not something you need to worry about. Believe me on this one. There is zero chance that boy will be disappointed by any... Um, encounter between the two of you. I've seen the way he looks at you. His last girlfriend was different from me, though. Her body. It's, you know. No. It's... There's not as much muscle. It's more... Feminine. She laughs, and I stare at her. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know I shouldn't laugh. <laughs> I just can't believe we're having this conversation. Come on, Eve, it's you. Since when do you care about being feminine enough? I don't know. I guess I've never had to think about it before. You know, since I've never had a boyfriend or anything. I stare at my hands. And something Landry said during... about how my body looks like a guy... Stop. Her eyes are earnest, and she holds my gaze. Just stop. I'm not even going to indulge you right now by telling you how beautiful you are, or this or that. I'm not letting you sink that low. Who gives a shit about what Landry thinks? You're Eve, and you're strong, and you make no apologies for it. Got it? My gaze wanders over the many punching bags, hanging throughout the tunnel, most of them stained and threadbare. I nod. Got it. He really cares about you, you know? 
I glance at her. Why do you say that? Because of yesterday? Well, yeah, hello. I can assure you if some guy attacked me, Kyle wouldn't have lifted a finger, let alone beat him to within an inch of his life. She is still. He also wouldn't hang out with my friends. Something Wren seems more than happy to do. My chest swells at her words, and I shake out my arms to distract myself. Just don't tell Hunter, okay? He hates him. Don't you think Hunter will figure it out? I mean, you have to really want to believe there's nothing going on between you two to believe that. Even so, I pause. It isn't just Hunter I'm worried about. Don't tell anybody. Why? I give her a look. Why do you think we kept it secret in the first place? I honestly have no idea. Because he's a preem. So? So? So it matters. You know it does. To who? You or him? To me, I say softly. All my life I've hated them. All of them. And now... And now you've found that you don't hate one. A few, actually, since his friends don't seem so bad. I feel myself nodding along with her. Maybe it never really made sense to hate an entire society. Maybe it never made sense that all of them up there were evil in the first place. The actions of the few should never speak for the many. This is something I already know. Besides, what's in a birthplace? But then a new thought strikes me. Think about what my parents would say. And other lower means, for that matter, like... Like Sully. Yeah. Okay, some might not be that hyped about it, sure. Maybe you don't spring it on your parents anytime soon. But come on, Sully? She laughs. I didn't realize the two of you ran in the same circles. You know how it is, though, I press. Preems and lower means don't mix, ever. Nobody will be okay with it. So maybe you don't broadcast it. Maybe you don't think that far into the future, either. Just enjoy what's happening. And don't shut out your friends. Or his. Because all we're going to be thinking is how lucky Ren is to be dating someone as kick-ass as you. I roll my eyes and jump to my feet. I always knew you were full of crap. Now I need to work on my punches. Don't think you're getting off the hook that easily, she calls. I'll just wait here until you're done. And then we can have a nice, long chat about Eve and Wren. I shake my head, but it does nothing to dislodge my smile. When I show up to work the Nam's food line, I find someone is already there. The guard has been by to unlock the door, the lights have been turned on, and the food has mostly been portioned. Mom... She looks over her shoulder and raises an eyebrow. Her features are delicate, not like mine. Hi, Eve, she says, and her voice sounds like I remember from when I was small. They told me you quit. I stare at the back of her head as a million thoughts fly through my own. I didn't quit, I just took a break. I've had a lot going on. It is mostly true, this lie. There is no need to tell her about the guard. I see. What are you doing here? My voice sounds impossibly weak. Did you know I was coming today? She shakes her head, and something inside me deflates like a punctured balloon. I was hoping I would see you, though. You don't come by very often to see your father and me. I'm not invited. That isn't fair, Eve. I stay silent. Then my boots shuffle forward, and I am beside her, helping to prepare the last of the offerings. I heard about the boy on your team, about his death. Her eyes lick my wounds. Thankfully, they are mostly healed by now. 
she probably thinks they are from the bowl, and I don't bother to correct her. Blue Circuit. I fight for Blue Circuit, and his name is Bruno. Was Bruno. A terrible way to go. I don't need her telling me that. It is all I can do to keep him from invading my thoughts throughout the day, particularly that last conversation of ours. Then there's the image that Emerald painted of his death. It follows me. It colors my dreams at night. Does Dad know? He's the one who told me. Oh. The fact that he hasn't been by stings more now. Are you still planning on fighting professionally? My hands fold together a parcel of lentils. I am slow, rusty. I don't know. I haven't decided. Does Dad still want me to? Decide for yourself, Eve. Your life is too important to waste on other people's wants. I stare at her with my lips undone. But she leans forward and slides open the partition that separates us from the hungry denominators without another word. I realize as I watch her that I barely know this woman. The thought makes a sharp pain rip through my chest. She is hardly ever like this, hardly ever normal. Usually she is engrossed in her embroidery or her thoughts, and the rest of us slide by unnoticed. I know from experience I won't have her attention for long, even though I want nothing more, Decide for yourself, she said. Decide for myself. I wait for the rush of hungry noms to be over before I speak again. What if my decision is selfish? You do not exist in a vacuum, Eve, just as I taught you when you were young. You must always take into account the impact your actions will have on those around you. You owe it to your loved ones and to society at large. I nod. I knew she would say something like that. However, sometimes you should behave selfishly. My head lifts to look at her, and I see unbearable sadness streaking through her eyes. I hear her screams from all those years ago, feel them hot against my cheek. What do you mean? I ask quietly as I drop my gaze to the floor. I can't bear to look at her. Maybe it is better when she is busy with her embroidery. Certainly it is easier to think of leaving forever when she is closed off to me and to the rest of the world. I mean that life is ruthless and merciless and unkind. Sometimes we owe it to ourselves to be greedy. I wonder what she has done that is selfish what greed she has bestowed upon herself after the unkind world of ours took her child. No, not the unkind world. That is too vague, too generous. Commander Katz, the leader of Eleven. Ted Burgess, the head of population control. The guards, they took her child. There is no chance to ask, because Monica and her son Avery are at the window. Besides, I don't think she would give me an answer. Hi, Eve, I've missed you, Monica says shyly. So is this little guy. I give myself a shake. I've missed you guys too, I reply to my friend, and I mean it. Especially you, I add to Avery with a wink. He covers his eyes, and I laugh. Looks like someone's feeling better. Monica nods. He had a rough go there for a bit, fevered all day and all night. But now he's better, so life is good. Right, you? She smiles deeply at him, and I notice her dimples for the first time, and they remind me of Emerald. Her hand strokes his hair as my mother gathers two parcels and two buns. Until next time, Avery, I say with a salute. Until next time, Miss Eve he says back in his tiny voice. I laugh again. My mother's back is straight as we watch them go, the two of them walking hand in hand. I wonder if it hurts, 
seeing a mother with her little boy. I wonder if it makes her think of Jack, if it makes her yearn. I don't think she intended to break the rules all those years ago. I don't think she intended to become pregnant a second time, not with so much on the line. But once it became evident that her swollen belly could mean only one thing, her rule-breaking began. Instead of reporting the pregnancy, instead of aborting the fetus, she hid herself from view. And when the time came, she summoned a black market specialist, one who delivered Jack in exchange for plastic goods smuggled by my father from the factory where he worked. The relief she must have felt once he was born, safe and whole, firmly within her arms. Probably she thought the odds were in her favor, when in fact, the chips were stacked against her all along. I think of the song, the one that used to lull me to sleep each night, and now does again. I have an opportunity to ask her about it, but just as I open my mouth, my eyes snag on her pushed-up sleeves, on the ink that is so rarely visible. My father's name is stamped there, and my own listed next, alongside my birth date. And then there it is, that most unwanted addition to her life story. Second child, Jack Hamilton, born in contravention of rules 43.5a to 45.8 hidden from authorities in contravention of rules 48.1a to 49.7d, removed from compound pursuant to rule 3. It is barely legible. Scar tissue distorts each letter, and I think of her in the days after those words were inscribed, clawing at the skin until it bled, desperate to rid herself of those memories, scratching, scratching, scratching so relentless that my father had to restrain her, had to tie her hands behind her back, bits of skin and strands of tissue everywhere. Howdy, Eve. Hi, Mrs. Eve. I blink and see Jules waving hello to my mother. Elaine, it's Elaine. You used to do this job forever ago, didn't you? She nods. In another lifetime. Jules's eyes meet mine, and I notice that she wears a white sweatshirt with black cuffs around the elbows that used to be my own. Noms hardly receive any allotments. Things going okay, lady? I shrug. Can't complain. Looks like a few complaints are warranted. Her gaze dips down my face. Just the bowl. You know how it is. Still, her eyes are narrowed. Maybe she doesn't believe me. We should hang soon, she says. You know the parties this weekend, right? I did not, but my weekend is wide open, and be there I shall. You bring in that cute sidekick? Huh? Oh, he's just a friend. And he might be there, yeah. I give her a sideways look. I don't want to talk about Ren in front of my mother. Partly because he is a boy mostly because he is a preem. Jules nods, and I think she understands. All righty then. Well, thanks for the food, Elaine. She looks at me and winks. See you Saturday, Eve. After I say goodbye, I clear my throat. Can I ask you one more thing? You can ask me as many things as you like. You know that. I sigh. Sometimes I don't think she realizes she is usually unreachable. My voice is quiet. How exactly does forgiveness work? Immediately I frown. I had planned on asking her something different. Not about the song. To bring up the past wouldn't be fair, I know that now. Instead, I was going to ask her whether it was wrong to take another life, if that life was evil, Maybe I didn't because I already know the answer. Or maybe I just don't care about right or wrong. She slides the partition closed before responding. It's silent in the small room, more so than last time, when I was here with Ren. 
My heart was hammering loudly then. Now it is still. Dead. She faces me and places her hands on my shoulders. My shoulders, like the rest of me, are thick with muscle. My mother's hands and arms are frail, skin and bones. But they rest so heavily on me. I feel like I could fall to my knees. I have to resist the urge to squirm, to shrug myself free. That is a strange question to ask, Eve. Whatever greedy choice you are considering that requires forgiveness. She looks at her feet and shakes her head. I'm afraid I am not the right person to ask when it comes to forgiveness. I stare into her eyes and see something deep, deep within that burns with putrid yellow hatred. She hasn't forgiven those who took Jack, not by a fraction, not by a millimeter. And I'm willing to bet the fog she so often hides behind is her one greedy act. Chapter 29 The next day, I sit cross-legged in the Oracle and wait for Wren. There was a note shoved under my door this morning, asking me to meet him here. I haven't seen him since he attacked Landry. Outside, the sun is shining behind me, its rays too bright for my eyes. The sky overhead is a brilliant blue, and the tree leaves flutter lazily in the hot breeze. I can see the heat. I can hear it buzzing. I let my eyes close, let my mind drift away and into nothingness. I feel myself running north. You lied to me. My eyes open, and my stomach muscles draw my spine straight. He moves into my field of vision, but he doesn't sit and he doesn't smile. His right fist hangs at eye level in front of me, and I see purple scabs beginning to form over nickel-sized wounds. Ren, you told me you didn't know who it was. His voice is tight, and his eyes are hard. Again and again, you swore you didn't see. Yeah, okay, I get it, I say. I lied. Can we drop it? I don't want to fight with him, but I don't feel bad for lying. He crouches in front of me, and we are separated by only inches. That's it? That's all you have to say? I exhale. I didn't tell you the truth so you wouldn't do exactly what you did. Is he even still alive? Who gives a shit? He growls. Since when does someone like you give a shit about someone like Landry after what he did? Since when does someone like you protect her attackers like a... I wasn't trying to protect them, I say. And my voice is loud, but it wavers. It isn't strong right now. My eyes cast down. I wasn't trying to protect them. So what was it? My gaze skirts around him, to the blowing leaves, to the mounds of ragged rock in the distance that glint majestically in the sunlight. I didn't want you to be sent out there. Why? His voice is dismissive. That's where you want to go. Yeah, I do, Ren. I do. But you don't. So, I guess I was trying to make sure that didn't happen. His eyes are still hard, but he sits now. His muscles relax. You don't need to protect me, Eve. Not from anything. And especially not from that. What's that supposed to mean? Come on. You know how this shithole compound works by now. Use your head. I take a deep breath. You wouldn't be sent out? Even if you killed him. Even if you killed the pair of them. You're a preem. You wouldn't be punished. I'm not just a preem, Eve. I'm a well-connected one. So yes, you're right. I wouldn't be sent out there to burn. 
I shake my head. How can the rules apply to some? Injustice pinches my stomach. I glare at him and cross my arms. But even as I do, I know it isn't his fault. I'm still glad I did what I did, I say after a minute of silence passes between us. You're glad you lied to me. Yeah, I am. I did the right thing, Ren. Had I told you, I know what you would have done. You would have killed both of them before I could stop it, right? And yes, you wouldn't be punished for it, but you'd become a killer. On my watch. You think I want that? He leans forward and drops his voice. His eyes reduce down to slits. But you're willing to become one yourself? Who have you decided on? Because I just got word that Landry's going to pull through. So he's up for the taking if you decide to pass on Daniel. I am still. I don't even breathe. How do you know? If I were you, I'd set my sights on Daniel, he continues. Landry's already paid for his sins. So it's time to share the fun around, don't you think? Tell me how you know. I wasn't born yesterday, Eve. I could see it in your eyes in the cafeteria. I put two and two together just like you did. So, he shrugs, you have a way out. Kill someone, and you get to die yourself. Congratulations. Is this why you asked me to meet you? So you could make me feel like crap? Tell me how I'm wrong. I shrug. You're not wrong. Aside from the me dying part, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Only you're not a murderer. How do you know? Because you wouldn't let me kill Landry. Because you're honorable. Because you're good. After a nervous laugh, I stretch out my hand, curl it around his. You're overestimating my goodness. I need to go, and nothing is going to stand in my way. Especially not ending a life that doesn't deserve to live. I could make things better for you, you know. Here, in Compound 11. A job, for instance. I could get you a job on one of the higher floors. And goods, anything you need. Goods? Preems don't receive allotments like downstairs. If we need anything, if we want anything, it's ours. I can make it yours. I stare at him. And I could get rid of both of them, he continues. Daniel and Landry. Their friend, too. And anyone else who bothers you. I resist the urge to shiver at his words. At his influence. His power. Instead, I turn his hand over and run my fingers along the damaged skin. You would do all that for me? To get you to stay? I would do anything. I blink back a million tears that threaten to burst their way into the world. I blink them back and away because I need to stay strong. I've already decided. There's no going back on it. Not now, not ever. He leans forward and kisses me on the lips. And part of me aches to stay with him. To never let him go. The thought of saying a final goodbye is almost too much for me to bear. Almost. He pulls away and sighs. I just wish I met you before you made up your mind. Suddenly, I wish that too. A moment later, he gives me a funny look. Did I hear you say that you don't plan on dying out there? Not so much. Care to elaborate? I laugh a little. My mother's song echoes through my head. But all I say is, You know by now I'm a survivor. Ask a different question. He grins. Then a loud hum from the middle of the oracle draws both our attention. 
and when I glance at him, I see he is already jumping to his feet. We have to go now. The elevator. And since it only runs from the fifth floor, we have seconds before we are spotted. He grabs my hand and pulls me through the sunlit space in the direction of the trap door. The elevator clicks into position, and I hear the door slide open. Space is the issue, comes a woman's voice, and I recognize it as Ren's mother. Is it, Cynthia? It sounds to me like we have much bigger issues on our hands than space alone. If the solution is another fleet of panels, she snaps, and I hear the clicking of her high heels. Then space is indeed the first issue we must tackle. Jump, Ren growls in my ear. I do as he says, and collapse a second later on the floor below. It knocks the wind from me, and I can't breathe. I can only watch as he silently pulls the door shut, then jumps from the top of the ladder next to me. He lands more gracefully than I did, and moves quickly to the edge of the room, where he snaps off the lights. We have to go, he says through the darkness. He grabs me under the shoulders and pulls me easily toward the door. Then, I hear the trap door open, and light pierces the small space. I draw my boots quickly to my chest and away from the center of the room. We are frozen, neither of us so much as breathing. See anything? There is a heavy pause, and then... Nothing. Must have been the wind. The trap door slams shut, and we are in blackness once more. You okay? His voice sounds stern, and as I catch my breath, a bubble of laughter escapes, and then another. Finally, I can't hold it in any longer, and I must press my hand to my mouth to try to silence it. My shoulders shake, and my stomach hurts from the effort. Come on, he says finally, and I can hear in his voice that he has been laughing as well. He lifts me with too much ease into the hallway, where the walls glow white around us. There is blood on my shirt, I notice, and I see that Ren's knuckles have come apart. I take his hand in mine, my brow nodding as I examine it. Really, Eve? What? I don't want you injured on my account. He shakes his head. Do you remember when we first met? I merely mentioned the fact that your knuckles were bleeding and you chastised me for it. What, whether you'd ever seen blood before? It was a simple question. There was no chastising involved. I nudge him in the ribs, our hands still entwined. His hand bleeds onto mine, but I don't care. He nudges me back as we walk, and I'm laughing again. And then I realize I don't know where we are or where we're going. I turn to him. I'm not exactly allowed to roam free up here, you realize. Relax, Eve. You're with me. So I do relax, because in this moment, I am happy. I am happy to have him by my side. I am happy that Landry didn't die, that Ren didn't become a murderer on my behalf. And I'm happy we made it safely from the Oracle. I can't believe we almost got caught. Yeah, and by my lovely mother of all people. God. Part of me wishes we didn't run, just so I could see the look on her face. We turn onto a busier corridor, and automatically I pull my hand from Ren's and jam it into my pocket. Second nature. A moment later, my eyes latch onto two people. One, thick with the build of a fighter. The other, Addison. She is staring at me, and by the look on her face, I'm willing to bet she saw his hand in mine or how close we were walking, or maybe the way we were smiling. I know it shouldn't make me happy, but it does. Haven't seen you on many of the tours, says the thick boy to Ren, and he shoves his hands into his trousers and pushes his head back so that he stares down his nose. He doesn't smile. Eyeing your mother's office, then? Like I told Addison, I am not interested in my mother's office. As Ren talks, I look more closely at his ex-girlfriend. 
I stare at freshly brushed red hair that reaches to her elbows. And I wonder, aside from her looks, what it was that he saw in her. Maybe it was how composed she is. Competent. Because even though I wish it wasn't true, she appears to be both those things. The revelation makes me scowl. Not paving the way for your friend long, I hope. What's that supposed to mean? Ren's eyes narrow. You know exactly what it means, the boy snaps. When are you going to stop dragging him alongside you? His cold eyes sweep over me, and it looks like he is going to say something more, but he bites his tongue. Whoever he is, he knows not to anger Ren. Addison, however, clicks her tongue. Ren, she interrupts. Can I see you for a moment? She nods in the opposite direction. No, Ren replies without hesitation. He turns back to the boy, and my eyes meet hers. She reduces hers down to slits, and they drop to my boots with disdain. Lower mean disdain. Half my mouth curls into a smirk. For I might hail from a lower floor, but I am thick with strength. And suddenly, I wouldn't have it any other way. Try not to worry yourself over him, Strike, Ren is saying. After all, he only stole your girlfriend that one time. For a second, I think Strike might attack, because his face turns red. But finally, his feet draw him away. Let's go, Addie, he says over his shoulder. But she stays behind. What exactly do you think you're doing? She says to Ren. And though her gaze doesn't shift from his, I can tell she is talking about me. I can see the longing in her eyes. Or maybe it's just my imagination. Then she smooths her skirt like she is agitated. Are you trying to punish me? He shakes his head. I'm just living my life. Something you should do too. She holds his gaze for a second more, then follows after Strike, her eyes cutting through me as she goes. His face is emotionless. Shall we? He is already walking, and I have to hurry to catch up. What was that all about? The fifth floor has more hierarchy than the rest of the compound combined. My friend Long happens to fall low on the ladder. That means his every move is scrutinized by assholes like Strike, who are scared shitless of getting grabbed around the ankle. It isn't what I meant, but I nod anyway. Where do you fall? I think I know the answer. My mother's office is a powerful one, he says. The admission, though expected, makes my skin prickle. Sure, my blanket hatred for all preems has proven to be misguided, a miss. But my hatred for powerful preems, the ones who run this compound, is perfectly warranted. He is not his mother's son, I remind myself. They are different people. They despise each other. How come you're not interested in it? I ask casually. He shrugs. Politics isn't for me. Because... Because bullshitting and small talk are two things I'd rather not do. Fair enough. I couldn't picture Ren doing either of those things, even if I tried. It is one of the reasons I like him. So what's long story? How do you fall low in the preem hierarchy? He's what they call illegitimate. He turns his head to look at me. His mother is a preem, his father is an upper mean. Long as the product of their brief tryst. We walk in silence as his words settle on my brain. They don't surprise me, but still they sting. It is another reminder that preems and means are not meant to mix. You weren't asking about Long, though, were you? He says eventually. No, I was asking about Addison. He turns onto a quiet corridor. One side is walled in glass, and through the glass I spot a series of large tables with red felt lining the top. Pool tables, I think they are called, though I have never seen one. 
but I remember hearing that the preems play pool. It is more civilized, I suppose, than fighting for sport. Well then, he says, your guess is as good as mine. Hmm. What? Nothing. He glances at me over his shoulder. What are you thinking? I'm thinking who cares about Daniel? Maybe I'll take her out instead. Ren's eyes narrow, but he can't stop the smile from spreading across his face. Jealous, Eve? Not at all. Just thinking maybe the compound would benefit as a whole without her. Uh-huh. There's the Eve I know. If you're not threatening my mother, to her face I might add, you're thinking about offing my ex. Very interesting. I punch him. Funny, you said the same thing, more or less, about offing Daniel and Landry. Mine's serious, he says and punches me back. Mine is too, I start. But his hands are wrapping around me, shaking me. And I am laughing, and he is too. His lips are on mine. And I don't care that we're in the middle of a preem hallway under lights so bright they burn my eyes. My hands curl around his waist, and I kiss him. I kiss him. I kiss him. We're not far, you know, he says between breaths, and his voice is low and rumbly. It lights a fire in my belly. From? My place. I smile a little. Let's go. The lighting is much better in here, I say as soon as we slip inside his apartment. I thought you liked it bright. I'm starting to come around on this dim stuff. Why's that? Because it's a little less embarrassing to do this. My hands grip the bottom of my shirt and pull it over my head. Ren freezes as he stares at me. I was thinking last time we made out it really wasn't fair at all that I got to keep my clothes on. He presses his mouth together and his eyes flash precisely my thinking. And then his hand grabs mine, and he is pulling me in the direction of the bedroom, and I am laughing uncontrollably the whole way. And for the record, he says into my ear as we collapse into bed, don't use the word embarrassing in relation to your body ever again. Are we clear? My lips find his. My hands run along his back and under his shirt, Mm-hmm, I manage to say before his clean, masculine smell overwhelms me. He pulls himself away, but it is only so he can rip his shirt off. And then his skin is against mine, and nothing has ever felt so warm and perfect. And I feel alive in a way I have never really experienced. My heart pushes against my breastbone. Every cell in my body feels electrified. God, you're perfect. He grumbles as he kisses me. I rope my fingers around his neck as his run through my hair, and I feel like I am consuming him, and he is consuming me, and it is manic and wild and free. When his lips reach my collarbone, I shiver. Everything okay, Eve? No complaints. His hands trace their way down my back, and then his fingertips curl around my waist and graze my stomach. Instantly, my muscles tense up. I stiffen. I hope that he doesn't notice, but he eyes me, then sighs. They touched you. It's okay. Come on, it's okay. I push my mouth toward his, but he shakes his head. It's too soon. It was days ago. Exactly. Days. I don't want you to be reminded of that. I don't want to be reminded of that. He frowns. I should have finished Landry when I had the chance. I smile into his chest and pull him close. Um, Ren, even when I am over it, there's a very good chance I'm going to get, you know, nervous. When we... Yep. I am thankful that the lights are dim, 
he can't see how deeply I blush. Hmm, he growls in my ear. Good point. He holds me tight in his arms and kisses my forehead. And there is that feeling again, that I never want him to let me go. But it doesn't make sense, because all I've ever wanted is just the opposite. Freedom. And that is what I will get when I make it above ground. That is what I will get when I kill a person. A hard pit forms in my stomach at the thought, and for a second I forget Ren lies against me, our hearts speeding in rhythm. All I can think about is how soul-destroying it must be to take the light from someone's eyes, no matter how dark those snake eyes may be. All I can think about is that I might not have the stomach for it, and so I might not ever escape Compound Eleven after all. I might have to stay here, in Ren's arms, forever. Chapter 30 The next day, murder doesn't seem so difficult to comprehend. My eyes watch Daniel, and as they do, his flit to mine. When they lock into position, I see them sparkle with dark laughter. Laughter that is sinister, that is full of ill intent. We are on opposite sides of the cafeteria, but still I can see them shine. Still, I can spot their wickedness. Is everything okay, Eve? I look at Hunter and nod. Daniel's over there, that's all. Too bad Ren isn't here says Maggie as she cranes her neck to see. I don't need Wren to defend me, I insist, and my voice is sharp. Maybe I'm afraid that I do. Okay, she says slowly. Well, that wasn't what I meant, she sighs. So is everyone getting excited for tomorrow night? Her voice is strained with effort. Normally it is light and airy, but lately it has been heavy bogged down with reality. We could all use a fun night, she adds. Hunter gives her one of his shy smiles. How come ever since school finished, life's been... Shit. He adjusts his glasses and frowns. Not shit, just... tough. Hopefully it isn't a sign of what's to come, mutters Emerald. You know, in the real world, on our own... We've had a run of bad luck, that's all, I say, and I sit straighter. And if we let it get us down, they win. The Daniels and Kyles and Anitas of the world win. Wow, Eve, says Hunter. I think that's the most positive thing I've heard you say in ages. No, wait, eons, literal eons. His eyes comb the ceiling like he is counting, and he nods. Eons. I kick him under the table. Very funny. What's going on with you lately? Hunter continues. You're hardly ever around. Maggie's eyes snap to mine, and I look sideways. I feel Emerald glance at me too. Both of them know. They know where I've been. With Ren. And if I am being more positive lately, it probably has something to do with him too. I think of kissing him of the feeling of his arms wrapped around me, skin to skin, and I smile. Hello? Hunter calls. He waves a hand in front of my face. You're grinning like a fool. I think you need to take a hiatus from the bowl before you do any permanent damage. I kick him again, harder this time. Both of us are laughing. Maybe I'm looking forward to letting loose tomorrow night after all. Know what I'm thinking, Eve? asks Maggie. Her lime green eyes twinkle. Don't say it. Makeover! I roll my eyes. I told you not to say it. What happened last time? Half of Emerald's mouth twitches into a smile. Oh, yeah, I remember. You looked like a poodle. She looked fantastic, Maggie protests. 
But okay, fine, I won't touch your hair. I'm just thinking a little makeup. That's it. It's not a bad idea, Eve, says Emerald. She winks. I've seen you attempt it, and you really could use a few pointers. I shove her. She doesn't need makeup, says Hunter between bites. She looks amazing just like that. I stare at him. But before I can respond, I am shoved from behind, and the cafeteria table digs into my sternum. I swing my legs around, but Daniel's hand lands on my chest, collecting the fabric of my shirt and forcing me to stay seated. He reminds me of that night. His face alone reminds me of that night. But for him to grab me? Looks like your face has healed up okay, Eve. Too bad. Get out of here, Hunter says sharply from the other side of the table. Emerald jumps to her feet, but I hold up a hand to stop her. This is something I need to deal with on my own. What do you want, Daniel? I whisper. Here's the thing. What your bodyguard did to my best friend is something I take personally. Very personally. Do you understand? Take it up with him, then. I'm sure he'd love to chat. He shrugs. I'd rather hit him where it really hurts. And I think I'm looking at just that. He sneers. Why he cares about the likes of you, I can only guess. But no doubt your lower mean charm will wear on him soon enough. In the meantime, consider yourself warned. He bends down so we are eye to eye. I'm coming for you. Then he is gone, and I am left with my heart thudding through to my feet. Whatever clout I had with Daniel has evaporated. I don't know if it was Ren fighting my fights for me that did it, or the attack itself. But if Daniel was ever intimidated by me, he is no longer. I'm a walking target. I can't be a walking target. I'll see you guys later. I say. Eve, starts Maggie, but I shake my head. I'll see you guys later, I repeat, and my voice is firm. Hunter and Emerald eye each other, but already I am gone. I follow Daniel out of the cafeteria in time to see him board the elevator, and then I head for the stairs. Moving over steps that witnessed my own slice of hell makes my palms slick, but I push on. Determination and anger are my guide and I step onto the fourth floor at the same time he does. The hallways are crowded, and he doesn't see me. I wait until he is half a hallway ahead, and then I follow. This time, I am the cat, and he is the mouse. Ren may have gotten revenge on Landry, but Daniel's blood is all for me. It is time he paid for his sins. It is time I see whether I have the stomach to kill. I think I do. He turns down a hallway that is quieter than the first. Still, there are too many people about, and the next hallway is the same. The one after that, though, is perfect. It is dead empty, and one of the lights is missing its fancy upper mean case. That means the bulb is glaring and uncomfortable, bright, so I will be able to see his anguish in detail. My heart doesn't thud anymore. It hammers with excitement. I jump on the balls of my feet, and I feel like I do in the bowl. I haven't worked out much since the attack, so my muscles are fresh. They are looking for an excuse to engage. And I am not injured anymore, or tired either. I've always thought I could beat Daniel. And now I will see. He is larger than me and in decent shape, but he doesn't have experience fighting. I stare at the back of his head, at the brown, curly hair cut short. It would be almost cute, that hair, if it didn't encase pure evil. It's strange. Neither he nor Landry looks particularly troubling, but scratch beneath the surface, and their veins run black. I am about to find out just how much. Right now I could do one of two things. I could run up behind him and attack, or I could call his name make it a fair fight. I am the kind of person who is fair, but he isn't. 
He wouldn't extend me that courtesy, and so I won't for him. I smile, and then my leg muscles twitch, and I am sprinting as fast as I can. And by the time he hears me and turns his head, I'm on top of him. I knock him to the ground and punch him three times in a row. Three quick bursts of rage that loosen his eye sockets. He is awake now, and he pushes me back with considerable force. His eyes streak red. The fight is on. His first punch I block, but the second I am not so lucky. I land in a heap on the floor. Normally I would jump to my feet again, but not this time. No. This time my fingers stretch into the lip of my boot, where they brush cool metal. Daniel is moving toward me, and my fingers plunge deeper, snatch the knife, and tuck it into my fist. I hate dirty little bitches like you who don't know their place, he says under his breath, and I let him drag me to my feet. I let him shove me into the wall. I wasn't planning on killing him today. I just wanted to see if I could. But the more vitriol he spews, the more I begin to think that now is the time. So what, Daniel? I say, and my voice is remarkably calm. What? You think you're going to be the one who finally puts me in my place? Is that it? Yeah, something like that. And he releases me, then shoves me against the wall with all his force. The impact stuns me, and it burns the back of my skull, but only for a moment. I kick him between the legs, and he doubles over in pain, into a position of weakness. I knock him quickly to the ground, and my fist unclenches. The knife is warmed through from my palm, and the blade springs open. His eyes find it. They widen. The hate that lurked there a second earlier is replaced by fear. What are you doing? What do you think I'm doing? I'm getting even. For when you tried to kill me. Tears burn behind my eyes, and my breathing is ragged. Below me, he struggles to free himself, to push me off him, and if I'm not quick, he will. My fingers are deft, and they shove the blade to the side of my fist, and I punch him across the face. The blade slices into his skin as I do. He screams. His warm blood is everywhere and panic overtakes his senses. But that was just a taste of what is to come. I must act quickly. I must kill him now, or he will get me off him and he will be gone. I must act now. My pulse races, and all I see is red. I am a monster, and I am cruel, and I can't wait to see the light leave his snake eyes forever. A small payment for all his sins. I am a killer. But more than anything else, I am a liar. Chapter 31 Every step I take hurts more than the last. Not my legs, not my arms, nothing physical. It is inside where it aches, and I can't think of a worse feeling. It is less painful to be black and blue and filled with broken bones. Now I am filled with despair, and everywhere I look is darkness. It was bad enough when my first plan to escape came to a crashing end. And then along came another, fortuitously dropped into my lap as if sent from the heavens. But I had my opportunity yesterday to kill Daniel, and I couldn't do it. And if I can't kill him of all people, I can't kill anybody. Not Landry, not Kyle, not the guard. I am not a murderer, not a monster. And that means my fate is sealed. I will never feel fresh air. I will never have freedom. I will never have a shot at finding Jack. Instead, I will spend my life serving those responsible for exiling him to a likely death. I should probably go back to my cell now. Maggie and the others are excited for the party. Maybe it would cheer me up to spend the day with them. The past two hours have been spent walking the lower mean corridors mindlessly, 
and my feet are beginning to ache from the concrete floors. I wonder what it would feel like to walk on top of the earth, the grass, the soil. What does that feel like underfoot? Jack experienced it. I hope he still does. I will never know. Just thinking it makes a sob choke my throat. I walk faster. The doors around me are more frequent now, and I can hear children playing. I must be near the family cells. My feet move of their own accord, and soon I find myself knocking on a door I know well. The dent along the bottom, the scruff marks near the keyhole, the fingerprints around the handle are intimate details, ones that are forever imprinted on my soul. Any day now, my parents will be moved to a smaller cell, and these little details will become imprinted on someone else. My father opens the door, and his eyebrows inch up when he sees me. No smile, not even any pleasantries. What are you doing here? He demands. I shrug, and my eyes comb the space for my mother. In the corner, and my heart sinks as I look at her. Embroidery sits on her lap, and her gaze doesn't lift to see me. Her expression is placid, her eyes empty. She mutters, tick tock, under her breath. Gone once more. I want to scream at her. I want to tell her to stop being selfish. Tell her that I still exist and I need her right now. But I can't do that. I am soft and weak and good. And I hate myself for it. My father clears his throat. I've been checking the schedule. Care to explain what's going on? At first, I have no idea what he is talking about. But then I realize he is referring to the bowl. I haven't had a fight lately. I haven't signed up for any either. Nothing's going on. This doesn't have anything to do with Bruno, does it? What? The fact that he died in the ring? You do realize most parents wouldn't want their kid fighting after something like that, right? He gazes at me calmly, and it makes anger burn my insides. It was a fluke, Eve. Nothing more. Don't throw away everything you have worked toward because of a fluke. Actually, it's everything you have worked toward. I just went along with it, remember? Because prize fighters get tons of allotments, right? Enough for me and you. He crosses his arms and stands taller. What exactly are you saying? That I've been using you? That you don't enjoy fighting? I hate it! I scream at him. The words erupt from my belly. On the other side of the cell, my mother doesn't flinch. I'm not sure she even hears. I've always hated it. And you know what? I hate you for making me do it. I stalk out of the room and slam the door as hard as I can. Now my legs move quickly. My brain races. Maybe he didn't deserve that. Maybe he did. Maybe it doesn't matter. Because soon I will be gone. After all, I didn't always plan on going above ground. Oh, no. Before I broke into the Oracle... I knew only that I was finished with Compound 11, and that is something I can still make happen. I can go to another compound, just like I planned. Except I have never discovered where the tunnels are that lead to Compound 10 or to Compound 12. Not on the many miles I've covered over the past 16 years on the mean floors. That means they probably run from the ground floor. Or the preem floor, then. Thank Eve. My feet carry me to the nearest stairwell, and I turn down it. It makes more sense for them to run tunnels deep below the earth. Building a tunnel right below ground level would be unwise. It could cave in too easily. The poisonous sunlight could infiltrate it. The first floor is more dangerous than the rest of the compound combined, but I don't care. My feet are moving too quickly for that to be a concern. And besides... 
Right now, the toxic ache in my stomach is lifting. Right now, I have a purpose. I have never been down this far before, only to work the denominator's food line from the feeding dock off the second floor. Nobody comes down here if they don't strictly have to. It's dark, darker than the lower mean floor, and eventually I stop running, pull out my flashlight, even though it is doubtful the noms carry one. I am marking myself a trespasser from a higher floor, even from a distance. Not wise. Then I notice something. My feet hurt less down here. When I bend over and slide my hand over the ground, I know why. Dirt. Hard-packed dirt. I crouch to examine it, press my palm against it. Cold and unyielding. I breathe deeply, and it smells of must. A smell that I instantly like. I may never know what the top of the earth feels like. But at least now, I know what part of it feels like. After a while, I continue walking, senselessly stumbling on, always remembering my way back. I may be foolhardy and reckless, but I am not careless. Around me, the corridors are empty, silent, the noms seemingly elsewhere. Perhaps it is getting close to their feeding, and I wonder who will be feeding them today. Certainly not my mother. Eventually, though, I decide to change tactics. I turn my flashlight off and take a steadying breath. It isn't completely black. In every corner, there is a lone bulb encased in wire. But still, it takes a few moments before I can see my way. I begin knocking on doors, trying to find someone who can point me in the right direction. When finally someone answers, I blurt out, I need a guard. Because a door out of this compound and to another is an important one. One so important it must be guarded. The woman stares at me coldly. She can probably tell him from upstairs. Then points along the corridor. Two sharp rights, she mutters, before she disappears. Two turns later, I am still. In front of me stands a guard, his back against the wall, his gloved hands crossed over his chest. I can see a gun in his holster. He looks bored, but then he notices me standing there and straightens. He isn't a guard I recognize, and that is a good thing, considering my history. This one is tall and lanky, not young. He isn't as malicious looking as most of the other guards, and that is maybe a blessing, maybe a shame, because I may need to force my way by this man, and that would mean violence. It is the only currency I know. For now, though, for now, I just need to discover if the locked door next to him is the one I am after. His eyes narrow as we stare at each other. Something you want? He finally asks. Is this your usual post? I am feeling bold. He leans against the wall again and swings one boot over another. It's my usual post. Who's asking? I've heard it's quite a hike to the other compounds, I say, as I nod at the door. Then I hold my breath. He hesitates, but barely. Doesn't mean it's not doable. Something moves through my veins. Maybe it is relief or excitement. Maybe even it is dread. Whatever it is, this is the spot. This is the door that links to a new life. I'm curious, do 10 and 12 both run from here? Just 10. I nod. You trying to keep our compound in or 10 out? Both? I didn't catch your name. His cheeks are gaunt, hollow like the noms. Though, of course, noms don't become guards. Jobs aren't available to them at all. I lift my chin. Eve. You don't look like you belong down here. I'm from a floor up. I hold out my hands as proof. 
And why are you so interested in this, Eve? I shrug. I'm supposed to pick a job soon. And you're interested in becoming a guard? I shrug again. Not so much, I admit. He wouldn't think I could get such a job anyhow. The tunnels interest me, though. The tunnels. He stares at me, waiting. Maintenance, construction, that sort of thing, I add. My eyes linger on the door, on the keypad. I miss the job tour. Any chance you could open it up for me? Just so I could have a look? He smirks. Afraid not. Where does the tunnel to 12 run? Not from down here. So where? You ask a lot of questions. Fifth floor? I think you should go now. But I said, he interrupts, I think you should go now. He leans his weight forward, so he is standing upright. Automatically, I am wary. I am ready to run. My boots shuffle backward. Denominators will be done feeding soon, he continues, and these halls will choke up. You should go before they do. For a moment, I just stare at him. I can't tell if he is being kind. Kindness is a foreign concept here in Compound 11, and so recognizing it is difficult. Recognizing it from a guard even more so. After another moment's hesitation, I nod briefly, then walk away, back in the direction from which I came. If I want to, I could get by him, that guard. I could guess the passcode. I could go through the tunnel, see what Compound 10 has in store. That was my plan initially, to try another compound. The only difference between now and then is that I have seen above ground and know that another compound isn't the answer. No, that isn't quite true. There is another difference, too. Ren. He shouldn't change anything, but he does. He changes everything. Then the toe of my boot stubs on the compact dirt underfoot, and I fall to my knees. Grit wedges into the lines of my palms, and I swear into silence. Slowly, I stand and give myself a shake. Things with Ren have no future. Not here. Illegitimate Long is one of a million examples. Ren is a preem, and I am a lower mean, and we don't belong together. It's that simple. If he changes things, it is only because I am forgetting that one simple fact. Chapter 32 Later, I opened my cell door to a well-dressed, yet somber-looking Maggie. It's time, she says flatly. She wears a thin black headband and a short green dress with tights. A bag is slung over her shoulder. Time, I repeat. Her fist opens to reveal a tube of mascara, and I roll my eyes. She laughs as she pushes her way past me, Emerald is close behind, but her face is stern. I don't think I have seen her look any other way since Bruno's passing. She wears a blue sweater, dressy by her standards, and slacks. Hunter's going to meet us there, Maggie says, as she places the bag on my desk. Why? We always go together. He's meeting up with some of the kitchen crew. They're like his new best friends, she sighs. Just another reminder of how I'm supposed to make this huge, life-altering decision soon. In case you're wondering, I still have no clue what to do, even though everyone else seems to have made up their mind. Everyone, says Emerald. She kicks off her shoes and sits heavily on my bed. I haven't. I have no clue what to do. I clear my throat. Making huge, life-altering decisions is the last thing I want to talk about right now. Is Kyle still staying away? I ask Maggie instead. So far, so good, she replies. But she looks suddenly glum, and I regret bringing it up. It's hard, though. 
Every day is hard, kind of. What do you mean? Her lime green eyes sweep to the side. Breakups suck, right? Even if he is scum. And things ended so quickly, it almost feels like... I don't know. Like... Like it didn't really happen. Maybe I just want closure or something. Is that wrong? Is it wrong? I force myself to grin. Well, it definitely sounds wrong. Speaking of breakups, says Emerald, is anything new going on with Hunter and Anita? That ship has sailed. She has a new boyfriend and everything. He's totally over it, though. I have a feeling he was never that invested anyways. She pulls a full bottle of liquor out of her bag and screws off the lid. Bottoms up, ladies. Dad hasn't been using his allotment lately, so drinks are on me. She winks, takes a gulp, then looks me up and down. You're not ready, I see. I look in the mirror and see a tired face, hair drawn into a low ponytail. I shrug. It's just a party. Eve, she crosses her arms. Your shirt has a hole in it. After a quick inspection, I see that she is right. I see, too, that the hem is beginning to fray. And you haven't brushed your hair today. That's what it looked like last night. I finger it silently. Emerald stares at me. Are you sure everything's okay? I don't want to lie, but of course I do. Everything's fine. I'll change, I promise. And want to know something seriously wild? I'll even brush my hair. Her brow relaxes and she laughs. One leg crosses over the other as she leans against the wall. That's my girl. So are Ren and Connor meeting us there? As far as I know. Then I fix Maggie with a stare of my own. It has been a long day and all of a sudden I feel like having some fun. Connor's cute, don't you think? Ren's cute too, she says quickly. She presses the bottle into my hand and I have a sip. It burns my throat, but I don't mind. Yeah, I know he is. He's my boyfriend. I push her. She looks at Emerald, and Emerald looks at her. And then I understand. Oh, right. Ren and I are together. Both of you know, you just don't know each other knows. How does she know? shouts Maggie. And how could you not tell me that you know? She adds to Emerald, swatting her arm. Because I didn't think you knew, obviously. A small smile plays on Emerald's lips, finally. I pieced it together when I caught her going out one night with blush smudged all over her face. Maggie turns to me with her mouth hanging open. I try to push her again, but she jumps on the bed. God, I wish I could have seen that. I pieced it together after Ren kicked Landry's ass in the cafeteria. Damn, I knew way before that, girl. Maggie shakes her head, mouth open, and Emerald laughs. I raise my hands. Okay, you guys, very funny. Listen, Hunter doesn't know, so whatever you do, don't mention it in front of him. Probably a good idea, mumbles Maggie. Beside her, Emerald's smile has disappeared. She runs her hands over her face and groans. I pause. I had been about to ask Maggie what she meant, but now I turn to Emerald. What's up? Nothing. Everything. It's just that every time I start to have fun or think of anything else... Bam. There it is. His face. She shakes her head and frowns. Maggie and I exchange a look. Suddenly I have a thought. Emerald, you and Bruno weren't... Were you? She stares at me. Oh, God, she says. No, no, definitely, definitely not. Her eyes slide sideways, and it strikes me that I am not the only one with secrets. I lower my voice. It's just that, I mean, I've been struggling too, obviously, but he's not the first friend we've lost. I know that, okay? It isn't that. I mean, part of it is. And the rest? I love fighting, Eve. 
I know you like it well enough and everything, but it's my life. It's everything. And now I don't want to step in that ring again. I just don't. I sit on my heels in front of her. I get it. So it's a bigger loss than even Bruno. I know I'm being a big downer and everything, but... You are not here. I pass her the bottle. Have some. We don't even have to go to the party if you don't want. But you can't keep dwelling on what happened or you'll never get past it. After doing nothing today but dwelling on my own problems, I am not qualified to give such advice. But Maggie nods encouragingly at my words, and so my gaze is steady. What do you think I should do about Blue Circuit? Emerald whispers. Her large brown eyes look torn in half. Keep fighting, I say without hesitation. I wasn't kidding when I said it was just as dangerous out there. You love fighting, so that's what you're going to do, whether as a hobby or professionally. Just give it a bit of time, and stop putting so much pressure on yourself right now to make a job decision. We still have two weeks. She laughs, and I stare at her dimples. I wish I could be as laid back about choosing a job as you. Yeah, says Maggie. Me too. What's your secret? I take another drink from the bottle. A long one. Enough to push the onslaught of guilt from my mind. Let's just try to focus on thoughtless fun stuff tonight, okay? Nothing heavy. Nothing job-related. Nothing sad. Deal? Emerald sits a little straighter. Thoughtless stuff only. I think I can do that. Maggie kneels next to me. Hold still. Mascara's going on. Is this really necessary? Oh, trust me, Eve. When I'm finished with you, Ren won't know what hit him. You are going to drive him mad tonight. Suddenly, I am laughing, and so is she. So is Emerald. Something resembling contentedness fills my chest, and the thought of Compound Ten recedes backward, just a touch in my mind. When we arrive at the Upper Mean Playground, it's already thick with bodies. Most people stand between the equipment, with bottles in hand, but some actually use it. The teeter-totters are full, and there is a rowdy-looking lineup behind the slide. Shouts of laughter rise from all corners of the room. Music, too. Lanterns provide the only light, soft and yielding. I spot Ren quickly, because he is dressed in all black, and because he is the first thing my eyes tend to notice. Maybe it is his shape. Tall and lean, yet thick with muscle. Broad shoulders, rounded forearms. Maybe it is his kind mouth, the one that turns up slightly at the corners, or his wide-set, flashing eyes. Whatever it is, he notices me staring, and his gaze tightens. Yes, he changes things for me. Definitely. I push my way through the crowd in his direction, and in this moment, I don't care that he is a preem or that I am a lower mean. After the day I've had, it is all I can do not to wrap my arms around him, to lean on him, to kiss him. Instead, I string my hands together behind my back and nudge him. My gaze lingers on his t-shirt, which carves gently over muscle. I am a little tipsy and hope he won't notice. You look different, he says bluntly. His eyes drift over my face, one augmented by Maggie's mascara and lip gloss, and my hair, loose except for a braided headband crafted by Emerald. On Maggie's insistence, I wear a tight pair of jeans. On my own insistence, I wear a plain white top. Who? Oh, me? That's weird. He presses a hand into my back and his mouth to my ear. You look killer, Eve. My heart beats quicker. We look at each other, and for a moment I forget the music in my ears, the people surrounding us and pressing into my sides. I forget screaming at my father and my discovery of Compound Ten's tunnel and my inability to kill Daniel. I forget all of it, 
because there is something about Ren's eyes that make me feel a paradox I can't explain or even begin to understand. I feel cocooned, safe, but also as though I have all the latitude in the world. Killer? <laughs> I laugh. I think you've had too much to drink. He squints and tilts his head. Nope, he says finally. That's not it. Still, his hand rests on my back, and I don't want him to move it, even though others are sure to see. What's she doing here? I ask, as I catch sight of long red hair. He looks over his shoulder. Let's see. Maggie told Connor, Connor told Long, Long told everybody. That's pretty much how it goes. Did I hear my name? A hand clamps down on my shoulder, and on Ren's too. How are my two favorite lovebirds this fine evening? I glance at Ren, who looks at me and shrugs. He knows, in case you couldn't tell. Connor too. About your forbidden romance? Long winks. Yeah, I know. I try not to smile, but I fail. I know it makes no sense, but I like that Ren told his friends about us. It feels more official somehow. Any of your friends know? Ren asks as Long sips from a bottle. Laughter swells from the other side of the room. As a matter of fact, they do. Emerald and Maggie. What about Hunter? I make a face. He just needs a chance to get to know you better. Ah, and then he will give me his seal of approval. Exactly, I say, as I tug at the bottom of his t-shirt. We stare at each other, and I think he wants to kiss me right now as much as I want to kiss him. Ugh, you two are disgusting. Long disappears into the crowd, and I laugh. Around us are mostly faces I recognize, Mean faces from floors two, three, and four. But there are preems here, too. Long, evidently the reason. They pay the mean crowd around them little attention, and the mean crowd does the same. Animosity runs deep, and it runs in both directions. But still, they are here. Still, we share the same space. A few months ago, before I met Ren, the preems were foreign, evil, now, the younger ones, the ones who dared to descend to the fourth floor tonight, the ones without a track record of iron-fisted, ruthless leadership, seem like more of the same. Now, the compound feels smaller. I really should report this event to Father's office, you know, comes a voice that I'd rather not hear. He wouldn't approve of such a security breach. Addison stands so close to Wren that her arm brushes against his. It's just a party, Wren says. Just a party, she repeats. Is that what your mother would say? What my mother has to say is the least of my concerns. Wren, you're much too hard on her. She pauses as a floor three mean brushes against her. I can see in her expression that she is put out, but to her credit, she says nothing about it. That darling mother of yours, she continues, always went out of her way to make me feel special during our courtship. That kindness can't be overstated. The two of you had more in common than you and I ever did. Yes, ambition. A quality you used to prize in me, I might add. Before I saw it for what it truly was, perhaps. His voice is calm and indifferent. Being... He shrugs. Greed. <laughs> Admit it, Ren, she laughs. All this mean nonsense, it's just a way to attack her. At first, I thought I was the target, but then I came to my senses. I know you would never hurt me intentionally. Not after what we had. But your mother? You've hated her since the day your father died, placing all your bad luck on her shoulders. And now you've found a way to ridicule her in the most public of ways. She wiggles her eyebrows. Don't forget I know you better than you know yourself. Ren looks far from amused by the accusation. In fact, he scowls. The more we speak, Addison, 
the more I think you've never really known me at all. I know you plenty well, she replies with confidence, completely indifferent to his demeanor. I know you like spicy food and bland food, but nothing in between. I know you don't enjoy playing pool, because you are fiercely competitive and hate to lose. I know you have a soft spot for knee-high black leather boots. That's enough, Addison, Wren snaps. Maybe he is worried about how I will react. Maybe he thinks I will punch her. It is a wonder that I don't, for that list was intended for my ears. Spicy food, playing pool, knee-high boots, all frivolities unknown to lower means like me. These are details I cannot know about Ren. These are details that she can throw in my face. Fine, she says. But let me say this. You aren't realizing the toll all this is taking. You also aren't realizing that your rebellion could have lasting repercussions. Serious ones. Look at this room. Preems and means socializing. Think of future generations, Ren. And as for me, I won't wait around forever. I'm not asking you to, he reminds her. And if you want to report the party, be my guest. In the meantime, enjoy your evening. Then his hand wraps around my elbow, and he is pushing me through the crowd in the direction of the swing set. Briefly, I wonder, though, if she is right. If I am nothing more to him than a tool for revenge a way to strike back at his mother. Addison can't be trusted, I know that. But she has known Wren for much longer than I have, and in ways that I can't, in ways that I don't, intimate ways, knee-high black leather boot ways. The thought makes my lips pucker with dissatisfaction. Maggie and Connor sit side by side on the swings, and behind them, Emerald talks with Eric. She is laughing at something he says, and she looks lighter than she did earlier. A bottle is wedged into my hand, and the glass feels cold against my skin. Drink up, instructs Maggie, before Connor here drinks all of it. She nudges him in the arm, and they grin. I have a sip, and notice as I do that Ren's eyes slowly sweep the room. I elbow him. Looking for someone? Just wondering if your good friend Daniel decided to show, he says, his voice vaguely threatening. Before I can respond, Maggie's head snaps in our direction. He's not here, but that's only because Eve did something to him yesterday, and now she's being super cagey about it. Thanks, Maggie, I say with a grimace. Thanks for sharing. No problem. She winks, then turns back to Connor. I watch as she grabs his swing and pulls it so they bump into each other. Ren, meanwhile, is watching me. What did you do? He says evenly. Nothing. Come on, Eve. I roughed him up a bit, okay? He squints as he eyes me. No, I don't think that's all you did. Because fighting is a way of life for you down here, remember? You wouldn't be cagey about something like that. What really happened? I hesitate, but not for long. There's no sense in hiding it from Ren. Not when I have shared so much with him already. I lower my voice so the others can't hear. He got in my face in the cafeteria. Told me he was coming for me. So I followed him. I waited until he was alone. Yeah? I shrug. I attacked him. My gaze casts down. With my knife. He leans forward. His eyes are deadly serious. Did you? I shake my head. I slashed him. His face. I didn't kill him. I think Ren is going to ask why I didn't. But instead he straightens his back and wraps his hands around my head. Pulls me to his chest. He already knows why. His lips brush against my forehead, and we are still. Think he'll leave you alone? Now that he knows I carry a knife? Yeah, I'd say so. 
for now at least. I close my eyes and see the blade slice apart his skin. I see red, and part of me winces. The rest of me cringes at my weakness, at my inability to kill him. Can we talk about something else, please? This reminds me of when you were hiding from that guard, he murmurs eventually. Yeah, before we fed the noms. Back when you were still resisting my charms. Hmm, is that what you call it? Could have fooled me. He smiles. In my defense, you weren't all that pleasant yourself. And you did give me some killer bruises, I might add. So then why were you trying to charm me? His face is suddenly serious, and I feel his ribcage expand and contract under my grasp. When I saw you upstairs, after you broke into the oracle, your eyes were so... alive. They were like nothing I'd ever seen before. He pauses, and his gaze finds mine. Besides, it's kind of hard to get a girl out of your head once she sucker punches you in the face. Never a dull moment with you, Eve. He kisses my forehead, and I lift my lips to his, and he kisses me there instead. My eyes pop open once I remember where we are, surrounded by people. He laughs softly. Relax, Eve. I don't think you're in any danger with this crowd. Besides, everyone's too drunk to notice. And if I'm wrong, who cares? But even as he speaks the words, I feel someone staring at me. Hunter. It makes my stomach squeeze painfully into itself. When I glance at him, he turns at once back to his kitchen friends. Looks like everyone's up to speed, says Ren quietly. I swallow. Looks that way. Before I can digest the look on Hunter's face, or the feeling in the pit of my stomach, a bright voice shouts over my shoulder. I knew it! I grin at the sound of Jules's voice. You did not. I pull away from Ren and shove her. I totally called it as soon as I saw you guys, didn't I? You remember, right, hottie? By the way, Eve, this, she points her finger at my face, is totally doing it for me. You look like a sexed-up warrior princess or something. Told you, Eve, Maggie shouts from the swing. You need to trust me with this makeover business, okay? Very funny. It's no joke, she insists, though she is smiling. What do you think, Ren? Can you even contain yourself? Hmm, I have notoriously found it difficult to do that around Eve, he says as he pretends to examine me. Tonight is no exception. What about when you beat the shit out of her? I turn quickly and see that Hunter stands there, arms folded. He is staring at Ren with a menacing look on his face. Could you contain yourself then? He continues. Hunter, I begin, but Ren lifts a hand. Let him finish. What? You're telling her what to do now? Because you wouldn't be the first upper floor asshole with control issues sniffing around my friends. Hunter, I say. Ren, meanwhile, smiles. It doesn't reach his eyes. An asshole with control issues. Is that what you just called me? He takes a step closer. Hunter is tall and no weakling, but still their difference in strength is devastating. And I remember Wren's vengeful words. I could kill Hunter with my eyes closed. Wren isn't cruel, but I know he could kill a person. And I know he doesn't like my friend any more than my friend likes him. Not just a controlling one, Hunter replies levelly. An abusive one. One who likes to slap girls around. One who enjoys it. Ren's body is still. Too still. But then he laughs. You think I'm like that? Tell me how I'm wrong. I'd sooner die than lay a finger on Eve outside the bowl. That's how. 
And if you want to think I'm an asshole, fine. Go ahead. Better that than a manipulative coward like yourself. Hunter shakes his head. She might trust you, he spits. But I don't. Ren takes another step closer and dips his head. That's funny, because I was about to say the same thing to you. Hunter's face flushes with anger. And then he grabs Ren around the collar. I'm between them in a heartbeat, even before Ren can react. Cut it out, I yell as I pull at Hunter's hand. Both of you, cut it out. Hunter stares at me. And all at once, the anger in his eyes dies. Something new shoots through them. Something bare and unprotected. Something that makes me feel bare and unprotected, too. Then he shoves off through the crowd. Ren touches my arm, but I shake my head. And that is when I notice someone I don't want to see. Kyle. I spot him before Maggie does. She is distracted, deep in conversation with Connor. The two of them sit so close that their knees touch. And I don't want Kyle to ruin the moment for her. I don't want her to have to think about him ever again. I start forward through the crowd to head him off, but it's too late. Already he moves quickly in her direction. I manage to get myself in front of him before he can reach her. Get out of here, I say loudly in his ear. You guys are over. She doesn't want anything to do with you. Kyle's eyes, usually so smug, are filled with heat. He glares at me. Let's hear it from her own mouth. I am about to refuse. I made her a promise, after all. But then I hear her voice from over my shoulder. And even through an abundance of alcohol, it is perfectly clear. She's right, Kyle. I told you we were through. I told you to leave me alone. Come on, Maggie, it was just a fight. And don't think an upper mean's going to get down on their knees and grovel. I've given you some space. Now it's time to move on. I have moved on. Her voice is calm. Just not with you. Kyle's eyes dart around her and land on Connor. They shine with anger. Maggie shakes her head. Not with him, either. Not with anyone. I've moved on by myself for myself. You and I are through. Don't do this to me, Maggie. She inhales at his words, and her voice shakes. You crossed a line many, many months ago. Maybe it was my fault for staying, but I don't think so. All I know is that I am not doing anything to you. He starts toward her, but I place a hand on his chest. Don't even think about it, I say. She made herself perfectly clear. Get your disgusting, lower mean hand. I punch him in the mouth. A single shot, one that draws blood from a slit in his lip. It isn't quite the ass-kicking that Bruno had hoped for, but still it is enough to distract him from Maggie. He dabs at the blood, and then his eyes harden into beads. He readies himself to punch me back, but his gaze lands on something over my shoulder, and he goes still. I dare you. Wren quietly taunts from behind me. Kyle looks one last time at Maggie, then turns, his shoulders squared against the crowd that he pushes through. When he's gone, I grab Maggie by the hand. Are you okay? Me? She laughs. You've got a mean right hook, you know that? Maybe you could teach me a thing or two. Next time we're at the bowl, I agree. But a knot forms in my stomach. If I go, I can't do that. If I go, I can't do a lot of things. I feel Ren, still close, and push my fingers through his. I turn, pull him tight to my body. Thanks for having my back, I whisper. Mm. Like I said, never a dull moment with you, Eve.
Chapter 33 I butter my piece of toast and spread jam on top of that, the way my mother used to prepare it for me when I was young. Across the table, Maggie chats loudly with the others. She has been chipper since the party, much like her old self. Maybe it was standing up to Kyle, maybe it was spending time with Connor, maybe it was both. I have been in a good mood too. I shouldn't be. There are now less than two weeks until I am expected to pick a job, to leap into adulthood while trapped in Eleven, to dedicate my life to serving the compound and its commander. And with every strike of the clock, it becomes less and less likely that I will taste true freedom, that I will reach that famed oasis. Or Jack. That leaves the tunnels, the ones to other compounds, a dangerous journey, and one with a question mark waiting at its end. So I'm not sure why I'm in such a good mood, frankly. Maybe it's the fact that my friends know about Wren, even Hunter, which means one less secret standing between us. Or maybe it's that Addison also happened to spot Wren and me holding hands at the end of the party. I smile over my toast as I think about it. Let's go to the bowl, I say suddenly. I push the rest of the toast into my mouth and look at them. It'll be fun. I can show you how to throw a punch, I add to Maggie. Right now, I just woke up. So? We're finished eating. And besides, we've got nothing else going on this morning. There are no job tours today, right? Maggie shrugs. I guess we could. It'll be fun, I say again. Emerald clears her throat. I've been kind of avoiding that place since, you know, all the more reason we should go. Come on, we never do anything besides sit around here and mope about stuff. They stare at me. Okay, that's not all we do, but seriously, it'll be fun. Now, how many times are you going to make me say that? I stand, and slowly, reluctantly, they stand too. I lead them out of the cafeteria, excited about the prospect of spending the morning with my friends like old times, teaching Maggie how to fight. The thick, mean crowds that clot the hallway can't even dampen my spirits. Then I hear my name shouted from over my shoulder, or at least I think it's mine. The noise of the people swallows it immediately up. So after a cursory glance around, I walk on. But my arm is grabbed and my right fist clenches just as it always does when I am surprised, just as it should in Compound Eleven. Ren, and my hand relaxes, except that I know immediately something is wrong. His eyes are harder than usual, and there is a crease between his eyebrows. His jaw is clenched. What? I ask and take a step closer. Bodies push around us. What is it? He stares at me for a second, like he's lost in thought, then shakes his head. His gaze drops to my collarbone. It's nothing. Just, listen, this is going to sound weird, and I don't have time to explain, but... He leans his head down to my ear and lowers his voice so nobody else can hear. You should invite Jules up, and that other friend of yours, Monica, her kid too. I pull back and stare at him. I should what? But already he is drawing away. I'm late, Eve. Connor's waiting. Just trust me, okay? Have them up, now. Right now? Now. And then he disappears through the bodies, and I am standing there, staring at the empty space he left. The others crowd around me. What was that all about? I shake my head. I'm honestly not sure. I thought he was supposed to be with Connor this morning. I turn to Maggie and wait for her to catch her balance after being sideswiped by an upper mean. How do you know that? She shrugs. Connor told me. The preem jobs work a bit differently. You have to pass certain tests before you can even apply to some positions. Today is one of the main tests for the computer jobs. Didn't Ren tell you? Hunter and Emerald are staring at me, and I feel almost foolish shaking my head. No, he didn't tell me. 
I shift my weight from foot to foot and try to ignore the sound of a child wailing a few steps away. Listen, I say slowly. I think we have to take a detour on the way to the bowl. Where are we going? To the feeding dock. Care to elaborate, Eve? Not really. Then I lead them silently down the stairs and push through the dimly lit lower mean corridors until the crowds thin and we are close. Broken glass underfoot crunches loudly with every step and wedges into the sole of my boot. I barely notice. When I pass over the place where Ren hid me from the guard, my stomach clenches uncomfortably. You guys wait here, I mumble over my shoulder. I shouldn't be long. The door is open and the lights are on. At the bottom of the stairs, a short man with thick-rimmed glasses and black tattoo sleeves passes out portions of bread through the partition. His eyes narrow when they see me. I'm looking for someone, I say. My voice is even. Do you know the denominators well? Visitors aren't authorized, he says instead. Get out or I'll find a guard. Look, I do this gig too. Lunches. I'm looking for a girl named Jules and a woman named Monica. Do you know them? He gives me a cold look. I don't do names. One's my age. Bleach blonde hair, spunky. The other's a bit older with a young boy glued to her side. He shrugs. Mind if I... I gesture to his spot, directly in front of the open partition. I'll pass out the food. He stares at me for several seconds, then shakes his head. You think I'd do this out of the goodness of my heart? I don't. Consider it my sentence for a meaningless crime. If I let you barge in and stop me from doing it, who's to say they don't make me do dinner duty, too? Sorry, can't risk it. He shoves bread to several faces that come and go, none of them my friends. My fingers, meanwhile, ball into fists. I don't have time for this and I don't like to be told no. But my options are limited. He looks vaguely dangerous, for starters. And I have been working toward less violence in my life, not more. Fine, I sniff. I won't interfere with you doing your job. Happy? You're going to stand over my shoulder the whole time instead? What's the difference? I snap. He turns and looks at me, and I raise my hands. Keep calm, Eve. I force my voice to relax. You won't even know I'm here. He passes more bread through the partition, and my eyes scan the dark room for signs of blonde hair and eyes that shine with laughter, a mother and a son hand in hand. Why did Ren say to have them upstairs? Why now? Why was it so important he risked missing a test that could determine his entire future, I try to ignore the question of why he didn't tell me about the test in the first place. I stand there for several minutes before I finally see one of them, Jules, and she looks confused as she approaches the partition. What are you doing here? You never do breakfast duty. Um, I begin. Too many secrets, too many lies. I just eliminated a major one that was standing between me and my friends. Do I really want to start another? Maybe the whole thing is ridiculous. Maybe Ren wasn't being literal. Or he was messing around, or he was mistaken. I stare at her and frown. Grab your breakfast and meet me at the closest stairwell. We're headed to the bowl and you're coming too. Even though he is a preem, even though his own mother is one of the compound leaders... I trust Ren. That is one thing I am suddenly certain of. Her eyebrows draw together. Right now? I nod. It seems a little early. She looks unsure, and so I step in front of the heavily tattooed man. It'll be fun, I promise, I begin. But I'm distracted by a slight figure with a child positioned on her hip. Hi, Eve, Monica says, smiling. Did they change your shift around? No, I thought I'd pop by to invite you guys upstairs for a bit. 
Me and some friends are headed to the bowl, and Avery might have fun playing with the equipment. Silently, she collects her breakfast items and passes half to her beaming boy. Can we go, Mama? He asks. She shakes her head. I'm sorry, sweetie. And I'm sorry to you, too, Eve, but we can't go. But it's against compound rules. Denominators aren't allowed on the mean floors, you know that. What would happen if we were caught? She asks quietly, nodding in Avery's direction. I say nothing. Because of course it's risky sneaking around an eleven. And nobody is treated more harshly for breaking the rules than noms. With a child, there's just too much on the line. Thank you for the invite, she adds. To think an upper floor might be thinking of us. Well, it means a lot. I'll see you later, at lunch duty, yes? Looking forward to it, I confirm. I wink at Avery and then wave goodbye, feeling uneasy. Will you come up at least? I ask Jules. Okay, she says, after she's taken a bite of the bread I hand her. I'll see you in a sec. Thought you were just going to stand there, says the man behind me. He crosses his arms. So sorry about that, I say in a rush of sarcasm. And thanks so much for all your help. Then I am gone, up the stairs and back to my friends, none of whom look terribly happy about our unexplained detour. We need to go meet Jules, I explained to them. What's going on, Eve? asks Hunter. I don't slow down, but I look over my shoulder and sigh. All I know is that Ren told me to invite her upstairs, and that's what I did. Trust me, I'm as confused as you are. That's weird, Maggie says slowly as I head for the stairwell. It's not like him to dictate your social life, is it? Or do you think something else is going on? I shrug. A few minutes later, Jules walks up the stairs toward me. Can't a girl enjoy her breakfast in peace anymore? I force myself to laugh. Don't give me that. I know how much you like punching things. Could I really leave you out? Of course not. She nudges Hunter and nods at Emerald and Maggie. You guys enjoy the party? A lot more than the next morning, Maggie replies. You're telling me. The four of them laugh. When we reach the bowl, I feel Emerald tense up beside me, so I knock her on the arm. You doing okay? She tries to smile, but it looks more like a grimace. Dandy, thanks. Bruno loved this place. He wouldn't want it to be poisoned for you. Then I grab her hand and pull her through the door into the cylindrical tunnel that leads to the bowl. Come on. Remember all the times you warmed up here before a big fight? Remember the sound of the crowd? I smack the punching bag closest to us with my fist. Remember that sound? It's a beautiful sound, she agrees, and half her mouth twists upward. I stand aside, and she punches it once, twice. Hunter turns to the bowl. I suppose there aren't any fights scheduled for today, given how empty it is right now. Behind us, Maggie and Jules try on gloves laughing intermittently. Nope. Let's head to the ring, then. If you're gonna make us fight, it may as well be somewhere good. I look at Emerald and see beads of sweat shining on her forehead. She looks focused, peaceful. You wanna take center stage, Hunter? I smile. It's probably not allowed, but... Yeah, okay. I'm game. I grab a handful of punch pads and tape, then lead them through the end of the tunnel and into the bowl itself. My gaze casts upward and around. It is eerie, being here when the stands are dead empty, when the only sound is our boots underfoot. This is actually pretty neat, Hunter comments. He twists around as his gaze combs thousands of empty seats. Yeah, says Jules. This is badass. 
I don't know how you do it with a kajillion people in the stands. You don't even notice them, says Emerald quickly. And when I look at her, I see her brown skin is flushed pink. Her eyes are alive. I mean, you do and you don't. It's just such a rush, you know? We climb into the ring in the center of the bowl, and inwardly I am smiling. So far, aside from Monica and Avery, my plan has worked quite well. Emerald is falling in love with fighting again. Jules is upstairs, as Ren recommended. And Maggie is about to learn how to defend herself. Things could definitely be worse. That's when I hear the first round of gunshots go off. Chapter 34 the bowl whirls around me, and the countless rows of seats that ascend to the top of the mean floor blur into streaks. But it isn't the room itself that moves me. It is me. Bang, 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 bang. I forget to blink as I search for the source, eyeballs burning. It sounds close. It sounds far. Rapid fire. A short break. Another round. Repeat. All of it with a backdrop of screams. Around and around I go. Finally the gunshots cease, and the silence they leave in their wake is heavy against my ears. The bowl stops whirling, and I glance at the others. All of us are stationary, mouths open. Slowly our senses come back to us. We blink and swallow, lick our lips. Without speaking, we climb out of the ring and our steps are deliberate and tentative, as if we are learning to walk for the very first time. Every nerve in my body prickles, and sweat pools along the crease where my palm meets my fingers. As we walk through the cylindrical tunnel, I can hear them. I can hear their voices mashed into one, can feel their energy from here. When we open the door and join the throngs outside, it is chaos, Complete chaos. Some scream in fear. Others yell with anger. Everywhere people push. I don't know where they are going and they don't seem to either. A memory of being in the shooting range with Ren flashes in front of me. And I can feel cool metal in my hand. Heavy and unyielding. I feel the bullet shock the gun as it speeds from the chamber. I smell the smoke that drifts backward. Deadly and destructive and terrible. I push and am pushed, and then through the crowd I spot the first of them. One leads to several to many, all with eyes glassy and round. Denominators. The one near the front clutches at her side, and I see a purple stain on her shirt. Adrenaline must drive her, but not for long. The stain swells as I watch. My eyes slowly scan over the rest of them. Two rows back, a man's dense beard is covered in pearls of red, and the palm of the man next in line looks like it has been dipped in paint. So the gunfire came from below. Jules bursts past me in their direction, and before I can follow, a hand pushes at my back, too strong for me to resist. We need to go now, Emerald shouts in my ear. But, but Jules... She needs to find her family. And we need to help her. Are you familiar with the first floor, Eve? Didn't think so. Come on, hurry up. And then a terrible thought occurs to me. Monica and Avery. I can't stay. I need to make sure. No, no, keep walking. Her hand presses harder against my back, shoving me through the crowd. How do you know, Eve, that the danger is over? For all we know, there's a madman walking around the place, shooting everyone up. So keep walking. I shake my head and mutter. It's over, Emerald, you know it is. Maybe from the madman, but you know how quickly a crowd can go sideways down here. We don't need to get caught up in a riot, thanks. I look over my shoulder and see that Maggie is pale-faced. Her nose is bleeding probably from an elbow thrown inadvertently in her direction. 
She looks so terrified that I have no choice but to turn away from the madness. Once we're far enough, Emerald comes to a stop and wipes sweat from her face. Her knuckles are still pink from the bowl. What the hell just happened? Don't know, I mutter. The only thing I do know is that I need to speak with Ren. Unease claws the lining of my stomach and makes me nauseous. It is too unlikely that he would tell me to invite Jules and Monica up right before gunfire broke out on the first floor. It can't be a coincidence. I know that. But how could he have known? Probably he isn't finished with the test yet. But I can't stand to be here for another second, images of the wounded denominators flashing through my brain. Go lock yourselves in your cells, I instruct, and wait for everything to settle down. It'll be safer there than out here. And what are you going to do? I'll be back later, I yell over my shoulder, before they can stop me. I dart toward the main corridor. My feet move quickly. I am pent up with energy, but the main corridor is thick with bodies and I am forced to slow. The ceiling overhead seems to linger just a smidgen lower than usual, and between it and the elbows pressing around me, it is difficult to force a full breath into my lungs. And then I am shoved hard to the side. I see why a moment later. Down the middle of the hall walks guards, shoulder to shoulder. Each one is masked, and each one carries a tall stack of folded gray plastic with compound 11 stamped in white. It makes a stone fall in my stomach body bags. Hundreds of them. Something bad happened downstairs. Something very bad. I think of Monica and Avery and try not to be sick. All around me, people shout, ask what is going on, demand an explanation. I wait for an answer, but of course there is none. The guards walk on as if they don't hear us, as if they don't notice our existence at all. People mutter and swear and wring their hands with frustration. But that is the extent of their feelings. Rage will come. Whatever happened downstairs, rage will come. People are always mad in Compound 11. When I get to the elevator bank, I turn to the main stairwell, just as I often do. Less crowded, no line. But I pause. I turn back to the elevators. I wait for a spot. I feel weak right now, and I don't want to be in the stairwell ever again when I feel weak. And these are dangerous times right now. I can taste it. My thumb punches the button for the fifth floor. My brain echoes with the sound of gunshots. Deep breath in. Deep breath out. Others empty out of the elevator at the third floor, at the fourth. I am the only one going to the top. When I step onto the fifth floor, it is into a different world. Not just because the lights shine brightly overhead, they always do. I am used to it by now. It is that the white, pristine hallways are silent, empty, calm. Not at all like the chaos unfurling down below. Since I have no idea where the test rooms are, I decide to wait for Ren here in the atrium. The glass front of the library lines the far side, but I don't go there now. Instead, I walk to the large bronze globe that sits in the middle of the space. Four weeks ago, I stood right here. I studied this very sculpture. And I realized that the world is a large place. That Compound 11 occupies a very tiny sliver. I realized that the number of other compounds out there must be staggering that I can keep searching and searching on and on for my rightful home. Or can I? What if I wake up one day and find that I spent my whole life searching for something that doesn't even exist? What if all life is, is this? Ups and downs, highs and lows, unspeakable cruelty, sharing laughs with friends, unwanted violence, kisses with boys, loving, working, 
killing time, growing, changing, discovering. I can have those things here. Is there more to life, or is that it? I don't know how long I stand here thinking about it, but slowly I realize that people pass by, that the air is alive with movement. I look up, and my eyes find his. For a second, I can't remember why I am here. But then it all comes crashing back, and I push my way to him, gunshots once again ringing in my head. He is still, and his jaw is set, his eyes unreachable. What the hell happened on the ground floor? I hiss at him. And don't you dare say you don't know, because why else would you tell me to have Jules and Monica up right before it happened? He grabs my elbow and leads me to the quietest corner of the atrium, where a little girl dressed in yellow tugs at his sleeve. Nell. She must recognize that something is amiss. Her eyes look startled. Instinctively, his hand slips over her hair, just enough to provide reassurance before she is pulled along with the current. Did you have them up? He asks, terse once more. Jules, I did. We were hanging out in the bowl when about a thousand gunshots started going off under our feet. I cross my arms and stare at him. And Monica refused to come upstairs, by the way, because it's against the laws of the compound, and she has a little kid to think about. Who knows if they're okay? Who knows if Jules's family is okay? He pulls a face, like he is frustrated. It passes quickly. And just like earlier, he stares at my collarbone. Look, I don't know much about it. And I'm not supposed to say anything to anyone, but... He looks me in the eye and sighs. They call it a cleanse. Every generation or two they do it. Or so I've heard. I feel like something crushes against my chest. And it restricts my ability to get oxygen to my brain... I remember those whispers of how disposable the noms are in the eyes of the preems. And the crushing sensation worsens. Who's they? He hesitates. I'm not sure which office is in charge of making those decisions. But the orders come from this floor. Yes, Eve. They come from this floor. This floor controls the entire compound. That old hatred of the preems wells up in me once more. You're telling me that the leaders of our compound just slaughtered God knows how many of their own people. He nods. I don't like it any better than you. Bullshit! I snap before I can stop myself. He grabs me by the shoulders. Eve, stop. I understand you're furious, but I'm not the bad guy here. Try to remember that. Please try to remember that. I look around at faces that come and go. Everyone up here looks as pristine as the floors. Pristine and content. The exact opposite of down there. It makes me sick. Why would they do this, Ren? My voice is weak. It's to control populations down there. The one baby policy doesn't work perfectly. He goes still, and my cheeks fill with heat. So you're saying I should feel ashamed, Ren? That my mom had a second child? You know, in contravention of the one baby policy and everything? I guess it's her fault. People like her, and she's to blame for shooting up a bunch of innocent people, right? Stop. His eyes are flashing, and he lowers his head so we are eye to eye. He squeezes my shoulders so tightly I almost wince. Stop. Stop putting words in my mouth. Stop getting mad at me for something I had nothing to do with. Just stop. But I am mad. Every fiber of my being twitches with anger. It burns in a million different directions, and I don't know which yarn to tug at. I take a step back and breathe deeply. I can set it aside. I can. Okay, I say finally willing my voice to relax. Okay, fine. Let's talk about something else. Your test, then. My test? He shrugs. It went as expected. 
Surprised I know about it? Maggie told me. I guess Connor tells her more about himself than you bother to tell me. He rolls his eyes. Eve, that's ridiculous. You've had a lot of shit going on the past couple of weeks, so I didn't want to burden you with... With what, Ren? Your life? You're making excuses. An important test that determines your entire future is the kind of thing you share with your girlfriend. He stares at me. Noted. Can we drop it now? I shake my head and glare at the wall next to us. The test doesn't seem relevant right now, but I don't want to admit that to him. I don't know what I want to admit, what I want to talk about. So probably our floor is next, is that right? I blurt out. They shoot up the denominators first, then move on to the second floor. Take out Maggie and Hunter, maybe my parents too. I've never heard of it happening on the mean floors. Means are valuable to the functioning of the compound. Factories, food, you name it. But the denominators... To those in charge, that's a different story. He frowns. And in case you couldn't figure this out for yourself, there was nothing I could have done to stop it. I did my best to help your friends. The elevator doors slide open just then, and four guards exit the elevator, then calmly walk past. Each carries a body bag, and each body bag is full. My inside sees up at the sight. I feel lightheaded, like I could vomit. Probably they are headed for the Oracle, then outside. Probably there is a mass grave somewhere close by, a place to dump the deceased. I picture myself playing dead to get outside. And the thought is so ridiculous, so macabre, I almost laugh out loud. Almost. Ren is watching me closely, and I give myself a shake. When did you first find out about this? I ask in a low voice. More and more guards exit the elevators, all of them with arms full. Some loads look large and heavy, some heartbreakingly small. I heard it was going to happen this morning, hence why I rushed down to warn you. I go still. First of all, Preem, you didn't warn me. Secondly, you found out about it this morning, or you found out about the timing this morning? Well, the timing. I cross my arms. So you knew this was going to happen. I didn't know anything, okay? but there's been talk of it for some time. I was doing everything I could to stop it from happening at all. Bullshit! I shout again. I can feel my heartbeat in my throat. When I speak, my voice has gone hoarse. It is little more than a whisper. What about when I took you down there for the feeding? He raises both hands. Eve. That old tendency toward violence resurfaces quickly and I lift my hand to strike him. But he grabs it, and there is a wailing that comes from the elevator, one that grows louder as the doors slide open, one that is so coated in anguish it makes my muscles unclench and my hand is free. It drops to my side. I stare at the elevator, at the guards who empty out of it. The last guard is slower, for there is a child clutching the full body bag in his arms. My heart stops beating for a moment in time. I wish that it wouldn't start up again, but it does. I keep on living, and so I have to see Avery, red in the face and smothered in tears, his little hands clenched around plastic so tightly his knuckles turn white with effort. His mother is in that body bag. There is no question. Monica my friend. No. My feet are moving me forward. My own tears are falling. My voice is screaming, no. But before I can reach the boy, a guard wrenches him away from his dead mother's side and he is shoved onto the elevator from which he emerged. I scream his name and bang on the door, but it's no use. He is gone. 
and when I turn around again, the guard carrying Monica has disappeared, and it is over. It is all over. My eyes find Ren, and I know he feels something now, something beyond a generic, requisite disgust. His back holds him upright, and his jaw is squared, but his eyes betray him. There is a glimmer of emotion, guilt, too, and it only makes me madder. I breathe heavily, but otherwise I am composed. My voice sounds normal, except that it is laced with fire. Don't come near me. Don't talk to me. Don't look at me. Don't set foot on my floor. I never want to see you again. And then, as fast as my boots allow, I push through the stairwell door. Gone. Chapter 35 I lie face down on my bed in the darkness and squeeze my eyes closed. Sleep won't come. I know that. I am going through the motions because that is what society dictates. At a certain time each and every day, we change out of our clothes and brush our hair and shut out the lamp. Time for sleep. But the sound of gunshots plays over and over again in my mind. Avery's screams do, too, sounding just like Jack's when he was taken. And I tell myself to stop, stop. But in the darkness, there is no fighting it. I think of Avery's tiny face, eyebrows drawn to the top of his forehead in disbelief, in horror. His hands clutching at his mother, desperate to feel her skin against his, desperate for her to wake to calm him down, to tell him everything will be okay. Nothing will be okay for him. Not now and not ever. He is just a child, and he watched his mother die. I pray she went quickly, before she could realize what was happening, before she realized that her beloved boy was watching, that his life was changing by the second in the most horrible way imaginable, Looking forward to it. Those were my last words to Monica. Looking forward to seeing her at lunch duty. A time that never came. That will now never come. Why didn't I try harder to get her upstairs? I want to scream just thinking about it. All that terror and pain and misery. Just to control population growth. Surely there is a better way, a more just and humane way. But what else could I expect from the man in charge of population control, Ted Burgess? The same man who ordered Jack's removal. It has to be. For him, today was just more of the same. I wonder if Commander Katz felt any remorse when he signed off on the cleanse whether he so much as blinked when he considered the tremendous loss of life committed at the flick of his pen. And I remember the ease with which he had Sully tortured, and I know that he didn't. My pillow is already wet with tears, but still I cry harder, harder still. I cry so hard and for so long that when I do pull myself to my elbows I am dizzy. The blackness of my cell oozes around me like tar, I need to calm down. I need to breathe. At least one thing is crystal clear to me now. I am leaving Compound 11. I am not staying here, where such hideous acts of inhumanity are not simply tolerated by Katz and Burgess and the rest of our leaders, but ordered by them. I'm not even going to wait until job selections, like I originally planned. In a day or two, once I get my affairs in order... I will no longer be a citizen of Eleven. And that is the only thought that brings me a sliver of peace. I sit up in my bed and chew my thumb until I taste blood. The darkness doesn't bother me in the slightest. I chew my thumb because I am thinking of him. 
even though I do everything in my power not to. Don't do it, Eve. Don't. But I can't stop. Every time I blink, I see the look on his face when I told him I never wanted to see him again. His lips ever so slightly parted, his eyes, usually so alive with intent, dull. But goddammit, they should be dull. They should be full of guilt and sorrow, because he knew, he knew, he knew. Even if he didn't know for certain this was in the pipeline, he suspected it, and he didn't do anything about it, no matter what he says, and never before have I felt so betrayed. What a fool I was for trusting him. He is a preem. He is his mother's son, through and through. I want to punch him. I want to make him bleed. But more than anything, I ache because I am sad, and I miss him, and I want the comfort of his embrace. I straighten my back and wipe away tears. It is better this way. It will be easier to go now without having to say goodbye. I may feel like a million pieces of shattered glass smashed to sand by the heel of a boot, but it means less pain later. This is good. It's good. Things with Ren have reached their conclusion. One I always knew would come. And though I didn't expect such a violent end to our relationship, I never really expected it to begin in the first place. And if there is one thing about life that I know, it's that it is perfectly unpredictable. I will move on. My heart will heal. And I will pick myself back up. I just have to get out of this God-forsaken compound. I am lying on my stomach again, but this time my friends surround me. Hunter sits at the foot of my bed, and my feet are on his lap. Emerald sits on the floor, her back against the wall, a ball passing slowly between her hands. Maggie sits next to her with her head between her knees. None of us talks. There is so little to say. So much to say, and so little. News of the cleanse has made its way around the compound. A government-sanctioned mass murder. Unthinkable. Finally, Maggie lifts her head. My granddad said they did the same thing when he was a boy. He was too young to understand it, but old enough to remember the sound of gunshots and people, you know, freaking. He said it sounded just like yesterday. No different at all. I turn my head and look at her. If they do it every so often, how come nobody does anything to stop it? She shrugs. Like what? This is compound 11. If you don't like it, too bad. There's nowhere else to go. Actually, there is somewhere else to go, I say, and take a deep breath. The others stare at me. To another compound. Come off it, mutters Hunter quietly. I roll on my back so I can look at him. Why not? Do you have any idea how big the world is? There have to be hundreds, maybe even thousands of compounds out there. Are you really telling me that none of them is better than this shithole? Look around, Hunter. This place is a dump. I'm sick of seeing dirt and garbage everywhere and, and filth, blood, bodies. I'm sick of the burned out lights and walking on broken glass. I'm sick of being treated like shit because I was born on the second floor and not having any decent job options. I'm sick of all of it. Maybe you're right. Maybe there are other compounds out there that are better than here. Maybe. But how exactly are you going to get to any of them? And what are you going to do once you get there? Ask to stay a while? I don't know what I'm going to do. I admit, as I draw my feet off his lap. I sit upright. But I do know how I'm going to get there. He stares at me. How's that? The tunnel to Compound 10 runs from downstairs. I've seen it. There's only one guard in the way. It'll be no problem to force my way past. You're serious right now? 
I take a deep breath and nod. I'm going tonight. There is a commotion in the hall, yelling. But it has been happening all day and I tune it out. The guards will be distracted dealing with that, I add, nodding in the direction of the door to indicate the aftermath of the cleanse. Tonight. Tonight. Maggie's back straightens. Are you seriously telling me I'm losing my best friend tonight? Her mouth hangs open, and her bloodshot eyes grow round with bewilderment. Not necessarily, I hesitate. You could come too. All of you. They say nothing, which of course says everything. I never expected them to come. Not under normal circumstances. Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't have even mentioned it. But given the cleanse... I shake my head. Look, it isn't something I'm rushing into. I've been thinking about it for a long time now. Why do you think I haven't been doing the job tours? It's not because I was planning on going pro. It's because I need out. I hate it here. I hate everything about this place. I hate how unfair and unjust it is. I hate how low the ceilings are. I hate what they did to Jack. I hate it. There is no point in telling them about the Oracle, about how much I crave proper freedom, how much I want to see if my mother's song holds any truth, how much I want to search for my brother, even if it is a mission in futility, even if the expense of all that is probable death. They won't understand it. Few can. But they can understand this, especially now, especially after the cleanse. They can understand why I would want out. Who could possibly want to stay? Hunter makes a sound at the back of his throat. I think you've covered that, Eve. But I'm sure ten is just as much a shithole as eleven. These compounds were founded by the same group of people, don't forget. Yeah, says Emerald. Even without the wondrous Cat's dynasty at the helm, it might be just as unfair. She throws the ball at me, and I catch it. The ceilings might be lower. I know that, but it's a chance I'm willing to take. What about us? Maggie says, and when I look at her, I see a tear glide down her cheek. What about us? And Ren? And your parents? How could you walk away from all of that? Please don't start crying, Maggie, or I will too. Please don't. I sit straighter in an effort to keep my emotions in check. She wipes the tear away and frowns. Well? You know how my parents are. They won't care. And you know things are finished with Wren. My voice breaks at the mention of his name. I can't bear to think about him right now. Not now, and not ever again. Because whenever I do, my stomach feels like it is filled with lead, and it hurts so deeply it is beginning to scare me. And as for you guys... My hands cover my face. They try to push back the tears before they escape. What, Eve? We're not enough, are we? We are not enough to make you stay. You guys are the reason I've stayed as long as I have. I've been miserable for so long. And now... And now nothing is enough. Nothing could ever be enough. Think what they did to so many innocent people yesterday. Think what they did to Jack. My face is wet and my bottom lip quivers. I'm going to miss you guys like hell. But I've made my decision. Maggie shoots toward me and rests her head on my shoulder. She is crying, and I cry too. When the tears finally clear, I see Emerald sits on my other side, her brown eyes wet. She grabs my hand. I don't want you to go, she says, and her voice is hoarse. And I'm not going to stand in your way. Promise me you'll find a way back if ten's not everything you want and more. My eyes meet hers. I promise, I say. Hunter sits at the end of my now full bed, and his eyes are dry. The hardness of his features makes all my muscles clench. He doesn't like change. 
He won't understand. But I need him to. Hunter, I begin. But he shakes his head. If you've been so unhappy, how come I haven't heard about it? We're best friends. He glances coolly at me. Or at least we used to be. It's nothing but secrets with you anymore. I know he is referring to Ren, and I am shaking my head back and forth, even though I know he is right. Stop it. Stop with the lies. I'm so sick of it, he says in a tight voice. I don't know what to say. There is nothing to say, not really. Nothing that could make him understand. So we just stare at each other. A lifetime of friendship and familiarity and closeness between us. Until three sharp knocks pierce the uncomfortable silence. With one last desperate look at Hunter that gets me nowhere, I shove off my bed and go to the door. Jules. Immediately I rub at my face to get the last of the tears away. Not that she looks much better. Her cheeks are streaked and her blonde hair is tangled with knots. I need to talk to you, she says before I can collect myself. She pushes her way past me, then freezes when she sees the rest of them. Oh, perfect. You're all here. Sarcasm. She turns to me and jams her finger into my chest. You knew, she spits. You knew. You knew, didn't you? Of course I didn't know, I insist, even as I feel my face reddening. It looks like I'm lying, even though I am not. I didn't know, I didn't. You expect me to believe that you just so happen to invite me upstairs right before my entire floor gets shot at? Before a bunch of my family and friends gets killed? She is yelling now. Monica, too, by the way. Her kid is fucking heartbroken. God damn it. As soon as I saw your face at breakfast, I knew something was up. The whole thing about going to the bowl and wanting me to come along. It was all bullshit, wasn't it? Don't lie to me, Eve. It wasn't bullshit. It wasn't. Hunter's words ring in my head, and I take a deep breath. But I had been warned to invite you upstairs. That's the entire truth, Jules. I promise. We really were going to the bowl and... What do you mean you'd been warned? By whom? I run my fingers through my hair. It is still wet from my shower, and my fingers snag in tangles. Ren. He caught up with me on the way to the bowl. He told me to invite you and Monica up, but that's all he said. I had no idea what was going to happen, Jules. You have to believe me. But he knew. Is that right? I feel that familiar weight in my stomach. When I speak, my voice is barely audible. I've already ended things with him, if that makes it any better. She stares at me, and it is several long moments before she speaks again. It doesn't, she finally breathes. And for the record, you and I are done too. She walks out the door, slamming it so hard the thud echoes through my ribs. The concrete wall of my cell is cold against my back, and I slide down it until my chin rests on my knees. Five minutes ago, I didn't think I could possibly feel worse, but I was wrong. I guess it doesn't exactly matter, seeing as how you're leaving, but if it brings you any peace, she won't stay mad at you. I give Maggie a look. Did you hear her? She hates me. Rightfully so. No, Eve. You did nothing wrong. If anything, you saved her life. I stare at my thumbs. I trusted Ren. I say quietly. I trusted a preem. Yeah, that. She slides off the bed and onto the floor in front of me. What? Exactly did he do again? My eyes snap to hers. Are you serious? She shrugs. Yeah, I am. Sorry, I don't see it. He found out what was happening. 
so he risked missing the biggest test of his life to make sure you kept your friends safe. She opens and closes her hands. And you're angry at him, why? It isn't that simple. Maybe not, but I think he deserves a proper goodbye. How do you think he's going to feel when you just disappear? I ended things with him. I told him I never wanted to see him again. I'm not saying goodbye to him now. She looks at me, then shakes her head. Your call. I stare at her. I'm right. I know I am. So why does my stomach feel like it is twisting into knots? When did life get so confusing? I thought it was supposed to be black and white, and instead, it is a million pixels in between. Hunter stands. I've got other things to do, Eve, he mutters. Have a ball in Compound 10. I push what happened with Jules to the back of my mind, Ren too. Then I jump to my feet. I'm not joking about going tonight, and I'm not bluffing. This is the last time I will see my best friend, and I'm not leaving him on these terms. Quickly, I block his path. Do you mind? He asks. I do. Eve, move. No, you can't leave like this. You owe me a proper goodbye. He crosses his arms. I don't owe you anything. Come on, Hunter, that's not what I mean. It's just, I can't have you mad at me. I just can't. You're my oldest friend and I love you to pieces and I can't leave on these terms. So don't leave then. I tuck my hair behind my ears and look him in the eye. I'm going, Hunter. I've already made my decision. All I need is for you, my best friend, to give me your blessing. Please. I need it. There is something wet on my cheek, and when I wipe at it, I realize I'm crying. He just laughs. If anything... The past two months have shown me that I am not that important to you after all. What does that even mean? Of course you're important to me. You're everything to me. I grab him by the shoulders, and tears fall quickly now. I feel desperate suddenly, as if his blessing will make everything in my life okay again, if I can just manage to secure it. Please, Hunter, please try to understand. Please know you're everything to me. His arms wrap around mine. He says in a low voice, Everything? So what about him? Him? I stare into eyes so familiar that I recognize every speck. I stare into them and try to understand. You know who I'm talking about. Ren. My head is shaking. My pulse is unsteady. Words form on my tongue, but they are jumbled and uncertain. Hunter is everything to me. Hunter is everything to me. It is his blessing I need. But no, Hunter is a friend. He is more than that. He is family. There is too much on the line, and there is too little time. I am leaving soon. That much I know. That much I must remember. So I take a step back, and our arms uncurl. I take another step, and they fall to our sides. What does he have to do with anything? I hear a voice say. I know it is mine, but still it sounds foreign. His expression sours. But just as quickly as his anger came, it disappears again. His voice is restrained. It doesn't matter. Not now. You want to leave so badly? Good riddance. He pushes past me, and my insides turn to acid. I will not get his blessing. But he stops at the door. Only one thing, he says. Compound members aren't allowed to come and go as they choose, Eve. And you may know where the tunnel out of here is, but that doesn't mean you're getting through it. So maybe I'll see you around tomorrow. Maybe I won't. Nothing's stopping me, Hunter, I say in a voice muffled by tears. 
but it's no matter. Already he has slammed the door, and another relationship lies bloodied at my feet. I spend the rest of the afternoon retrieving the gun from the storeroom and passing time with Maggie and Emerald. Though the mood is heavy, we do our best to keep the conversation light. Don't worry about Hunter, they assure me, or Jules. Instead, they indulge me, like good friends would. Together, we brainstorm all the great things awaiting in Compound 10. Unlimited croissants, cells built above ground, music, and despite the silliness of it, it makes me more excited to go. It is an adventure, just as Maggie said. And what is life if not a great adventure? My time in Compound 11 has been the opposite of a great adventure. And now is the time to right that wrong. My pulse is quick as I collect myself, as I prepare to slip downstairs and never see these hallways again. That is the good news. The bad news is that my hand shakes as I run a brush through my hair. The bad news is that my pulse isn't simply quick. It ticks so furiously that a light sheen covers my skin and I am faintly nauseous. I am racked with nerves and guilt and sorrow. Part of me doesn't want to go. It wants those old feelings again. The ones I get with my friends. Or when my mother is lucid or before Ren and I broke up. I stare at myself in the mirror and breathe. I am strong, and I deserve more than eleven. That is when I hear something at the door, something I haven't heard before. Scraping, the sound of metal, a thud. But then it is gone, and there is nothing but silence. I turn back to the mirror. No bruises today. Just a plain face, one free of violence. That is what the surface says anyway. It almost looks foreign, that smooth skin the same color. I want to examine it further. But instead I look again at the door. Someone was out there. But who? And why? I shake my head. I know where my brain is going, and I am desperate to stop it. Maybe it was Hunter, ready to make amends. Or maybe it was him. I can't help it. My eyes comb the bottom of the doorframe. Nothing. And my stomach drops. How careless and shallow and weak. What a hopeless romantic I have become. So I slap myself. I force myself to refocus. Time to go. I have said my goodbyes to my friends as best I can, and I do not plan on extending the same courtesy to my parents. Anger bubbles in my stomach whenever I think of them. No, no, my friends are my family, and I have said a proper goodbye. I turn to my boots, but before I pull them on, I walk instinctively to the door. No harm in taking a look. It had been an unusual noise, after all. And then something strange happens. When I pull at the door, it doesn't give. My fingers move to the lock. I have locked myself in. But no, that isn't it. I haven't locked myself in. But I am locked in. I yank at the door again. I turn and twist the door handle and pull with all my strength. But the door doesn't budge. I take a step back and stare at it. My brain seems to move like molasses. I am locked in. Why am I locked in? Maybe the lock itself is jammed or malfunctioning. The others will notice. They will come by my cell, knock on the door. Unless they think I have already left. What a cruel twist of fate that would be. Or maybe... Maybe I have been locked in by those in charge of Compound 11. But surely not. Surely that wouldn't happen to me. Besides, why would the Compound care to lock me in my cell? I haven't done anything wrong. But something claws at the back of my brain. 
My plans to go to Compound 10 are against the rules. Hunter was right. I'm not permitted to come and go as I choose. If the authorities know, I will be locked in here until my punishment is determined. But they couldn't possibly know. I try the door again and rattle the handle until I am out of breath, until sweat beads against my forehead and at the back of my neck. The effort makes me thirsty, so I go to the bathroom and fill a tin cup with water. I swallow it down in one gulp. They couldn't know. Of course they couldn't. It's a coincidence, the fact that my door is locked just before I am about to escape. Nothing more. Only I don't believe in coincidences. I sit on my bed with my back straight and stare at the wall in front of me. I swallow the saliva that pools in my mouth and think. Either my lock is broken, or they know. And if they know, only one of three people could have told them. Maggie, Emerald, or Hunter. Nobody else knew of my plans for tonight. Deep down... I know which of the three to blame. But I can't accept it, and I won't believe it. I shake my head back and forth and back and forth until the thought is gone. Time has passed, but still I haven't moved from my seat on the bed. And so when there comes a knocking and shouting from the other side of the door, I am startled. It takes a moment for my feet to find feeling again, but eventually they rush me to the door, which I pound with the heel of my palm. Eve, Maggie shouts, and I know she must have her lips pressed close because these doors are thick and sound doesn't pass easily through. Maggie, help, I can't get out. I don't know if she'll be able to understand me, but I keep thumping my hand so she knows I'm here. I can feel her jiggling the doorknob, pulling against it. Metal thuds quietly, but still the door doesn't open. Useless. I'm locked in. Compound 11 knows my secret. Security knows. The guards know. Whoever needs to know about a possible security breach knows. And now I am locked in. And next I will be punished. A chill runs down my spine at the thought. I once heard they snipped off a man's index finger. Sully, in fact. And now both are missing. I heard about a young child forced to clean toilets every day for five long years. I have heard of people sent to live on the floor below. Of family and friends being severed. Of job opportunities squandered. I have heard so many things over the years. And now they twist around my brain. And I can't hear Maggie anymore. I can't hear anything anymore. I sit on the floor, and when I come to again, my cell is silent. Chapter 36 I should try to get some sleep. Certainly there is nothing else to do. My stomach aches with hunger but I ignore it because that isn't a problem I can solve right now. Since I can't think of a problem I can solve, I take off my white sweatshirt and fold it into a neat square. I place it on my desk. Next, I take off my pants, and I fold these too. Normally, I don't bother with such rituals, but right now I do these things without thinking. My mother taught me to fold my clothes when I was small, my father enforced it after she left. I haven't bothered since I moved into my own cell. The cell I am now a prisoner of. I slip between the sheets, and they feel cold and unwelcome against my bare skin. I turn out the lamp beside my bed and stare into blackness. It is strange, this feeling. Like I'm alive and dead all at once. Hunter's betrayal stings my eyes every time I blink, but it keeps my heart ticking, too. I don't know why. I don't feel particularly vengeful, 
All I feel is sorrow kicking me straight in the gut. But I will. I think that is it. I will be vengeful. And so I must persevere until I can exact my revenge on someone whom, until today, I treasured and loved and who I thought loved me too. Funny. Ever since I was little, I was taught to be forgiving. And this thought makes a laugh slip between my teeth. The same woman who admits to me now that she knows nothing about forgiveness, that she isn't capable of such things, taught me to always forgive those who falter. Perhaps we don't teach our children what we know, only what we ought to know. If I had children of my own, I would teach them what a sham forgiveness really is, and I would make them cold and hard so they couldn't be gutted. I would make them cruel, because that is what this world is, cruel. Those with soft hearts can't survive, not in peace. I kick the cold sheet off and turn on my side. I wrap my arms around my stomach and think to myself, that is what my father did. He tried to make me a monster, a tough, hardened, violent monster, one cruel enough to survive Compound 11. I stare into the darkness and turn it over in my mind. Perhaps he wasn't angling for allotments. Perhaps he wasn't pining for a son. Perhaps he was acting in my own interest all along. Perhaps I have been wrong about him. I roll onto my other side and shake my head. Lies. This must be what it feels like to lose your mind. Thoughts become warped. They twist inside your head until you're too confused to move a muscle. What I need more than anything is to quiet my mind. That must be the key to sanity. Like my mother. She has quieted her mind to keep her sanity. Another laugh. So maybe quiet minds drive us insane. Maybe they are insane. I roll onto my back and thump my palms against my cheeks. I am losing it. I know I am because I can hear scraping and thudding and it is thunderous inside my brain. Now I see neon. My vision is no longer true. Eve. My arms flatten against my bedsheet. Terror. But once I look up, I see a familiar face standing over me. I see, too, that his face is carved out of the blackness by the neon light shining from the hall. And that means my cell door must be open. And it isn't just a familiar face. It's him. I don't think about my actions. I simply act. I simply react. The balloon in my stomach lifts me from the bed and into his stiff frame. It is hard and unyielding, but I wrap my arms around him anyway. It is Ren, and he got my door open. I am free. His hand grips the back of my head, and his mouth is in my ear. Are you okay? I am shaking my head back and forth as a million thoughts tumble inside. I am not okay. I am not. But I am, because he came. You saved me, I whisper. Only so you could save yourself. He pulls away and adds curtly, I need to close the door. I watch his long body as it shuts out the neon light from the hall. We are swallowed by blackness until my fingers switch on the lamp. In his hand, he holds a padlock with a keypad on it, and he places it on my desk next to my folded up jeans. I remember that I am almost naked other than an undershirt and underwear, but I don't care. Of all the things to care about lately, that is not one of them. Before he can turn to me, I am twisting my arms around his chest, sealing out any air trapped between us. Maybe if I hold him close enough, I won't remember the fact that my best friend betrayed me, or that I am leaving now, going to Compound 10, or that I broke up with him and he came to my rescue anyway. Maybe I won't remember the massacre that happened beneath my feet or the sound of Jack screaming for my mother and me. I breathe deeply, letting the smell of his skin and his shirt soothe me. And it must work, because my pulse slows and I feel almost peaceful. 
Then I realize that other than a hand on the back of my head, he doesn't hold me. I am clutching him like I never wanted to let go, but one of his arms hangs limply at his side. It is a simple thing, but it sends pain radiating through my chest. I know I ended things. I don't know if I was right or wrong when I did it, but I know it doesn't change the fact that it happened. Eve. Too many thoughts, too many emotions. I push them aside and wrap my hands around his neck. I stand on my toes and kiss him. And for a second, I think he is going to resist. But then, the hand that hangs by his side wraps around me, and he tugs me close, and for a fleeting moment, life is good. It doesn't last long. He pulls himself back several inches and says my name again. His voice is heavy, somber. I shake my head. No, don't want to hear it. I can't accept whatever he is about to say. I don't want to be reminded of the fact that we broke up and shouldn't be kissing right now. And I don't care if it's messy and confusing. Right now, he is my rock. I step forward and kiss him again. This time, I kiss him hard. I squeeze his shoulders. I push him in the direction of the bed. I can feel him starting to resist, so I push harder, like I am fighting in the bowl. And once he sits, I straddle him. My fingers run under the hem of his shirt, and his fingers find my bare legs, dig into flesh. He kisses me now just as hard as I kiss him. Just as my lips curl into a small smile, I am pushed from his lap, shoved toward my desk. Put your clothes on. His voice is cold and level. He drags his palms over his face, then stares at me. Why? What do you mean, why? Because this is a mistake. I know why you're doing... that. And I'm not being a part of it. A part of what? He gives me a look. I'm not a child, Eve. You're doing this because you're a wreck and you want a distraction. No, oh, I'm doing this because I like you. A lot. That's a quick change of heart. That was yesterday. I was angry. This is now. I'm not talking about the fact that you broke up with me, although we should probably discuss that. I'm talking about the fact that until you were locked in here a few hours ago, you were planning on leaving for Compound 10. Tonight. I am still. When I try to swallow, I realize my throat has gone dry. You weren't even going to say goodbye, he whispers. After everything. His gaze drops to the floor, and it makes me hurt. Ren. If you want to think I'm a monster, that's fine. I get it, trust me. But there was nothing I could do to stop the cleanse. I did the best I could for you, Eve and I'm sorry it wasn't enough. A monster? I let out a nervous laugh. Not for one second. Not from the moment we met and you kicked the shit out of me in the bowl. Have I believed you were a monster? I look him straight in the eye. You're not. And don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. He stares at me. I feel like he is looking not at me, but through me, deep inside to the darkest recesses of my mind. What? I finally ask. You're serious? I turn my palms to the ceiling. Of course I am. Even after yesterday. I let out a deep breath. Even after yesterday. He shakes his head again, but this time he is smiling. I take it from the welcome I just received. You've had a change of heart about us breaking up. I shrug. That was a mistake. But still, I didn't handle the whole thing very well. I would promise to do better in the future, but I guess there's no point. Suddenly his smile is gone. There's not. No. I need to change the subject. Fast. So, how'd you know I was stuck in here? 
I assume, since you know of my plans to go to Compound 10, that it was Maggie who tracked you down. I cross one foot over the other and lean backward onto my desk. His eyes graze my hips. You assume correct. Can you put some clothes on? He shifts, and his gaze pushes sideways. Please. I tug my sweater over my head, smiling. So she tracked you down, and you happen to know the passcode? Not quite. I close my eyes as I understand. Addison. She had mentioned it enough times. Her father's office oversees security. Jeffrey Sitwell, lord of the guards that I loathe so deeply. He nods, and jealousy ripples through me. She agreed to let me into her father's office. In the middle of the night. Something like that. I'm surprised she would do that for you after seeing us together at the party. He frowns, but says nothing more. Immediately, I know why she did it. She knows we broke up. Deep breath in and deep breath out, I remind myself. I am leaving. I am leaving Compound 11. How Ren chooses to spend his time from here on out is none of my concern. It is none of my business. Did Maggie mention how my plans to go to another compound were leaked in the first place? She didn't, but it doesn't take a genius to figure it out. I twist away to hide my shame. Pull on my jeans instead. Yeah, well, I must be quite the fool, because I didn't think in a million years he would do that. Sometimes it's hard to see the flaws in people we love. Maybe that's the problem. I mumble after a while. I sit beside him on the bed and draw on my boots, shove my gun into my waistband. When I am finished, he strings his hands through mine, and they are impossibly warm. For a moment, I feel almost mended. The hole that Hunter's betrayal left in my heart doesn't ache right now. Nothing aches. I stare at Ren, and as I watch him take a deep breath, I see something strange sweep over his eyes, a flash of emotion, and then it's gone, and I wonder what is passing inside that great mind of his. I have something for you, he says finally. Every word seems strained, unnatural, not like Ren at all. Okay. I don't want to give it to you, because... His voice trails off, and he shakes his head. I'm going to give it to you because it's the right thing to do, and because I know it's what you want above all else. My hands, which are twisted in his, clench. My spine draws me upright. Okay, I say again, this time in a whisper. I can barely breathe. Freedom. It's... Freedom. What? I used my connections for something good for once. I found a way for you to get above ground. I am perfectly still, but the edges of my cell seem to quiver in my peripheral vision. I can see Ren, but I can't. The world is both crisply defined and a blur. Slowly I pull my hands free from his and coil them around his neck. Our foreheads touch, and tears fall from my eyes to the bedsheets below. Freedom. I am going to have freedom. I am going to reach the oasis. I am going to reunite with Jack. I hug him so tightly that I think I might press his chest into mine and our hearts will beat truly as one. Thank you, Ren. He nods. We should go. Now. Chapter 37 once we are in the lower mean hallway, with my knife and flashlight tucked inside my boot, Ren's hand grabs mine. 
we need to go to the storeroom. I look at him in surprise, and his face is full of sunken shadows under the glare of the neon light that hangs across from my cell. I can get to it through the kitchen. He nods. You lead the way. I guide him down the hall, with my hand snug in his. The dark may not scare me anymore, but since these hallways are ripe with danger, especially now, his presence next to me is welcome. I thought we would be heading to the Oracle, I say. You thought wrong, he replies under his breath. Care to elaborate? There's another exit. What? I stop in my tracks and stare at him through the darkness. You're kidding. He looks at me. Not one that's easy to access, mind you. But it definitely won't be guarded. And it won't require a passcode or a handprint to get outside. Another exit. My heart thumps with excitement. Where is it? Remember where the controls are for the solar panels? I do. In the outbuilding at the foot of the hill. He looks past me as he speaks. Inside, there is a trap door that opens onto the top net of the storeroom. It's for the engineers, so they can access tools. But the storeroom is four stories high. Like I said, getting out won't be easy. He glances at me, and a shiver runs along my spine. But somehow I think you'll find a way. Another exit. Not one intended for humans to pass through. But that is what makes it so genius. So perfect. How did you find out? He exhales noisily. I spent the afternoon yesterday touring my mother's office. Wow. First the security office, now energy. Decided that politics is your thing after all? Very funny. It was a ruse, as if you couldn't figure that out. When she finds out my intentions were far from serious, she won't be happy. I'm fine with that, and you should be too. You mean you toured her office for the sole purpose of... Of finding a way for you to fulfill your dream of breathing fresh air? He pulls his hand from mine and shoves it into his pocket. Something like that. He is conflicted. I know that. He is giving me the gift of freedom. But we both know it is probably a death sentence. I want to tell him that it's okay. But I can't bear to. Because if we discuss it, I might be forced to say that I would rather die than be with him. And that isn't something I can handle right now. Or ever. Because it isn't true. It is true, but it isn't. Maybe I am just as conflicted as he is. Why would you do that for me? I finally ask. My voice sounds weak. After everything. After I broke up with you is what I mean to say. Maybe I'm the fool. I grab his arm. I stop him. Not to me. You're brilliant and selfless. You're the most amazing person I've ever met. He laughs, an impossibly shy laugh. I've never known you to be so full of compliments, Eve. I want to tell him how much he means to me. But instead, there comes the sound of heavy footsteps, fast approaching, and I am distracted by them, by my muscles clenching. A bright light erupts from the end of the corridor, a blinding one that could only come from the flashlight of a guard. My hand finds Wren's, and I drag him backward, away from the light. Stop right there, the guard yells and his voice sounds tinny in the tight corridor. Just as I have always done, I listen to what the man in power orders and do the opposite. My legs burst into a sprint, and my hand pulls at Wren's. Around the corner we go, and only just in time, because I hear a gunshot blast behind us, and it sounds too close, too close. We run in silence, but my mind screams. It was strange for the guard to fire his weapon so soon. Usually they wait until you punch them before they try to shoot you dead. But these are desperate times. I can tell by the echo of footsteps that the guard is in the same corridor as us now. 
Ten more paces and we can turn the corner. Taste a sliver of safety until he nears again. Nine. Vulnerability makes my ears ring. Eight. Seven. I wait for a bullet to rip through me. Or worse, through Ren. Six. Five. Four. Please don't let it hit him. Three. He has done so much for me. Two. He has risked so much. One. The blast is thunderous as I dive. My fingers slip from Ren's, and as I fall to the ground, they snap backward, snatch at nothing but air. Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? As soon as I land, my feet are under me again, and I rush back toward the line of fire. I will find Ren, no matter the cost. But my hand is grabbed, and he is there, here, and whole. He gives me a strange look through the darkness. And then we run on, but now I am smiling. I force him to take a quick right, then another. The beads along the crevice where floor meets wall stream into long lines of light, and for a moment I feel like I am flying. Are you laughing, Eve? He asks through heavy breaths. I am too winded to reply. Relief has flooded my veins because I can lose the guard now. These are short corridors and ones I know well. And because for a fraction of a second I thought he had been hit by the bullet. Now, I feel like I do after a nightmare. Joyous to be awake. I didn't know I would die for him. But I know that now. I know, too, I have never been willing to die for someone before. Not seriously. Aside from Jack. With my brother, it's easy. I love him. Always have, always will. Whether he beat the odds and survived up there or not. So with Ren, does it mean that I love him, too? Am I in love with Ren? I try not to think about it as our pace slows. We walk, no longer seized by panic, no longer pursued by the guard. He is probably out there somewhere, ready to shoot again. But for now, we are safe. Ren wraps his arm around my back, and his thumb touches bare skin. You realize that unless that was Ben, there was no reason for you to run? Ben? The laughter is gone. He's the one who put the lock on your door. None of the other guards on duty right now would realize you should be in your cell. I guess old habits die hard, I reply bitterly. He walks close enough to watch me, then stops and pulls me to his chest. I know we should be moving, putting more space between us and the trigger-happy guard, winding our way back to the kitchen but instead I loop my arms around him and let my palms rest on his shoulder blades. I'm sorry you've had to deal with this bullshit your whole life. His voice is low and rumbly, just like I remember it. It was worth it, getting to spend these last two months with you. His eyebrows lift at my words, and quickly I turn away, lead him into the night. I have said too much. What exactly does that mean, Eve? He asks from behind me. I walk in silence for several seconds as I try to think of something to say that doesn't give me away. It means I like hanging out with you. He laughs to himself. Sure. Well, if it helps, I like hanging out with you too. We hold hands again, and I turn in the direction of the kitchen, more careful this time, listening for the sound of footsteps. What are you going to do once you're out? I'm going to run north. I say it bluntly. Matter of fact. I'm going to run as fast as I can. I'll sleep somewhere safe and shaded during the day. Then I'll keep going. On and on, until I find Jack. Until I find paradise. He looks at me, confused. I can't tell if you're joking or serious. Does it matter? Instead of replying, he squeezes my hand. The magnitude of what I am about to do begins to sink in. So I squeeze his hand in return and feel calmer. I focus on him walking next to me, the rhythmic sound of his breathing, and feel calmer still. 
I pull him around the last corner before we reach the kitchen and freeze. A figure up ahead, and I can see by his uniform that it's a guard. Not the one we just ran away from, another one. One that is faintly familiar to me. Old habits die hard indeed. And right now, I fight every instinct in my bones to turn and run. But Ren is right. There is no need to run from the guards right now, unless that guard happens to be Ben. And the man ahead of us certainly is not. I take a deep breath. We are out for a walk, nothing more. Frowned upon, yes, but not strictly prohibited. He will ask us what we are doing and we will tell him, and he will let us walk on. I will be inside the kitchen, then the storeroom, in a minute or two. And so we continue forward, hand in hand, and even though Ren's presence steadies me, it isn't enough. The guard looks familiar, I know that. I don't know why, until we're within feet of him. A shudder grips my shoulders and my boots stall. I have to run. I know it is risky, but I have to. Yet Ren's hand holds mine too tightly. I couldn't go even if I tried. And he pulls me closer and closer to the man who tried to kill me. The man whose nose I broke. I see the outline of a gun in his holster. And I shudder again. My feet drag. He turns to look at us, shines his flashlight over us and I shield my face from the light, from his prying eyes. If he recognizes me, I am dead. Odd time to be out of bed, isn't it? He says, and the sound of his voice makes me tremble. Black, bead eyes glare at us. Not if you feel like going for a walk, Ren replies levelly. My hand is still held over my face, even though the flashlight is pointed at the ceiling, we are almost past him, but then he moves quickly. He stands in front of us, and we are forced to be still. You look familiar, he says to me. I try not to look at him, but I can't help it, and I see the recognition dawn quickly across his features. I know you, he spits at me. You cold-cocked me, you bitch. I think you have me confused, I say and I am surprised by how bold my voice sounds. It doesn't betray how fast my heart hammers. I don't have you confused, he hisses. And quickly, his free hand grabs his gun and digs it into my stomach. Panic flares inside my brain. I'm good with faces. Now turn around and walk to the elevators or I'll shoot you. Happily. Ren's hand releases mine and I close my eyes. Less violence. All I want is less violence. And so it brings me no pleasure to slip my hand to the back of my waistband, to dig my hard-earned weapon into the guard's side before he knows what I am doing. You don't have the guts to shoot me, he snarls. Sure I do, I reply, even though I don't know whether I mean it or not. But then I remember the journey to this moment. I remember the despair I have endured down here in Eleven, and the desperation to find a way out. I remember the soaring highs I experienced as I crafted plans to escape, and the crushing lows as those plans were dashed. Now, against all odds, I hold the threat of death over a guard. And that guard is the only thing standing between me and and a future of my choosing. I have come so far. I am so close to finally tasting freedom, to having a shot at finding Jack. And suddenly I know I mean what I say. Sure I do. Sure I have the guts to shoot him. She does, Ren confirms, as if he can read my mind. But she doesn't need to. What are you talking about? I expect Ren to pounce, to disarm him. Instead, he says, Jeffrey Sitwell, does the name ring a bell? The guard's muscles contract. My boss, he says between clenched teeth. 
your boss's boss, the head of security. He's a family friend. That's how I know your name is Dennis Grove. Your wife is Penny, middle name Lynn. Your mother is Gertrude Grove, even though she goes by her maiden name, Frank. Your father is Evan. She and your wife reside on the fourth floor in hallway 16K. Shall I continue? The face of Dennis Grove is paper white, and I'm not sure if it's from Wren's words or the weapon I press into his side. Drop your gun and walk away, Wren commands. Don't look back. Don't come back. Don't do anything that would make me give the word to Sitwell. Give the word, he repeats slowly. Then he smirks. What? You're going to get me fired? Wren smiles in return. Not quite. The guard stares at him. He peers at me. One eyelid twitches ever so slightly. But then slowly, against all odds, the gun pointed at my hip drops to the floor. The metal clatters loudly against concrete. With a stony face, he walks by and into darkness. I listen carefully as his footsteps fade into another section of the compound, and I breathe once, twice, three times. Wren picks up the discarded weapon. You okay? My chest heaves, but otherwise I am still. I don't know if I am okay or not. I just had a gun pointed at me. I just pointed one at somebody. I don't know why it bothers me, other than the fact that the same type of weapon slaughtered hundreds, if not thousands, of innocents just yesterday, including Avery's mother. I hate it. I hate them. Why didn't you attack him? I ask. Force the gun away when he was distracted by mine. Wren looks at me out of the corner of his eye. I guess I didn't feel like more violence would solve anything, he says carefully. I grab hold of Wren's hand at this, press his palm tight to mine. Then I lead him to the kitchen door. We are close. We are so close. My fingers enter the code under Wren's watchful gaze, and the door swings open. Inside, a man I recognize from the job tour chops onions at one of the cutting boards. I saw him at the party, too, with Hunter. My stomach squeezes at the thought of my old friend, now my enemy. The man stares at us. This room isn't public access. How did you get in anyway? I step forward and let the door swing closed. Hunter, I reply. And I try, but fail to suppress a smile from stretching across my mouth. Hunter sent us. He told us to get him some lemon squares. The man looks affronted. That isn't allowed. Hunter should know that. What, he gave you the passcode for the kitchen? He stands up straighter. I told him that in confidence, and only because he'll be starting soon, so long as his application is accepted. He did tell us, probably a lot of other people too. Take it up with him tomorrow, and make sure you mention the lemon squares. Now get out. Are you kidding? I'm not going anywhere. I've got prep to do for the morning. You two get out, or I'll get a guard in here faster. Come back in an hour, interrupts Wren. His voice is heavy, and he steps around me so the man can see him clearly. More accurately, so the man can see the gun he still holds by his side. The man's eyes round slightly, and then he wipes his hands on his apron pulls it over his head and drops it on the cutting floor. Hunter's going to hear about this, he mutters as he pushes out the door. Perfect, I say once he is gone. Lemon squares, aren't they your favorite? Yep, consider it a calling card. So, before I forget to ask, are you going to tell me how you knew that guard's name? Grove? He tried to kill you. Wren shrugs. I looked him up after the feeding dock. I lead him through the kitchen to the storeroom, 
and I am glad that he can't see my face because I can't stop myself from smiling. We weren't a couple that day, but he still cared enough to do his homework. The rush of emotion makes my stomach tighten when I think about what is going to happen next. I am going to leave him forever. I give myself a shake and enter the passcode for the storeroom. One one zero 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 two zero zero. It's different, Ren says from over my shoulder. It doesn't follow the same pattern. It's an important room. So how do you know it? I push the door open before I answer. I came here once with him, Hunter. A job tour. The only one I went on. Funnily enough, the only reason I went was to try to make amends with him. And? And the leader of the tour took us in here. I made a point of standing close. I throw on the lights as Ren closes the door behind us. Shit, he says when he turns. I assume you've never been. You assume correctly. And you're telling me that way up there, above the very highest net, there's a trap door into the building that houses the controls for the solar panels. That's precisely what I'm telling you. And there's no code or anything stopping me from going outside once I'm up there. He shakes his head. No. There's a keypad on the outside of the building. 110061 is the passcode. In case... He breathes deeply for a second, and I know what he is thinking, in case I change my mind. Then, calmly, he carries on. There's nothing on the inside. The trap door is an access hatch for tools, not humans. I nod and crane my head back. It's impossible to see much from here. Nothing but net after net slung at intervals all the way to the top of the towering room. You aren't afraid of heights, I hope. Not that I know of. He sighs. Then I guess... I guess this is where I leave you. A lump forms in my throat. I don't want to say goodbye to Ren. I don't. I loop my arms around his waist and breathe deeply to keep away the tears. He smells like he always does and I wish I could take that smell with me above ground. If I don't make it to paradise, I would be happy to die with his smell embracing me. Once I feel like I'm not going to cry, I force myself to smile. Just another conversation with my boyfriend. What will you do now? I ask. He shrugs as he holds me. Go back upstairs. Sleep like a baby. Shoot some pool in the morning. He kisses my forehead. Very funny. Besides, I didn't mean right now. I meant... in general. It's a few moments before he responds. I passed the computer test, so I'll get whatever position I'd like. And I'll spend time with my friends. I don't know. I don't really want to think about it. Life without you. I don't want to think about it either. It makes me feel physically ill. Like when I realized that Hunter had betrayed me. Except that only hurt in my gut and this hurts everywhere. Will you? And Addison? He pulls back and looks at me. His eyes are suddenly hard. You can't have it both ways, Eve. You are deciding to leave. And that includes leaving me. I get that you have to do this. I understand it. I do. But you can't have it both ways. He sighs and pulls me close again, roughly, so that my cheekbone thumps against his chest. But to answer your question, no. It's silly, and he's right, but still I smile. You smell so good, I say, and my voice is muffled by his shirt. It is weak with the tightening of the belt looping around my heart. He laughs softly. Is that a fact? It is a fact. It's one of the things I love about you. 
I feel his stillness, and it makes me realize that I said the word. Love. I squeeze my eyes shut so hard that white stars pop through the blackness, but it is the only thing stopping the tears. I breathe in. I breathe out. Enough with the lies, with the secrets. They have clouded the past few months, and now I need to clear my chest. Lift this weight. I can do this. I can do this because I am brave and strong and fierce. When I open my eyes, I see he is watching me. Ren. Eve. I rest my forehead against his chin. I can't look him in the eye right now, I can't. I'm in. I breathe. In. Out. I'm in. With you. I shake my head. I'm being ridiculous. Of all the things we have been through together, why is it so hard to say one little word? He pulls his head back, and his hand lands under my chin. He raises it several inches, so I am forced to look into those flashing eyes that look like the sun. I'm in. With you, too. A quick laugh pushes between my lips, and he catches it with his own. Kisses me. And then we relax into each other's arms, and I feel like my heart is several times too big for my chest. It feels warm and swollen with happiness. I am not a novelty, not something to laugh about with his preem friends, not a tool for revenge against his mother. His feelings, like mine, are true. But after seconds pass, then minutes the significance of what is about to happen sinks further and further through the layers of my skin until it strikes at my heart. Tears leak from the corners of my eyes. Don't let go of me just yet, I say, as soon as his grip loosens, and he obliges. But finally, the clock runs out. It's time, Eve, he whispers. I nod. He lets go of me, and I feel cold and exposed without his embrace. When I look into his eyes, I am surprised to see they are slippery with emotion. He takes a step toward the door, and I swallow. I don't want him to go. Another step. I feel like something is sitting on my chest, and it is a weight I can't sustain. Another. I am going to be crushed by this weight, smashed into particles at any second. But when he reaches the door, he forces a smile, and seeing his final act of strength makes me strong too. This is my destiny. It is time to get a grip. Enjoy your freedom, Eve. All I can do is nod. He turns and is halfway through the door when I lunge forward and grab him by the arm. My voice rings through the silence. If you ever doubt yourself again, remember, you made a very miserable girl very happy. Please, please carry that with you. He looks at me, and then the sun in his eyes disappears, and I shut mine quickly. He grabs my hand and squeezes it. He squeezes it so hard it hurts. And then he is gone. He is gone. And I am alone. Chapter 38 I stare at the door with only my beating heart as company. The sadness I feel right now is unbearable. It hurts a thousand times worse than I imagined it would, like I am being crushed from above and below and either side. It is terrifying. So I look at the ceiling, and then my eyes comb the walls for the nearest ladder. 
I need something to distract myself from the feeling that sits inside my chest like a poisonous lump. And climbing to the top of the storeroom is just that. Deep breath, in and out. The closest ladder is attached to the wall near the corner, and I walk there on unsteady feet. My fingers curl slowly around cool metal. Silver has given way to tarnished gold on either side of each rung, and it comforts me, this. I am not the first person to climb this ladder, and I won't be the last. But I will be the first person to climb it for the purpose of going above ground. My nerves tingle with a blush of excitement, and the lump in my chest shrinks ever so slightly. Soon I will occupy the same space that Jack occupied, Maybe still does. Soon I will taste freedom. That is what I need to focus on right now. Not him. Not him. I pass by net after net after net, all slung at three-foot intervals. Goods litter each one, but I don't turn to examine them. My only goal right now is to reach the top. The nets themselves are constructed of rope, coarse and sturdy and they fasten to the corners of the room through thick hoops of metal. If I stick my leg out behind me right now, or maybe even my arm, I could touch one. I don't want to do that, though. Right now, I am a single story up, no more, and already my heart is thumping harder than it normally would. My muscles are beginning to ache from the effort, and if I waste too much time, they will tire. When I am halfway to the top, I look down. Panic floods me like liquid lead. If I fall now, I will die. The thought makes my palms wet, and so I close my eyes and wait for my pulse to slow. Sweaty hands will slip. I need to relax or this will end badly, very badly. I need to think of something else. Anything else. Hunter. He will be in trouble with his soon-to-be colleagues and this thought alone makes me distracted enough that I smile. And he will see that the lock on my door is gone in the morning, and that I am too. And my smile grows. He didn't win. I did. I wipe my hands one by one, and continue to climb. Next, I think about my parents. The fact that I didn't say goodbye weighs on me. Not much. No, but it is there a remnant of guilt, one I didn't want to carry with me above ground. But who am I kidding? I am choosing to be selfish by the very act of going, and saying goodbye to my parents wouldn't alleviate that, because they wouldn't accept it. Or maybe they would. Maybe when I spoke with my mother that day she fed the noms, she was giving me her blessing to do whatever selfish act I wanted. Maybe she can find it in her heart to make peace with my decision. After all, if there's any chance of her children reuniting, side by side, just like she used to sing, this is something I must do. Now, I am three quarters of the way there. Breathing is becoming difficult because my heart beats so quickly, and everywhere my skin is tacky. I am fearful, yes, but there is also something exhilarating about being so high, doing something completely new. What would Maggie say if she could see me right now? She would be shrieking at me to get down, but cheering me to go higher. I smile, and my boot lifts to the next rung of the ladder. I wonder what Ren will tell her. Whether he will let her think I have gone to Compound 10, or if he will tell her the truth that I craved freedom, and, thanks to him, I got it. I wonder if he will tell her that I am likely dead. Because by the time the morning comes, I could be. I shudder, and my boot doesn't land firmly on the next rung. It grazes the edge, and I slip. The ticking of my heart is replaced by thick, meaty lumps in my throat as my fingers snatch around metal, as my feet scramble for position. It was a careless mistake, one I can't afford to make again. I swear under my breath. Now my heart is beating much too quickly, and when I lift a hand to wipe it on my jeans, I see it as shaking. 
It shakes so deeply. It must be controlled by a mind that isn't my own. Okay. Okay. I could climb onto the nearest net and wait for my heart to slow. Wait for my palms to dry. Or I could force myself to keep climbing. To not worry about the danger that presents itself with each and every step. I bag up my fear and I set it aside. Up and up and up. Until just ten rungs separate me from the top of the storeroom. Seven rungs, and I will stand inches below the earth's crust. Five. I climb quicker now. Two. I am almost there. One. The top of the ladder. The top of the storeroom. If I reach up, my fingertips will graze the ceiling. If I look down, I will vomit on the floor below. Every muscle in my body is clenched, rigid and taut. The joints in my fingers scream with pain. They have been forced into position for too long. I am asking too much of them. I will my left hand to open. It does, but slowly. And it moves sideways on an uneven trajectory until it wraps around the thick girth of rope that leads to the highest net. A shiver of excitement courses through my veins as my boot lifts from the ladder. Another breath, in and out. I tremble and shake and push off with my leg and let go of the ladder completely. Okay. All I must do is shuffle along the ropes until I am in front of the nets. Except it occurs to me as I do that I am suspended in midair, that a great bubble of space separates me from the floor, the same one that usually runs directly under my boot. The idea makes a bite of laughter rattle my tongue. I inch left, again and again, until the nets are in front of me, three of them, the one my boots stand on, the one my hip bone digs into, and the one that my hands grip. It is the latter one I care about. My eyes comb it greedily, and I notice that it holds very little compared to the rest of the nets. A small pile of metal in the very center and nothing more. Slowly my gaze lifts. Carved in the shape of a perfect square is a small trap door. I stare at it, and a smile spreads across my mouth exposes my teeth. I'm not sure I believed it was there until now. The only problem is that the net is slung directly below it. There is barely any room for me to crawl over and up. I will figure out a way onto it. I will. But first I must rest. Carefully, I draw one leg up, then the other, so that I sit on the edge of the second highest net in the storeroom. And before thinking about it, I twist so that I lie down, so that I give my arms a much-needed reprieve. I catch my breath. I rub my muscles. Then I am still. And all I can think about is the feeling of Wren squeezing my hand, of the look on his face when we forever parted ways. The trembling in my muscles is replaced by overwhelming sadness, so I stir. I draw myself back to the edge of the net, back to where my pulse races. It is better this way. Because here I need to focus. I need to focus on getting to the net above me. A simple task, except completing it, will be anything but easy. I am much too close to the ceiling to stand. The only way for me to hook my boot onto the top net is to let my arms carry my weight. But my arms are tired from being held over my head for the past ten minutes. Blood isn't flowing to my muscles as it should, and they protest loudly at the idea. I don't like it either, but there's no alternative. I string one arm through the top net and clench my other hand around it to lock it in place. I let my weight fall, then lift both my legs and hook them around. I am nauseous and cold, yet a new padding of sweat spreads across my skin. 
So close. I am so close. I just need to swing my body up, and I will have done it. Soon, Eve. Because right now, I can see the floor so many feet below me, and it makes my stomach lunge. Because right now, my arm is beginning to ache. And if I don't act now, I will fall. My abs contract, and I shift my weight up, my legs straightening to lock in my progress. Every muscle in my body is engaged, and my breathing is shallow. I am perfectly horizontal, hugging the edge of the top net in the storeroom. So close. I am so close. I lunge upward once again, and this time my arm that serves as a lock lets go. It reaches around, desperate to grab the top of the net. It is an error. I lose my balance. I fall. I scream. Then my left hand snatches closed, and it is around rope. The only thing standing between me and death. I taste something acidic at the back of my throat. Vomit. My feet are kicking, desperate to latch onto something, desperate to give my fingers a break to save myself. I didn't realize how desperate I was to live until now. At first I screamed, but now I sob. I think of my family and friends. I think about Wren. I want them all, and I love them all. I picture their faces. I imagine their embraces, and my limbs grow still. Focus. I need to curl my left arm, to use every last ounce of my strength to bend it, to draw my body up to a spot where my right hand can reach the net. That is step one. I can accomplish step one. Already my arm throbs, but it is my only chance and so I force my sob to turn into a grunt, and I pull, I pull, I pull. Another inch, and another, and finally the fingers of my right hand curl over rope, and now two limbs hold me from falling to my death. Now for the final test of strength. One leg springs up and hooks around the top net, and I use the strength in this leg to wrestle the rest of my body weight up and up and up. And now my hands reach deeper onto the net. And I am on. I am on. I am on. I roll until my back digs into metal, and I breathe deeply and laugh. I let out a shriek. I did it. I just about died. But I will live another minute. I will taste freedom after all. It was strange, though. When I almost fell, I didn't want to go. I was scared of death, scared of the unknown. Is it death I am not ready for? Or merely death without freedom first? It isn't a question I can answer. Not here. And then, all of a sudden, that song starts up in my mind. The one my mother used to sing playing at full volume. The last stanza thunders in my ears. Children, dearest, hear me roaring. Release the ticking clock. Relieve your pain. Don't be scared. Smash apart the lock. Drift to gentle paradise. It's there that we shall talk. Children, dearest, side by side, tick, talk. When everything is silent again, I know it in my bones. Maybe I knew it all along. That famed oasis, paradise, the one I am chasing, it doesn't exist. There is no north night hawk, no green canopy, no burbling stream. Not in actuality. It is the afterlife my mother was singing about. It is there where I will reunite with Jack, side by side in a field of hollyhock. Those murmurs under my mother's breath, always about a clock. It was the song. An act of self-care, maybe. A reminder of the gentle paradise awaiting her, where she, too, can finally reunite with her beloved boy. A breath rattles my lungs. The afterlife. Afterlife. Jack is dead. He likely died within hours of being released above ground. 
and I may be a survivor. But against that burning ball of fire known as the sun, I don't stand a chance. Fists cover my eyes, but they don't stop the tears. Nothing could. I have been chasing an idea and nothing more, blinded by hope, clinging to a whim that offered much-needed solace at the expense of reason. I will never feel Jack's delicate hand strung through mine, not until I bid goodbye to everything, to life. And that's just what I will do if I set foot outside, into the scorching outdoors. I squeeze the sides of my face, I squeeze until it hurts. Not if, when, when I step foot outside. Because I may not have a shot at finding Jack in the flesh and blood, or paradise for that matter but I do have the opportunity to escape Eleven and experience true freedom, even if it is short-lived. And that is still something I think I want. So I lift myself gingerly over tools until the trap door is directly above me. Carefully, and with trembling fingers, I push. Maybe it will be locked. Maybe it won't open. Maybe I have come this far for naught. But no, it opens silently, and I am greeted by darkness and a musty smell that reminds me faintly of the first floor. I pull myself upright, into the building itself, the building that will see my last moments of Compound Eleven confinement. My fingers are shaking, but this time it isn't from fear or terror or whatever it was that saw me here. I don't know what it is. Perhaps it's excitement, but I don't think it's so simple. I reach into my boot, pull out my flashlight. The first thing I see is that there are no windows. Next, I see that there is no locking mechanism on the door, just as Ren said. My fingertips brush the door handle. Nothing stands between where I am now and the sweltering world outside. A world I now know without a shadow of a doubt will kill me. One wall is full of buttons and levers. The rest is empty. There is a light bulb overhead, but I don't bother looking for the light switch. Instead, I set the flashlight down on the plank floor so that the small space is illuminated, then lean my forehead against the door. This is it. This is what it has all been about what I have been working toward, what I have been dreaming of. Escaping Eleven. I can't balk now, I just can't. Even if I wanted to, what cruel punishment would await me below? I am a criminal now, known to authorities. And all thanks to my best friend. No, I don't have a choice. I have to go outside. I was going to kill a person to get here. This is what I wanted above all else. And even when I believed I actually had a chance of survival, I knew, too, there was a likelihood of death. So why does it feel so bittersweet? I don't think it's the prospect of certain death doing it. Not fully. I think I know the answer. But I don't want to admit it to myself because I used to be hardened and tough and self-sufficient, desperate to leave the cruel corridors of the compound at all costs. Then I fell in love. Just do it, Eve. It's like lemon juice. The first jolt is the worst. The heat will sting. It will take my breath away. But then it won't hurt so much. I look at my knuckles and think of my parents and realize that it was wrong not to say goodbye. I was wrong not to have one last moment with them that wasn't a fight. Maybe they are worthy of my anger, maybe they aren't. But regardless of it all, they are family. I breathe deeply and try to set the pang of regret aside. It isn't a problem I can solve right now. It is too late. If I come back in another lifetime, I will be wiser. Right now, all I can do is breathe. 
breathe, Eve. I thumped my head against the door again and again. And after a while, my trepidation slowly give way, smacking into one another and down like a house of cards. This is what I came for. This is what I want. When I open this door, I will be free. So what if I am swallowed by unbearable heat? So what that I will never see my loved ones again? I will be free. I will die a happy girl because I will be free. My shaking fingers graze the door handle, and then my palm grips it tightly. The muscles in my skin stand at attention, and I can feel them rippling under my skin, fatigued from the effort it took to reach this spot, but still resilient. I stand up straighter and breathe. In. Out. In. Out. This is it. I am going now. I am brave and strong and free. Finally, I am free. Time for the lemon juice to spill. I am turning the door handle when something stirs behind me. Eve. Chapter 39 I am frozen like ice that even the heat on the other side of the door can't melt. I can't move. I can barely breathe. But finally I let go of the handle. I let go and turn and gaze into flashing eyes. Breathing hard, he steps forward. I am in his arms. Something warm spreads through my veins as he wraps me tightly in that clean, safe smell. I didn't think I would ever see him again. His hands cradle my face, and he kisses me. And for a second I forget where we are, what I am about to do. For a second, everything feels right. I'm coming too. He breathes into my lungs. My eyes open, and I push against his chest. The second is over. Don't, I hear my lips say. I don't remember formulating the word. I don't remember saying it. But I mutter it again and again. Eve, he says loudly. If you're going outside, I'm coming with you. Already I am shaking my head. I step back and feel the door handle dig into my spine then lift my eyes to his under the glow of the discarded flashlight. No, I say weakly. I'm not letting you. I'm not asking for permission. I take a deep breath and straighten my back. But you have a life down there. A good one. One you don't want to leave. He steps closer. But this time he doesn't wrap his arms around me. He just stands there and I feel small in his shadow. I don't want to be in Compound Eleven if you aren't. Don't you get it, Eve? Don't you see? You're the reason my life is good down there. It's you. If you're gone. His gaze touches my collarbone, and he shakes his head. Tears threaten to burst from my eyes. His words make me weak, but I force myself to be strong. I can't let you die for me. I'm sorry. I squeeze out from his shadow and turn away from him, dragging in oxygen through hoarse, uneven breaths. I just can't. I know you were willing to die for me down there, when we were running from the guard. I saw you turn around. 
That was different, I start. But then I look into his eyes, and the sun blazes inside them so fiercely I can feel it against my skin. You made your decision to leave Compound Eleven. And now I have, too. The only thing that will stop him now is violence. And I have been trying for less violence in my life, not more. I smile at this thought, at its absurdity right now. Then my fingers lace through his, and he squeezes them. I read once that there's no such thing as death, I say. I remember. Only a change of worlds. I nod. He gazes at me steadily. Let's go find a new world then, together. On the count of three, I say slowly. One. He pulls our entwined hands to his mouth and kisses my fingers. Two. I stand on my toes and kiss him lightly on the lips. I am not shaking anymore. Three. I turn the door handle and shove it open, and my boots go with it. I gasp. Chapter 40 Beside me, Ren is still, but I can see how hard his features are out of my peripheral vision, under the light of the moon. It isn't the taste of freedom that has taken my breath away. It isn't the feeling of fresh air rippling through my lungs. We glance at each other, and a slow smile spreads across my lips, then across his. We are side by side and hand in hand. And despite all we have heard, all we have been taught, a crisp, cool breeze sweeps my hair and tickles my skin.